So David, I I decided to go ahead and start celebrating the uh, to do an annual thing celebrating John Dobson's birthday. I thought that would be a lot of fun. That's a very good idea. You know, I totally endorse that. I think that's a wonderful yeah. idea. No, I mean, I guess Donnie, you would know this. Does anybody else do an event around John Dobson's birthday? Not this year. Not that I know of. Mm-hmm. But... Sometimes, who is this? Kim Frank. Well, where is Kim Frank? What? Okay. okay. What is Ireland? I actually know today or something. It's around this time, but it's not the same day. Hi, Rick. Hello. So we have <laughs> two things running here because the presentation's on a laptop and our participation is on an iPad. Okay. Yeah, a lot of people do that. They'll yeah. have uh, they'll have two different computers, one for presentation, one for you know talking head, and then uh, they might have a third computer uh, where they're watching the program. But if you're watching the program in the simulcast, you want to turn all the audio audio off. Otherwise, yeah. you get into this echo loop. Problem. Nope, it's off now because I got them both logged in. There's no echo, so good. Yeah, I've been there, done that. My girls laugh at me every Sunday on our family call. Yeah. Okay, now this is a um, this is an educational outreach type of program. You guys are all uh, you're doing this for the outreach part of this, I know. And so, if you belong to, if you're a Facebook uh, member. Uh, uh, or, you know, if there's any way that you can share uh, the program, that's how, that's how we do get more people to watch it. Yeah. So right now we have people from the Philippines watching. We have uh, people from East Texas. We have people from the United Arab Emirates watching. Um, uh, so you get, you're going to, you're getting a global audience right off the top. And um the more we share, the more viewers get exposed to this. After we run the program, then uh, you know I continue to do things to share the replay. Um, but uh, you know, this is John Dobson did so much. I mean, he gave his whole life to outreach in in astronomy and uh, is trying to expose people to the uh, to the universe and uh, to make them think. You know to help them understand their place in, in their world and their universe and how it all fits. And so, um, yeah, I think that we're, I think it's great that you're all here. So, <clears throat> and a special thanks to Donna Smith for putting it all together. Oh, thank you. Hopefully most of these people will show up. <laughs> thanks very much, Donna. Thank you. Thank you for thanks. coming, thanks, Andy Scott. and Rick and Dean. I appreciate it. Yes, thanks, Scott, very much. Hey, I'm just I'm just plugging in the the wires, you know. So That's okay. Yeah, but. <laughs> I'm gonna start sharing the. I'm gonna start sharing it. Um, sharing it to friends oh. of Sagan group. Um, I don't know how you want to show. That is the power. That's the. It's here, right? But I mean, because it's this way, not this way. Yeah, doesn't matter because it's just a it's a form that they can see because they're going to be able to go read it. 
You're welcome to go to the website and look at it. We are about to see Terry Mann from the <laughs> Hi, David. Week. Man, that's right. Hello, Terry. Hey, Welcome. how are you? It is so good to see you. Good to see you, too. Yeah, we have a big, big show tonight. Scotty's going to tell you all about it in nine minutes. <laughs> nine minutes, that's right. <clears throat> What does that mean? Um, hey, look, we got, I got to turn off the background. So I can figure out how to do that now. I don't understand the timing on this. There, now there's some Dobsonian telescopes behind us. Mm -hmm. Yes, we've got a lot of them. There's kind of one here. <laughs> Is it Mr. Green? There's actually a couple of groups on Facebook that's dedicated to John Dobson. You know, mm -hmm. one is an astrophotography group. Nice. And one is it just a telescope group? Hey, Andy, how are you doing? I had to unmute here. Yeah, I'm doing fine. How are you? Good, good, good. Very good. It's been a while. I know. <laughs> what, 2017? Yeah, at the Remy right. Hat right. restaurant. <laughs> The Mexican restaurant in Casper, yeah. yeah. Donna, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, I'm just testing this out. I think this is probably how I'll do this later on tonight. Oh, okay, great. All right, I'll hop on with the, with the uh, speaker. Oh, that's good. That's good. I mean, even if you can't do the, the video part, you know. Yeah, I think it might overwhelm the broadband that we have here, so. Okay. All righty. Well, yes, yeah, stay as long as you can. Huh. Okay. There you want. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm on and I'm listening. Thank you. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> there is going to tell us about... Um, the Astronomical League gathering on Friday coming up. It's going to be a lot of fun, very interesting, good speakers. Maybe good speakers, not all of them are good. So some of them are pretty bad, but <laughs> they'll be speakers, stereo speakers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, David, you'll be here joining us, won't you? Yeah, right. to those who drone you betcha. Yes. Oh yeah, I will be there. Good, we look forward to that. Thank you, me too. And I think Scotty will be there too. He better be. <laughs> I just might go. Yeah.
I can't take you tomorrow because uh, Scotty wants to uh, talk to me in Latin. Latin this time? Yes. Lorem ipsum is what I'm going to talk in. Oh, lorem ipsum. Lorem ipsum. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why I can't take Wendy to the doctor tomorrow. Because of lorem ipsum? Yes, exactly. <laughs> And we have to resolve this in 29 seconds. <laughs> oh, boy. Hey, Scott, did you get the video my dad sent? The link to log in? Sure did. I sure did, Sabella. Okay, good. Hold on. Let me send it to you again right now. Hold on. I somehow sense that you're going to need it. <laughs> no, that's great. That's good. Okay, I just sent it. As soon as you get it, just log in. It has the login credentials. They wanted to give me an award for public service in astronomy for the at the East Bay, that's in Oakland, East Bay Astronomical Society in Oakland. And if they're going to give you an award, they're going to sweet talk you in front of the crowd. So they're sweet talking me, the Dobsonian Revolution, the Dobsonian Revolution. I got up and said that all the revolutions were run with the cannons on Dobsonian mounts. <laughs> I love that. Well, hello, everybody. This is Scott Roberts from the uh, Explore Alliance and from Explore Scientific. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to the celebration of John Dobson's birthday. Um, uh, and uh, I'm not sure exactly how, how, how old he would be today, but uh, um, he passed on in uh, uh, 2014, born in 1915. He lived a very long life and devoted most of his adult life to astronomy and education in astronomy and showing people the universe. And so uh, today we have with us Many of the people from uh, that was associated with John Dobson, knew John Dobson, uh, was involved in his group, the Sidewalk Astronomers. Um, and so uh, I am going to um, I'm going to start this program with uh, a, some some poetry and some words of wisdom from David Levy. Uh, and uh, and then we'll uh, transition to Donna Smith, who uh, who is our special guest host and arrange this whole program. So uh, put on your seatbelts. We're going to have a lot of fun uh, and um, hopefully embody the spirit of, of John Dobson himself. So, uh, David, I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Scott, and welcome. I'd like to add my welcome to this, um, start, this global start party during which we celebrate a very dear friend. Normally, you you know, there's an adage that says you can't judge a book by its cover. This one you can. This is the cover of a book that I am showing you. That's the back cover. Wow. And then I'm going to show you the front cover. Mm -hmm. And uh, why can you judge this book by its cover? Because the cover is plywood. Uh, Norm Sperling published this book about to how to why to make a user-friendly sidewalk telescope. The interesting part of the, of the title is why, of course. There's some, I don't think it's in, in press anymore, but it has some golden things in it. For example, two letters from Charles Federer, 
then the editor of Sky and Telescope, explaining why he would not publish John Dawson's early material about making a sidewalk telescope, saying that it is, uh, is pretty stupid and it's never going to fly. That's not the way to make a telescope. Mm. And uh, however, just in case, I'm going to send it along to our gleanings editor. And if he, if you don't hear from him, then that means he agrees with me. Anyway, John didn't hear from him. I first met John in 1973, 74, when I was at the, uh, in San Francisco, and I went to the museum there, and I saw John and his group with one of their large, large telescopes looking at the sun, their large, now known as Dobsonian telescope. And uh, we became really good friends years later when I was giving a lecture in Seattle. It was around the time of um, Shoemaker leaving on. And I was giving a lecture in Seattle about why it was important to love the night sky. I don't know why any of you would think that I would have anything to say about that, but I was giving a talk about that. And John happened to be in the audience. And what sealed our friendship was that after I finished saying that it is more important almost than anything to stop what you're doing, look up at the night sky and see the big picture. At this point, John stood up from his chair, came up to me and gave me a big embrace. And that sealed our friendship. I'm going to read you a poem now. And I just, I just told Scotty that this poem is going to take me 24 hours and 37 minutes to read. And it turns out I'm going to read it a little faster than that because 24 hours and 37 minutes happens to be the rotation period of the planet Mars. And we're not on Mars. And Mars doesn't have the internet, although actually it does have the internet now. And even has a helicopter. Anyway, but the poem that I'm going to read to you is in honor and memory of John Dobson. It is written by Alfred Noyes, and it comes from his famous poem, Watchers of the Sky. And he wrote these lines at the opening ceremony of the 100-inch telescope at Mount Wilson. And Scott, you and I have been there at the 100-inch telescope. Yes. So here goes. Tomorrow night, so wrote their chief, we try our great new telescope, the 100-inch. Your Milton's optic tube has grown in power since Galileo. Famous, blind, and old, talked with him in that prison of the sky. We creep to power by inches. Europe trusts her giant 40 still. Even tonight, our own old 60 has his work to do. And now our 100 inch. I hardly dare to think what this new muzzle of ours may find. Thank you, and back to you, Scotty. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I love that. Um, you know, uh, and and uh, you know, I I hope that uh, all of you uh, who are watching tonight, uh, if you never had the chance to meet John Dobson, I hope that you get some feeling about who the man is, uh, maybe some some understanding of what made him tick, um, and. Uh, you know the uh, and I and I hope that the spirit of John Dobson moves you um, as he has many of us. So, Donna, I'm going to turn this over to you. I I'm a little bit embarrassed, Donna. Um, I although I've known you for several years. Okay, we we I think we maybe got to meet face to face um, before Starlight Festival, but I don't know a lot about your background. I know you've been very involved with sidewalk astronomers. I know that you knew John Dob Dobson extremely well, uh, spent many years uh, uh, working with him, supporting him. Uh, but uh, what, what more can you tell us about yourself, Donna? Not much. <laughs> Not much. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just- oh, you've done some amazing things you have. Yeah, so. I was just- um an amateur astronomer and a, not a very good one. And I bought a Dobsonian telescope and I needed help. And I went to the observatory because some of the sidewalk astronomers were there. 
and John thought my telescope needed a new mount and they were so nice. They just, they wouldn't take any money or anything. So then they said, can you do this library program with us? We need another telescope. And it just seemed like every night I was doing astronomy. And then after a couple of years, John called me one day and said, can you do my schedule? And I said, yes. And then I got off the phone and thought, oh my God, I think that's how he makes a living. If I don't <laughs> schedule him, he'll have no money. <laughs> and um, I called Bill Scott and I'm like, where's John supposed to go? And, and I remember I said, he told me he's going to some valley. And we didn't know if it's Antelope Valley or Apple Valley. Or, we just started calling every single club going, are you having John Dobson this year? No. Do you want him? <laughs> and from there, you know, it just kind of took off. And then internationally, honestly, if I wanted to go somewhere, I'd just start calling people and saying if they wanted John. And of course they did. So sure. And I got to go places. <laughs> yeah, it seems like John Dobson went around the world uh, talking about uh, you know, his life, uh, uh, his, um, you know, the importance of uh, exposing people to the universe. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, he had the whole package. He was making the telescopes. He was, um, uh, you know, he was uh, getting people engaged, thinking about their place in the universe and, um, and all that. But he had unique ideas, you know. He had unique ideas and uh, um, and a big part was getting people to share, you know, yeah. not just, you know, um, like when we went to Russia, the kids, the first thing they want to do was show him the first thing they would do in their club is build a scope. And they had, you know, his design. And the first thing they wanted to do was show him their telescope. And the first thing he wanted to say was, do you take it out? Hmm. So, you know, it was. It worked. It was just kind of symbiotic because, you know, they were getting what they needed and he was getting a chance to push them further. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, I had I had a couple of experiences with John Dobson myself. One was uh, getting a letter from John Dobson at Mead Instruments where I was working and we had just started selling Dobsonian telescopes. We were calling them Dobsonians and I get this long letter from John Dobson telling me, uh, telling us uh, all the things that we had done wrong with the design and that, uh, you know, it shouldn't be called a Dobsonian anyways and that he didn't want it to, you know, he didn't want a telescope named after him. And uh, so <laughs> I was, uh, I was a little bit surprised at the letter. I wish I had kept it. Um, I think I told you the story. Um, but I did write him back and I told him it was quite impossible for us to call it anything else because that was the industry name for this type of telescope, you know, in all of its variations. Um, so- uh, I told you, you, re you were redeemed because while he didn't like the mount much because it varied from his, he really loved, I had a meet, he really loved my mirror. Oh, he did, okay, <laughs> that's good. That's yeah, that's the main telescope I still use. And there were so many times he would just say like, well, like with the focuser, well, she has that stupid thing on there, but she's got a really good mirror. So. <laughs> now his focuser was like a, maybe a paper tube pushing in and out or something like that. Plumbing pipe and toilet paper roll. And you know, for the first two years when he would come, I would take mine off and put his back on. Uh -huh. And after about the third year, I'm like, just leave it, you know? Just leave it, right, well, right. So I think I told you earlier, when, when I went up to get help at the, at the observatory, I really knew nothing. And I had a, a Dobsonian, but after buying it, I really didn't think about anything more than it was a reflector. Right? So there's this old guy and he's running around and people are like going, is that John Dobson? And it took about three or four weeks and I'm like, does he have something to do with my telescope being called a Dobsonian? <laughs> <laughs> and everybody's like, yeah. And I'm like, okay, well, I don't, I don't, you know, I just thought he was kind of a grumpy old guy. <laughs> Isn't that amazing though. You needed help on your telescope and the one guy you go to is John Dobson. So. Yeah. That, you know, so I figured that was just kind of meant to be. That's very but, cool. Um, but by then, you know, I know a lot of times people would be very solicitous to John, overly so, right? Sure. And I, I said, I never kind of had that because I didn't know who he was until I already knew him. 
Yeah. And and then like he was having a telescope making workshop here at a guy's house. And one of the girls that worked for me, she's kind of mouthy. She was gonna make a telescope and he's like, you're never gonna get done. You gotta push harder. Come on, what are you doing here? Get with it. And she's like, stop yelling at me. And he's like, push harder. Maybe I'll quit yelling. And she goes, well, quit yelling and maybe I'll push harder. And <laughs> you know, every year when he came, I would pick him up and he would say, how's Carla? <laughs> And I thought so many people he can't remember their name, but he never forgot. He remembered <laughs> yeah. So. That's cool. That is very cool. Well, uh, uh, Donna, I'm going to turn this program over to you. Uh, again, I want to thank you for bringing in all of your uh, presenters. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, we're, we're going to take, um, I'll remind you when we take breaks. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, those of you that are presenting can keep the pace up because uh, we've got a lot of presenters. Um, and although it's, it's early now, it, gets, it can get late. And so. Yeah, well, I figure if some of the guys can't make it, you guys can always come back on and do something else if you want to. That's right. We always got next year. We are going to celebrate this thing every year. Even later tonight. If you want to hang around and you got more to say, you're welcome. Oh, <laughs> yeah. There's a lot to talk about with John Dobson. So I'll let you I'll let you have it from here on out. Uh, okay. Thank you, Donna. Okay. Well, thank you, Scott. And thanks for having us. Okay. So we're going to start with um, Rick and Peggy Walker. They're from the Broken Arrow Sidewalk Astronomers. And Peggy is going to... Just give us a little overview of John, who he was. Okay. Well, I didn't come into this uh, meeting John till much like 2000 and, well, International Year of Astronomy. And so, um, but with hooking up with Donna, I wound up compiling a lot of the stories and articles that people put together. So what I'm just gonna show you is just this short bio on John and it's on the website. So if you want to read it in more detail, you're free to do so. And anyway, so we're going to, um, um, he was called the Pied Piper of Astronomy. He wound up actually, um, how can I go down to So he had a lot of names, uh, MacGyver and all that. But uh, John basically made things out of recycled things. Like, you know, MacGyver saved the world with gum and a paper clip. Well, John did the same thing with telescopes. But what I did not know about John was that after the Civil War, his grandparents were, went into the uh, Methodist Missionary um, Episcopal Church and they were sent to China. And that is why John was born in Beijing. And so you can see a picture here of the Beijing University. Here's the actual picture of the whole family. And uh, the mother was uh, a person who taught music. And the dad was, uh, did a lot of these uh, philosophy and did um, uh, zoology. So they were a very, very educated family. And so when they were there in um, India, I mean, uh, China, things kind of started to sour. They had the, the communist versus the nationalist and they had to flee basically for their, for their safety. So what they did was they decided to move because um, there was some bombardment and stuff going on at night. So they went up moving to uh, San Francisco. And so he wound up going to the Lowell High School which his dad wound up uh, teaching at. And so they lived like off of 37th and Gate um, but what this whole um, article I have is kind of done on a little bit of a of a thread, like a his, you know, done by time. So um, we have pictures we still want to add more to. But anyway, so uh, this one, he when he gets there, he's now all of the kids get their degrees from Berkeley, California. So the whole family very well educated, but he encounters this monastic life mainly because. You know, having a degree in chemistry, what were the jobs at that time? Well, to, to go to war and be a war, you know, whatever. And he just, this just wasn't who he was. So he winds up meeting up with the Van Danta organization up in San Francisco. And so he felt that that was a little bit more that, that was what he was about personally, because he was not into this war thing, the war machine. And so what he wound up doing was he did get involved with astronomy. And he made his first, uh, here it says, he made his first uh, telescope out of recycled pieces from Zeiss uh, binoculars. 
and he saw the rings of Saturn and that kind of got him going. And then later on, you'll see that he was at the monastery of San Francisco and he started grinding glass from the porthole glass because he's here by the port, right? With all the ships. So it's kind of like he's doing a uh, down low CIA special op thing because he starts doing this with a vengeance and he's hiding things in the, in the gardening shed because that was what his, his realm was. So when he first made his uh, 12 inch, he said in that quote here, my God, it looks like I'm coming in for a landing. And I thought, Lordy, Lordy, everyone's got to see this. And so that's where he got the idea of public astronomy into his head because it's like, man, if he was so moved by what he saw, then clearly um, he knew he had to share. So he, it got him into trouble uh, because he kept grinding mirrors and things and he wasn't supposed to be doing that at the monastery. And he was AWOL for a lot of the uh, things he was supposed to do. But as it turns out, he basically kind of had to go. But this is book here is the original book that he learned how to grind mirrors. I think it's a 1935 Saturn uh, telescope company. And that was what came in with the optics. In fact, he actually told me that book is where he learned how to do stuff. So uh, anyway, so he's basically now at the point of kind of got him to get kicked out of the monastery. But what happened was I talked about like what Donna was saying about him. I got a book, somebody, where is he going? What's happening? Well, because he wound up uh, going into a service, he winds up uh, needing some help. So he just, he had a group of people and they were taking him in. They were giving him food so he could continue his astronomy obsession, which was really pretty cool. Uh, they fed him, they, they found um, things for him to do. He wound up teaching ATM at the um, community college there. And this was actually, this, this is tumbleweed, which we'll talk about later, but this is one of the ones that his student had made. He loved the size of it, loved everything about it. You could see him with the wagon. Um, I did an article on, you know, refurbishing tumbleweed and somebody asked how, you know, who's that old guy with that scope? Anyway, he did not know who John Nelson was. So anyway, so he got an education, but John was on the streets of uh, Sacramento. And then, you know, when they started getting these ideas of like, hey, let's go to the national parks. So they had this bus, they called it the Starship Centaurus A. And um, actually in, um, when we were at Alcon 2017 at the eclipse, this couple said, oh my God, I recognize that scope. It came out of the back of a really, really bright orange van. And so they had some stories. So a lot of the stories and videos of a lot of that is on the Facebook page called Unofficial Tumbleweed. So you can go there, start at the bottom, and you can see how we got Tumbleweed to where she's at right now. But a lot of these people, like, you know, he went to Crater Lake, he went to Zion, very good friends with the park rangers. They always made uh, great strides to make sure that they had stipends for food, they had places to stay. And of course, you have the story of John sleeping in his scope, you know, taking out the, you know, the spider and climbing in there with his, yeah, with the, his, his wife and, and son, and they were sleeping in the tube. So only in John Dobson's world does that happen. Um, so these things were huge. They're big light buckets. And so they went Grand Canyon. This is uh, Death Valley. Every uh, Christmas he would spend at Furnace Creek. And I know that the year he passed, I, I, I did a talk there with Donna and people, I didn't realize people came from all around the world just to hear him at Furnace Creek at Death Valley every Christmas. So in fact, um, here he is at Crater Lake and he got uh, called back there quite a bit. He was there on a lot of occasions and the park system just really liked John. They liked the, he liked everything about them. And so you can see the van, everybody would pull up and open up the back ends and get these beautifully big things out the door. So here's Donna. Um, and this is one of the fun question comments that um, John had said because somebody asked him a question, you know, John always had some sort of a, a comment. He wasn't, you know, sometimes you didn't know if he was, yeah, you didn't know how to take some of the things he said. But what I thought was funny was somebody asked him, what's the difference between you and a park ranger? And John says, the sidewalk astronomer entertains the public using telescopes at the park while the park ranger entertains the public with the rest of the park. So, so um, um, 
Yeah, so he kind of had, you know, he had a bit of a kind of funny sense of humor. But this whole article thing just goes through his whole thing. And a lot of these people are still, they're going to be on later on this, in this um, uh, session with us, you know what I mean? So, and we have the, then he went to, started going into India, south, uh, to Mexico, doing all kinds of eclipse hunting and things like that. And I believe we have, um, one of the things that he talked about was having like a schedule like a rock star because he was, Donna was constantly <laughs> booking him this way, that way, wherever he could go, you know what I mean? And he was open and he, he's been to every single state except Oklahoma. And I try to get him here, but he started to have many strokes and he couldn't, he couldn't uh, leave town. There you go, Mr. Levy. There you are, John. And up here, I mean, I think believe this was in Mexico. There's Carolyn Schumacher with you guys. So that was pretty cool. But he has, he's had a lot of friends. This is our first time meeting John here when he did the, um, thing at the uh, Canyon Country uh, mm -hmm. Elementary School and John's sitting there helping us and stuff like that. So that was our first encounter. So we didn't meet John till much later, but this whole thing talks about him giving, doing outreach into his nineties. Okay, he just didn't stop. He did a lot of work with uh, Jane Houston Jones. Here's uh, John's 95th birthday at Griffith Park. And this is the, the conversation that David was talking about when they were talking about the sky telescope. This is the slide that he was on when, when he was reading that, that letter that uh, David read already about sky telescope, who wasn't interested. 95th birthday, here's Bob Elazorian, his best friend that he hung out with. Um, this was our first encounter actually with the sidewalk astronomers at the um, Griffith Observatory for his birthday. And of course, here he is looking through. Is that delphinium, Donna? The big blue, or is it just blue? I'm not sure. Yeah, but John, you know, spent the night um, talking to everybody, looking at great scopes. That he, and we actually built a scope during that day, that time frame. And uh, in this file, you'll also see that ISAM started from somebody from uh, South America, where they said, "Hey, we should really do a intern." Um, you know, a uh, international sidewalk astronomer night. So, um, so that started and we started into making buttons and badges for that. And then on his birthday, I, I had made John a, um, because I heard he was cold all the time. So I made him this polar fleece that actually was um, the logo of sidewalk astronomers and gave it to him on his birthday there. And there's some publications here and, and, and David Levy showed you already that wooden book there about user-friendly sidewalk scopes, but he's got other media. And there's also on the webpage, great, um, you know, when he was on Johnny Carson and a cabin and things like that. So um, he, was a, he was a character and, and we all have uh, a lot to owe this man for just doing the abnormal kind of a thing. So, um, but anyway, this is available um, at the website at uh, sidewalkastronomer.us and it's under the, the biography. If you are from another country and want to translate that for us, we would really appreciate that. But anyway, so um, it's a sh quick and dirty thing, but John was, um, he was unique and everybody took him in and, and rallied around this whole concept. And that's why his legacy still is very active today. So anyways, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Peggy. Um, Scott, I think you're going to introduce the next. Yes. Okay. So um, up next is Terry Mann. Uh, Terry Mann is a former uh, two-time, two-term president of the Astronomical League. She is currently secretary of the Astronomical League. She's a powerhouse of, uh, of uh, astronomy outreach herself. And um, uh, it's been my distinct pleasure to uh, have worked with her uh, the little bit that I have. Um, and uh, so I, you know, I'm always, uh, uh, you know, amazed at her uh, work in spreading the word of astronomy through the league, through her uh, uh, astrophotography, the aurora photography she does. Um, she's just really an inspiration. And so thanks for coming on, Terry, for this very, very special Global Star Party.
Thank you, Scott. It is a pleasure to be here and to listen about John Dobson. I did meet him one time, and it was a long time ago when he was doing a talk, I believe, in Columbus. And it, it, it was amazing just to see how he works and how he you know, thought and how he answered questions. He kept you on your toes, and a lot of times you were laughing because he made sense, but he said it as few people would have answered these questions. He answered very direct and he was amazing, totally amazing. Mm -hmm. So um, I am going to get ready to ask the questions here for the Astronomical League. And we always start off with this first slide. Um, we always remind people never to look at the sun with any kind of optical equipment without the correct filter damage can be done. And the sun has been so active here lately. It's really been fantastic to see all the sunspots and prominences and everything that we have seen. It really makes me want to find Aurora, but I think I have to go too far north just yet. So whatever you do, if you're going to check out the sun, make sure you've got the proper filters. Yes. And so I've got the answers from GSP 61 that was on September 7th. The first question was, what important U.S. astronomy celebration was held in Washington, D.C. on October 7th, 2009? The answer is the celebration of the International Year of Astronomy, and it was held at the White House. Second question was, what is the name of the sister galaxy of the Milky Way galaxy, and why is it called a sister galaxy? And the answers are, the Andromeda Galaxy, and it is most like our own Milky Way Galaxy. Oh. Next question was, William Herschel is most famous for discovering Uranus. Who helped him develop the modern mathematical approach to astronomy? And the answer was his sister, Caroline. Wow. Yeah, I didn't know that. That's, that's no, pretty cool. Very cool. Yeah, so these were the names that we added to the uh, door prize list um, for the September answers. And tonight I'm going to ask the questions for this star party. So Astronomy Day happens twice a year. There is one date left in 2021. What date will Astronomy Day happen in 2021 that hasn't happened already? It's your astronomy. And <laughs> and answer the quest, send the answers to the questions to secretary at astroleague.org. Second question is how much does Earth weigh? And again, send it to secretary at astroleague.org. Third question what is so impressive about the planet PRS J1719? Dash 1438B. I'm going to leave that there for a minute. Um, and again, send the answers to secretary at astroleague.org. And what's so impressive about this planet? All right. And I wanted to talk a little bit, just very little bit, and thank everyone for watching Alcon Virtual. We were looking at the numbers today. We had almost 22,000 views over those three days, which was amazing. And Scott, I want to thank you. The league thanks you for all of your help with broadcasting and everything you have done. We had such a great time. Thank you very much. I, I, I think you got uh, one extra zero there, but. Oh, gee, I, I, that would have been better yet, wouldn't it? I killed the 220,000. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been great. Oh, we were, we're really, very happy with twenty two thousand. <laughs> but yeah, it was uh, it was an amazing uh, experience for me, just kind of being behind the scenes and and seeing all the interaction that was going on. And uh, you know, the astronomical league. I mean, they brought their game on. They did. Um, you know, you had fantastic speakers um, and uh, so much enthusiasm. I love seeing the clubs and what they did. Yeah. Uh, with their door prizes, with their, you know, and talking about the clubs and what they do and all the rest of it is really, really interesting. Very, very cool. And it could really only be pulled off by the Astronomical League. 
Well, thank you. But I tell you, we do thank our clubs. Um, they Each club that donated had a certain amount of time to talk about their clubs. And we ha had almost $9,000 in donations for door prizes. I think we had something like 35 clubs that stepped forward and five or seven individuals that stepped forward. It was amazing. Between the speakers and the door prizes, we were just having a great time. We had such a wide variety of speakers. So yeah, it was a good time. Thank you, Scott. We really appreciate everything you did. Thanks, Terry. Thanks so much. And we have uh, Astronomical League Live coming up Friday, as David was talking about, uh, 7 p.m. We have Claude Plymate coming, and he is going to speak about astronomical adaptive optics. Now, he, was, he is a retired engineer from the National Solar Observatory. And he is amazing. I saw him, I think Scott, didn't I see him at, was he at Mount Wilson or? Uh, um, no, he wasn't at Mount Wilson. He was Big Bear, I believe. Sorry. Yeah, he's yeah. At, and he was at uh, Kitt Peak National Solar Observatory, the McMath uh, telescope he worked on. Uh, his wife also was a professional astronomer. Uh, and so uh, Teresa, Pl Teresa Plymate, and they are just a wonderful couple. Um, and I just love it when they give presentations. They're so enthusiastic. And it, their presentations, to me, are almost magical. So it's really cool, you know? Yeah. I'm glad you're having them on. Yes, I am looking forward to hearing him. Uh, please join us, if you can, this Friday, right here where you're at, at 7 p.m. EDT. Very so cool. thank you, Scott. And I look for forward to listening to the rest of the program tonight. Me too. Me too. Well, that's great. So up next is uh, uh, Sabella Burlingame, and Sabella has been giving presentations on uh, the Global Star Party. I think this is her maybe fourth presentation or fifth presentation. Uh, Sabella, why don't you come on onto the program? And uh, I have a video that uh, that you presented uh, that I can play, but let's let's have you come on and, and talk about it a little bit. Yeah, so it's basically, um, first of all, can you hear me okay? I can hear you perfectly. Okay, good. Um, so it's basically about um, the Dobsonian Mount and the effect it had and how easy it is to basically find things, hmm. especially the motorized ones too. So. Right. So would you like for me to play it now? Yes. Okay, here we go. So let's see. Um, it's here, and I will bring this up full screen, and we'll play it. When most people think of telescopes, they usually think of a long tube with glass lenses that let you get closer views of objects in the night sky. But what most people don't realize is that the mount is just as important as the telescope itself. Unless you have a good sturdy one, it will be very difficult, if not impossible, to use the telescope effectively. Before John Dobson invented the mount named after him in 1965, Amateur astronomers had mounts that were either very heavy and bulky or lightweight and flimsy. Good reflector telescopes were also very expensive, and most people couldn't afford one with a mirror larger than about 6 inches. This meant that most amateur astronomers couldn't get good views of deep sky objects like galaxies and nebulae and had a hard time tracking objects unless they had an expensive motor drive too. So when John Dobson invented a mount that was sturdy, portable, and affordably priced, it was a real game changer. It was very sturdy and could track objects smoothly merely by nudging the telescope along. It was also capable of supporting very large telescopes with bigger mirrors, so this opened up amazing views of the night sky that were barely visible before. Because the mount was made of plywood and other inexpensive parts, the average person could easily afford one and even build one himself. The mount could be easily detached from the telescope, making even a large setup quite portable. 
Today, there are thousands of telescopes all over the world that are mounted on mounts that bears his name. They come in all sizes and can even be motorized to find and track objects. So how did John Dobson come up with the idea for his mount? When asked, he said that it was based on cannon mount designs that had been around for hundreds of years. Oh my God. <laughs> wow, uh, Sabella, that was a fantastic presentation. <laughs> yeah, my dad did most of the editing. Um, yeah. Well, he did a great job and you did too. You did too. So I'm glad that you brought this to light and, uh, and talked about the Dobsonian Mount because, uh, you know, John Dobson, he wouldn't take ownership that he was the designer of this. Okay. And, uh, but I think everybody else recognized that um, he gave it a very special place in the design of telescopes today, and I can see Dobsonian telescopes be, being around for a very, very long time. So uh, that I, I cut my teeth in astronomy on a big Dobsonian telescope. I call it big. It was a 13-inch telescope. Um, it was bigger than most of the telescopes around and most of the astronomy clubs that I went to at that time. But you just showed in that video a huge huge uh, uh giant dobsonian i think it's like i can't remember how many inches this thing is but i think it's like over 50 inches of aperture oh my god wow. uh, there is um nor uh uh there there is a uh telescope maker up in canada uh <laughs> i don't know why the name is escaping me right now but he makes up to 72 inch dobsonians that are completely computerized and all the rest of it so it's very very cool Behind me is um, uh, one of our Dobsonian telescopes. I just brought it here in honor of John Dobson. And so, uh, but all of us that have been to astronomy uh, star parties, um, uh, you know, the big ones like Okie Tex or, you know, the Winter Star Party, Texas Star Party, a lot of them, there's some big Dobsonians there, you know, 20 inch ones, 30 inch ones, sometimes bigger. And they are a, they're really wonderful to look through because you can see amazing stuff and sometimes even color in nebula because the apertures are so big you know so thank you uh sabella and thank you john dobson so thank you for all of that that's great and donna i'm going to turn it back over to you okay i think now we're going to andy paneros and andy is going to tell us a little bit about his time with john andy's an amateur who had uh, John come and stay with him every year and hold classes. And he has a radio program on WPKN. And I'll uh, turn it over to you, Andy. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, yeah, it's hard to say, you know, uh, you had me come in and want to talk about John in 15 minutes after knowing him for so, all those years and uh, him coming to visit me. But I think what was really most important, I felt, uh, was that... Uh, I wanted to speak about the, the, the power of the Dobsonian telescope and what it meant to people. And so <clears throat> I have the best thing, the way to do it is to explain what happened to me. Uh, I was sitting in my office one day, a uh, person who was a resident radiologist came in and said to me, hey, I, I heard you're interested in astronomy. And I said, <laughs> you know, I read a lot of books and uh, I see, watch TV programs. And he said, you're gonna build a telescope. And I was, <laughs> first thing I said to myself was, I think this guy's nuts, you know, I, you build a telescope. Uh, no, no, you, you don't understand. It's a, it's a very simple telescope. It's a Dobsonian and uh, it's a reflecting telescope and it's very easy to build. And, and so, uh, you know, he helped me. We went to a salvage yard. Um, we got the, the, the uh, parts for the telescope and, uh, uh, you know, I, I laid it on my, my front lawn. And uh, when I did, uh, my neighbors looked at me and said, so what do you do? What's that? Uh, and I said, I had toilet flanges and stovepipe and, you know, uh, plywood. And I said, I'm building a telescope. And they all looked at me like, I think Andy's going off the deep end. Uh, 
<laughs> but uh, but but we did build it, um, and uh, you know he showed me how to use it, and I was just amazed at uh, you know what it, what I could do with the Dutch Sony telescope. So he he says to me after I build it, you know, uh, hey, you know Andy, you got to go to Stellafane, and I oh yeah, he'd come up and see me. We worked in the same place, and every day he'd come by, you know, Andy, we, we you've got to go to Stellafane. And, okay, okay. So finally I said, okay, this sounds wonderful. Springfield, Vermont. I live in Connecticut. Um, we went to Stella Fane and I really didn't know much about John, John Dobson. And, and John was at Stella Fane that year. That was 1996, I believe. And, um, and so I actually met John and I spoke to him a little bit. It was very nice. And, you know, just a few words and, you know, it was very, you know, uh, appreciative to, you know, he gave me his time and we talked a little bit and, uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, I had a great time at Stella Fane, you know, dark skies. And I live in Connecticut and, you have to go really to like the northwest corner to see anything that's pretty decent these days uh, and uh, with dark skies. And so, you know, I came home and, uh, you know, shortly after that, uh, there was a lunar eclipse. Uh, I think it was October of the same year. It was 96 or 97. I can't remember exactly. And uh, I brought my telescope out in my front yard and I set it up and Saturn was very close to the moon that year. And this little girl's riding her bike in my neighborhood and neighbor and she said, uh, what, 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 are you, what are you looking at? And I said, yeah, I'm looking at the eclipse in Saturn. She looks into the telescope, and this is something that John, you know, basically said to me many years later. She said, you know, everybody needs to see this. And so she rode her bike around the neighborhood, um, and, it, and basically uh, there's only 12 houses on my street. I think 10 of them came over. People woke their kids up out of sleep to come see this thing, and it was the eclipse. And I got to say that everybody on that, on my front lawn, was a couple of inches off the ground, you know. Everybody got so excited, and I was like, "Wow, I, I, I just did sidewalk astronomy and didn't even know it." You know, here I here's the power of the Dobsonian telescope, and sidewalk astronomy. So here I am, uh, sitting on my front lawn, uh, doing sidewalk astronomy. I never even intended to do it in the first place, and of course, at, at this point, I want to meet John again, and I figured, okay, I'll I'll, I'll see John in next year, and uh, it's an elephant. I figured he's he's there every year. Uh, again, I wasn't, you know, uh, didn't go to many star parties at that point. And he wasn't there. Uh, a few months later, well, fortunately, I, was, I went to San Francisco uh, on, um, on business. And I was there for two weeks. And I said, boy, you know, I wonder if John Dobson is running one of his telescope making classes. I'd, I'd love to see it. And so I, I, I contacted the sidewalk astronomers, San Francisco sidewalk astronomers. And, and they... Um, like John Houston, uh, J I'm sorry, <laughs> Jane Houston Jones, who uh, was Jane Houston at the time, got back to me and said, oh yeah, John would love you to come to, you know, a couple, you can't come to all the classes there over a period of weeks. And uh, I, I went to some of his telescope making classes, uh, a couple of his cosmology classes, and we just kind of hit it off. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I got invited by the San Francisco sidewalk astronomers that evening uh, at the Randall Museum to do some sidewalk astronomy. And I, I didn't have my scope with me, but, you know, of course, helped out. And I'm standing next to, to John, you know, JD, and I said, so are you coming to Stellafane this year? And he said, oh, I, I, I'd, I'd love to come to Stellafane. And I, I said to myself, well, you're John Dobson, right? Just, just call up the Springfield telescope makers and, you know, tell them you'd like to go. And uh, he said, he gave me some contact names, uh, people. I said, would you like me to to look into this for you. And he said, yeah, sure, I'd, I'd love to go. And, um, and and one of the names was Carol D'Antonio, who's on uh, this evening sometime. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I made the contacts. Uh, everybody was very happy to have John, you know, participate. And from, uh, thanks to, uh, <laughs> uh, thanks to Donna, uh, I, John, uh, I hosted John from 2000, uh, 1998 to 2008, somewhere around there. Uh, every year, except I think one year he, he went to Russia, I think, and he didn't make Stella Fane. And, uh, you know, I, I, I did, um, I w we went to Stella Fane every year. You know, David Levy was there. He had been there several years, and, uh, you know, we all got to get together. And I kind of realized, okay, you know, John wants to come to Stella Fane because, because uh, you know, it's a telescope-making, you know, uh, convention. Uh, this is, you know, his love and his passion. And all through the years, I, I, used, I would say to myself, you know, John loves it here, but what is it in particular that he that he loves? Uh, I have a a, um, a PowerPoint presentation. I'm not sure if I can with some images if I can show you or not. 
If not, I can just continue to, to talk. Um, let's see. I'm going to... Uh, if you haven't shared on Zoom before, try look at the bottom of your Zoom screen. client. You'll see a share screen button, a green one. There we go. And it will show you many options. And so you don't want to share just your desktop. You want to share the application that has your presentation. Correct, which should be this. Is that how, uh, let's see. Uh, there you go. Perfect. How's that? Yeah, okay. nice. I will try to get through this quick because I know we have lots of other people and all right. And so I, I did put a, f a couple of clips in here. Uh, there we go. Can everybody see that okay? Yes. Yeah, yeah okay. And I, from uh, my interview with JD, where I interviewed him uh, on my radio show a few times, I, I have a couple of clips here. Of course, here he is with Tumbleweed. And uh, I got to look through Tumbleweed in San Francisco. And I, I'm going to play this clip I, if I can get it to play. Can, can everyone hear that? Yeah. Uh, you need to stop sharing. Okay, and play it, huh? When you share, the, on the left-hand side, there is a share um, system sound or something like that. You'll see a little checkbox. Let's go back to share again here. And then you, sh then you commit to sharing. Okay. Um, so I have to unshare to do that? Yeah, here, I'll unshare you. There you go. There you go. There you okay. go. Okay, we'll try it anyway. Uh, I won't do one for this for every. <laughs> no, that's cool. You have to learn how to do it. Yeah, but I mean, it'll take time. That's but here we go. Is that it? Can we say play it again? I guess. Okay, so so go back to sharing. Oh, you have to go back to sharing to do it. Okay. Back to share. All right, let's go back to uh -huh. share. And. All right. Andy, don't worry about this because everybody has to learn how to do it. So I have done it, but uh, to go back and forth. Uh, yeah, I understand. Sometimes, yeah, yeah. I understand. So, On the left-hand side, before you commit to sharing, there is a there is a checkbox that says uh, share system sound or share. Oh, computer. yeah. Where is that? Uh, okay. Before I commit. Okay. Before you commit. Yeah. Uh, there it is. Share sound. Okay. Perfect. There we and go. And now you can commit. All right. Okay, and then we can go back. Play it. Should play. It should play. Take there a little delay there. Okay. Uh, now if I can get my cursor to. There we go. Once I saw the third quarter moon through that telescope, I thought, "Oh my God, everybody's got to see this." Everybody can hear that now. Yeah. Okay, great. So, I just wanted to show just a few. And so, of course, um, of course, we wanted to show John as he helped several people build their own telescopes, uh, and a, a little bit about the, you know, the, the, of course, him going to national parks, and of course, the twenty-four incher, and I believe like, that's Brian Rhodes. He's the person on the left there is the one who ground the mirror for the twenty-four inch, and I think this woman painted the uh, the, the telescope for him. Uh, uh, But in the cities, we do planets in the moon. You can't see galaxies and things from the cities. So those things we do in the national parks. And uh, I'd like to, let's see, just a few more pictures. Let's see. And so I think this one here talks a little bit about the San Francisco Sound Book Astronomers. Let's see. In the 60s, if you went out with the, with the astronomers, they were taking pictures with their little telescopes. They had them all set up so they track things across the sky for photography. And we weren't doing that, so we don't have to do all that complicated machinery. We just push the thing around by hand. And so we can make much bigger telescopes and haul them around like that. So that's what happened. Uh, what happened was that the amateur astronomers saw all these great big telescopes running around, and they thought, we could do that if we didn't have to take these stupid pictures. <laughs> so uh, finally, uh, uh, JD and I get to Stellafane, and of course, uh, my I think my third time there, and of course the place was lit up with, with John being there, and of course uh, 
David was there that year too, and, and several years. And uh, and so here we are. At the, um, I don't know how many of you have been able to go to, are on the East Coast or been able to go to Stellafane, but it's a great convention to telescope makers. And of course, here is uh, where everybody shows their, their wares, you know, the telescope uh, contests, and uh, it's a great, uh, a great venue. And here's JD you know, grinding some glass underneath the tent, uh, and everybody was crowded around him. And it's a caveman's job, he used to say all the time. And, he, and of course, uh, everybody got a big kick out of John being under the tent and, uh, and grinding some glass. And of course, uh, he got to see several people. This is Steve Dotson. Uh, he calls his adopted son, and many of you know him as Stargazer Steve. That guy in the middle, you probably don't recognize him, but <laughs> that's me a long time ago. Um, and, uh, oh, of course, you know, David, uh, several times, uh, Carolyn Shoemaker, um, and, and year after year. Uh, oh, that's me. And, of course, the guy on the right is the guy who came into my office and told me that I could build a Type 20 telescope. That's Jim. Yeah. Andy, you're still, on the fr you're still displaying the first image of oh. your presentation. Oh. oh, so I have to go back and share again? Uh, you're still sharing. You just need to uh, click on the other images. Uh, I see. Yeah, dude. Uh, so where am I now? I'm still on the first image? Yeah. On the first image. Uh, why is this? Uh, I'm going through each one on my, on my computer. Are you running two computers or one? Computer? I am running two. One's on a... Uh, okay. So one of them is sharing uh, <laughs> just the first image. But both of them have both images on them. Mm. Okay, um, let's see if I can if I can go out of presenter's view. Let's try that and see what happens real quick. Um, I think yeah, the, the one that we're seeing is not in presenter's view. Yeah, so um, I have to stop sharing to do this and go back. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. It's okay. Okay. So. That's okay. By next year, we'll have it great. <laughs> it takes practice. It does. It does. Yeah. It does and it's it's not easy as everyone knows. Uh, That's right. Uh, well, so. I do it every every day. <laughs> so. I, uh, there you go. Out of presenters mode. I have a question for you, Andy. Sure. Uh, after knowing John Dobson for all these years, mm. what, what is the what is the lasting impression? What what are you left with with uh, with with John? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Uh, what really I was most impressed with with John about was that uh, when I first picked him up the first time he came to Stellafane, uh, we talked about like trees and and animals and birds and uh, and rocks and. Uh, and, and just life in general. And I was just amazed that astronomy, which was such a big part of his life, was, uh, was not his whole life. And he had other interests. And yeah. he was a very bright person, of course. And, you know, later finding out he was a chemist and, and you, know, uh, you know, science, not just science, but uh, just life in general. Uh, he was curious. Was, Don't you he think? Curious. curious, yeah. That's what got me, yeah. Yeah, and what I enjoyed the most was we would go down to the uh, shoreline here in Connecticut and, and on Long Island Sound, and we'd look at the tide and the waves coming in, and we'd see the Terminator as the sun was setting, and you know just all of the things that would happen in nature. And as as Donna says, his curiosity, uh, and he was always so uh, able to communicate, and uh, I just felt that it was such a great pleasure to know him. Uh, to be his friend and to be with him so many years. And I thank uh, Donna, Donna Smith, of course, so much for that, the help. All the people in Connecticut that helped me uh, when, when uh, you know, when John oh, came yeah. to, to visit. He was here for a couple of months at a time and other people, he stayed with other people as well when I hosted him. And of course, uh, he came to this Connecticut Star Party several times. So, uh, yeah, to me. Um, but, but Andy, you, you don't have to thank me. <laughs> one of the few that was one of the few things that John demanded you know he had to go to Marie and Dan and to Carol he had to go to yours you know it was like that that time is Andy's you know so so all I did was follow instructions <laughs> well I I I'm glad to to hear that and I know that 
I felt they were very good. We were good, very good friends. And I, I, um, I remember, you know, one day he, he kept, we said it a couple of days in a row. He said, you know, my friends call me JD. And, uh, and then he said, you know, my friends call me JD. And I was like, oh, oh, he wants me to call him JD. I'm his friend, you know. <laughs> and, uh, um, and I, you know, uh, uh, John being such a great communicator um, and, and being, you know, we could just walk around the neighborhood and he would, he'd pick up, you know, dandelions and start eating them, you know. And I'd, I'd say something like, uh, do they taste good? He goes, well, of course they taste good. I eat them, you know. Uh, uh, he'd start playing the piano in my house. Uh, um, just a very, you know, uh, um, inquisitive, like you say, uh, person uh, wanted to share his his life with everyone else and didn't want a penny for it. And I think his invention of the Dobsonian Mount, which, like he, like you said, Scott, he doesn't really take much credit for, oh, yeah, is the reason why we can all have this romance of having large aperture telescopes that are easy to use and right. that we can and we can bring and see the night sky with. So. That's right. Yeah, I, I, you know, being in the industry of telescope making, I can't, I mean, I can't possibly describe to you the impact that this one guy had, you know, and uh, I, I was almost in disbelief at the time uh, that when I learned that he didn't make a dime off of the design, you know, he didn't want to claim it, he didn't want to have any copyright on it, he didn't have any patent on it, you know, in, and in fact, it was quite the opposite. And I think that alone had such a huge impact on me too. And that's the reason why I spend so much time doing educational outreach, because it is the juice. I mean, it's, it's the energy for me uh, to continue on uh, to be involved in this industry. So many people that work in this industry are burned out. When they go home at night, they don't want to think about telescopes. They don't want to look up at the sky. They don't want to think about astronomy. They just want to go home. Okay. Uh, every night that I walk out that it's clear, I look at those stars. I look at the planets. If I have a telescope I can look through, I look through that too. And I love doing this. You know, this, so this is, this keeps me going. Yeah. And I think you, I agree with you. And I feel the same way that that, that night and that eclipse and the passion that, that came to me, you know, of, of being able to, share this with everyone and and being able to have this telescope to 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 be able to do it with uh you know was it, it's been a love affair ever since and and i thank john for that you know uh and uh yeah uh well we that's why we're all here we want to keep it going and uh i i hope i i, I probably said too much i hope i didn't mess up too much here but uh i think the main thing was we talked about john and uh right and, uh, and I, I hope that you join us when we do this again next year. That's great. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming. So I think next we'll go to David. David Fay. He is also Frey. He is also a telescope maker who can tell us a little bit about his experiences. Still here? Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So um, thank you guys for inviting me. Um, John, I'm just going to say a few words and then show you guys some uh, pictures. I'm a little nervous, <laughs> but that's no, okay. I, that's okay. You're among friends. So <laughs> so um, I met John the first time at 10th and Irving and, you know, the crazy guy with the telescope. Um, this is in San Francisco. A um, bunch of restaurants around that area, if you guys are familiar with that area. And I saw Saturn and, of course, it just, you know, completely blew my mind right so the next thing i know i was taking his uh telescope making class at the old academy of science in golden gate park and um <clears throat> i made a 10 inch in his class which is what you know most people start out with and i remember we were uh doing star testing in the africa hall there uh at night we were the only people in there and he set up a you know, a light at the end, a uh, LED or something. And we were doing star testing of our telescopes in the Africa Hall in the Academy of Sciences. And that was really kind of a romantic thing. So anyway, I made the 10 inch, uh, then I got aperture fever and I made a ground and polish the 16 inch, which he helped me figure. And then uh, I got aperture fever and I ground and polished the 20 inch. <laughs> And then uh, I started to buy a 25 inch blank and I was going to hand 
grind and polish it, but luckily uh, cooler heads prevailed at that point. So in any event, um, I caught the bug and uh, after John was a little bit uh, older, I took over his telescope making class for two years at the Randall Museum in San Francisco. And I helped, I don't know, 10 or 12 or 15 people make scopes. Probably only four people actually finished them, I think. And then um, <clears throat> my friend Doug Smith took over the class from there. He may actually still be uh, teaching that, I'm not sure. I don't live up in the Bay Area anymore. Um, so anyway, John changed my life. And I'll, he told me a few things about making telescopes. The most important one, he used to say, if you're gonna break your glass, break it early. Um, <laughs> And I always thought that was funny, uh, well, obviously. And if you see his video, his telescope making video, at one point he takes a 16-inch blank and he pounds a nail with it into a board. So that's, that's pretty cool. He also said that uh, figuring a mirror is never done uh, until somebody, you know, takes the mirror away from you. They got to take it away from you because you never get it right. And at some point, someone's just going to kind of remove it from you and put it in a Dobsonian mount. And then... Um, he used to say, and he said this in the video too, how much 60 grit do you use to grind a mirror? And he used to say four times the amount of salt for scrambled eggs. And that, that is a lot of salt in my opinion, you know? So um, I, these are just kind of funny things that I just remember him saying. And then in, in the class, he would ask people yes or no questions all the time. And, you know, people were terrified of him and they couldn't say yes or no. And finally, when somebody would say yes or no and get it right, he would say you're right. And then he'd kind of look off to the side with that kind of wry smile that he has, right, that you've all seen. Um, and he was always prompt for his classes, you know. He was only late once. And it turned out this one time that he was late, he said that uh, apparently some eye doctor uh, – gave him new corneas or something or worked on his eyes to, to kind of fix the, you know, how your eyes get more and more yellow. And a, he said that he was cooking before the class and he got so enthralled at the blue flame on his stove that he just lost track of time because it was so beautiful. And that was the only time he was ever late to class. And he told us that story and apparently his eyes were better and he saw that blue color you know we all know that blue color and that, i thought that was really interesting that he just got sort of lost in the in the sort of poetry of the color and um so anyway i also took his uh cosmology class and i videotaped it i sent uh, donna i think i sent you those tapes right yes i, I, just, I, I don't know if you guys ever posted it what's that i'm just behind on getting them posted <laughs> yeah i don't know how the quality we have is a, we have an yeah. old website that's really you know, either a mountain of work to change and upgrade or struggle to add. So. Uh -huh. Well, that's cool. So I gave those to you guys. So hopefully someday they'll be useful. Um, and then, you know, over the years, I've been doing star parties now ever since that happened. That was like in the late 80s, I think, when I made my first telescope. And I did a rough estimate. I think now all the um, star parties I've been to at Mount Tam, at Yosemite, at, uh, you know, various places, um, Culver City now down in LA, because I live in LA, and at uh, um, Griffiths Observatory and Mount, uh, Mount Wilson. I figure about 40,000 people have looked through my telescopes over the years. And uh, they've all climbed up the six foot ladder in the dark. No one's ever tripped or fallen. And they've all seen things like M13, the Ring Nebula, and Saturn, and so on. So John really changed my life. And, you know, as a result, you know, I was president of San Francisco Amateur Astronomers for, I think, one term. And I'm now a solar system ambassador and a member of the Los Angeles Astronomical Society. So John really affected me in so many ways. And, um, you know, I, I'm just so grateful. And uh, so I've just got some quick pictures to show you guys. Excuse me, David, oh. before you go on. Uh huh. Um, so once we get back into doing events, <clears throat> since you're in LA, I can use you at the, li the public libraries. Yeah, I'd love to do it if we can ever get out of this. Uh... Yes, great. <laughs> I have more libraries than volunteers. <laughs> well, I'm excited because I'm, I'm now a volunteer up at uh, Mount Wilson. In fact, I did a star party up there about two weeks ago, actually. Um, so can you guys see my screen? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, I'll just kind of run through this. 
you know, this is, uh, most of these pictures are from Mount Tam and this is just a picture. I didn't take this picture. I'm not sure who did, but this was kind of off in the distance, you know, before the sun sets at Mount Tam. And then here's a picture. Many of you have probably seen this. It was, this was the memorial we did at Land's End. And you can see, you know, everybody who's anybody, I guess, was there. And you can see the various daubs there. There's my 20 inch in the background there. And there's Ken Frank. I don't know if Ken's on right now, but there's Ken and, you know, just everybody who, you know, I've seen at star parties over the years is here. And it's just, it was a wonderful day, you know, John's, uh, you know, memorial out there at Land's End in San Francisco, where we did a lot of star parties. And then here's John at Land's End as well, um, just giving a lecture before, you know, the sun went down. And uh, that's my 16 inch that I made, you know, that John helped me figure. He actually signed it, um, which is kind of cool. And you can see there's John's sun telescope in the background, I think there, you can see it. I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, but you can see it in the background. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, John just, you know, these are kind of action photos of John. It looks like it was in about 2007. That's cool that the date's there. Um, there's me, I, I lost a few pounds, but you can see how happy John is. And uh, he, he was just, you know, such a great guy. And then here's some more pictures that lands in um, one day. There's Ken Frank and some other people that were there. A lot of you may know Ken. I don't know where this picture came from, but this is in San Francisco and this is John uh, probably after a, or during a class, probably looking at the figure on a uh, unilluminized mirror, I would imagine. But that's, that's the classic Dobsonian right there, you know, and we, we all know that thing, right? So, and these pictures are all of uh, his birthday party that we had in 2009 at the Randall Museum. There's John. Um, oh, Tony. This is Sam Swice. There's Ken. Sure. Um, you know, that's me. Uh, and you know, all these people here know John. Uh, I forget this gentleman's name. But Charrington, William Charrington. Yeah, and I think that was his son actually yes. over here. Uh -huh. um, but anyway, it was a really wonderful uh, celebration of John's birthday. Probably 95 maybe or something, I don't know. And there's John, you know, with the cake. Somebody made a little, uh, you know, reflector telescope there for him, which is kind of cool. And there's just some more pictures of John. Those were all at the Randall Museum in San Francisco. And then I'm gonna just uh, blow through some pictures. All these people are really were uh, impacted by John. This is a picture of a star party at Yosemite that San Francisco amateur astronomers did every year. And we always took a group photo, which was um, really nice. And then here's a picture you can see in the background, you know, half dome in the background. Oh, beautiful. And, um, you know, you can see this. I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, but the, this telescope, it was made. This is an 18 inch that Doug Smith made. And then you can see my 20 inch in the background. And then, you know, all the people at, at uh, Yosemite that we did every year. Um, so, you know, he just affected so many people. And then this is a group photo up at uh, Mount Tam. And, um, you know, just a number of people up there with their telescopes. And you can see, this is Mount Tam, right? You can see all the dots, right? Some of them are homemade. Some of them are store-bought. And you can just see how happy everybody is, right? And all these telescopes that were set up there pretty much every month since, I guess, the late 80s, um, up until about two years ago, there was a star party up there every single month. Wow. And then, um, you know, more daubs, you can see these are, you know, homemade daubs. Um, you know, it's just, you know, really cool. And you can see how happy everybody is with their Dobsonians, right? You know, I'm so proud of my telescope. And um, I forget this gentleman's name. Do um, you know who that is? Anybody know who this guy is? That's um, Dean Kettleson. Yeah. And um, I haven't heard, I, I'm not sure, I don't want to speak out of turn. I'm not sure how Dean is doing. Um, um, actually, he's okay. Um, well, I don't know how great, but I had an email from him today. So. Oh, good. Because I knew, I knew he wasn't feeling well, but yeah. it, his job was really cool because it came apart in two pieces and he'd throw it in the back of his car. And, and uh, I think he had a 12 inch there, but you can see it's just a classic. He is here tonight. What's that? 
was here tonight. Dean is actually present. He's with us tonight. Oh, oh he's there. Oh, Dean, are you there? Oh, this is this is a different Dean. This oh. is Dean Gustafson. Yeah, it's a different Dean. Yeah. And then more happy people with their dogs put them together. You can just see how happy everybody is. And all these people, I guess, at the end of the day, owe their legacy to John. Um, this telescope, man, this guy would bring this thing up there. It was, it was just a masterpiece of craftsmanship. And he always put his little rug out for it, too, which I thought Yeah, that's great. cool. Look at that. <laughs> the, the thing is absolutely beautiful. Now, and then yeah. more, no, I'm sorry, go ahead. I keep referring to Mount Tam. Uh, I think that's the uh, nickname for Mount Tamalpais, is that right? Yeah, Mount Tamalpais. It's right across the bay from San Francisco. Um, okay. Yeah, funny story about John. John used to walk home from San Fr from Mount Tam. He would walk home after star parties all the way back to San Francisco. That's quite a walk. <laughs> and I, I don't know if this is true, but I heard that, uh, you know, they, they shut down the pedestrian access to the Golden Gate Bridge after like 11 o'clock or something. And he was walking home. And he jumped over the barrier and walked across the bridge, got a ticket, and uh, went to court, apparently, and said, I don't own a car. How do you expect me to get home? I was walking home, and they let him go. They didn't make him pay the fine. So, um, But walking home from Mount Tamalpais. Oh, interesting thing about Mount Tam, too. When the fog rolls into the Bay Area, the only thing in the Bay Area that sticks out of the fog is the top of Mount Tam. And, you know, the Bay Area is an urban landscape you know, light pollution everywhere. But when the fog rolls in, it cuts out all the light pollution. You can actually see the Milky Way from the top of Mount Tam. Mm. And uh, I suspect that's one of the only metropolitan areas in the world where that happens. So that's really cool. And then just more pictures. And sorry, I'm showing off my 20 inch. That's my son. Uh, I like this picture because it makes the telescope look bigger, all the little, little kids, right? So, um, <laughs> And just more people up there. This is uh, another star party that I did up in Novato, California. And then this is at the space station. And then uh, this is a picture I drew of um, Jupiter through the 20-incher. Hmm. Looks like back in, or maybe that was the 16-incher. I don't remember. But that was back in 1999. So anyway, that's all, all of that. And sorry for the vacation pictures. And I'm ending with, uh, you know, a... Uh, picture of Mount Tam. And then I have one last thing. Can you guys see? Can you guys see my camera? Yes. They redid. Let me see if I can. How do you stop sharing? Ah, there, it is. there you go. Uh, I don't know if you can put me on the screen as if you can pin me to the screen for a well, second, but I want to sh show you guys something. Uh, go ahead. Somebody, the okay. They redid all of the um, signage in, at Mount Tam, and they did an auction. And uh, this is the sign from Rock Springs where we did all the star parties. And I, I uh, bid on the sign. I, I outbid another individual for this sign. So it's kind of a legacy for, I feel like it's a legacy for John because that's where so many star parties happen at Rock Springs Trail Head at Mount Tamalpais. And that's all I have to say. And thank you guys very much. John really changed my life. I'm getting a little emotional here, I think, but John really did uh, have a, an enormous effect on me and the people around me. So thank there you, you go. Thank you so much. I really, I really I appreciate really you joining Thanks. us. I just wanted to say one, one little memory of my own, that one of uh, John's visits to us, we met him at the Tucson airport. He was to stay with us for a few days. And, you know, he came off and uh, he had this laundry bag full of, full of items and all of his clothes and everything. And as soon as he saw us and recognized us, he's 90 years old, he jumps up and clicks his heels. <laughs> it was extraordinary <laughs> that uh, this man could do something like that at age 90. Well, oh, know, actually, actually, one more thing. That reminds me. He told a story that he loved riding the buses in San Francisco and he loved to give away his seat to people younger than him. <laughs> so uh, anyway, it, it was kind of funny. So when you <laughs> picked John up at the airport, he was the last guy off the plane. 
I mean, instead of like being able to board first or whatever, he, you would watch everybody come off the plane and get their luggage. Finally, here would come John. And he always yeah. would be last. All right. Well, thank you, guys. <laughs> thank you so much. I really enjoyed having you here. So, Barry, um, do you want to go next? I think he's here, right? Maybe. Barry? Yeah, Barry. On mute. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, now I can. Oh, well, that's wonderful. <laughs> I, I I don't have any pictures to show. Um, so, I well, wait, First, maybe uh, you want to introduce yourself. I didn't do any good introduction, so tell us. I'm uh, I'm talking to you from Rhode Island right now, but I lived in Hawaii for a long time, and I met John in Hawaii. Uh, and if I can uh, kind of divert my uh, Grand Canyon talk to uh, cover some of that uh, first time with John in Hawaii, uh, he showed up with Jane Houston and uh, her pal Frank, and. Um, they landed at the Kona airport on the big island. And that's, you know, that's the one everybody asks us about if they find out we're an astronomer, they say, oh, have you been to Mauna Kea? You know, like that's some kind of a Mecca for amateur astronomers, which it is not. But John was offered the chance to tour the Kex. And uh, he also was invited to speak at the I think it's the Hawaii Preparatory Academy. And so there was a little package deal and we're, we're going to do a star party or two. And we were on the big island. I, I lived on Oahu, but I flew over there with a 15 incher figuring he needed something to work with. And uh, so we began doing these things and, and we got a nice tour of the Keck. The, the thing I'll mention about that is that uh, some guy who apparently was a, a, a fan of, of John's ended up being the optical, the head of optics up there on the mountain uh, for Keck. And, and uh, so he was kind of, uh, you know, uh, I, I guess patronizing is the right word. And of course, John doesn't do patronizing very much. So, uh, so uh, he passed us on to another guy who, gave the tourist explanation of how adaptive optics work. And John stopped the guy in the middle of his spiel and said, now that's garbage. He said, that's for tourists. Now you tell me how this thing really works. And he had his angry voice. If you've ever heard John's angry voice, uh, you know, he, he really insisted, stop that nonsense and tell me what's really happening here. So the guy did, he stopped and, and he went more into detail and, uh, and John was satisfied. He, he, uh, he let the guy off easy. <laughs> so, uh, and then uh, let's see, there's one other uh, thing from the top of the mountain where um, he had his son, Lauren with him, John and Lauren. And of course, Jane was there too, uh, and Frank. And um, he, uh, I don't know, if, I guess I took the picture. Maybe, uh, maybe uh, Jane took the picture, but there's a, a mirror recoding uh, service up there on top of the mountain where they take the hexagonal sections. I think there's 36 of them in the Keck and they take them out and they uh, um, aluminize them in a vacuum chamber on the top of the mountain so they don't have to bring them all the way down. So they have all these spare uh, hexagons and they're each, I think they're each two meters, they were pretty big. Uh, yeah, I think they were each two meters, uh, you know, across. So they had them lined up so that we could get infinite uh, John and Lauren standing there in uh, uh, two of these uh, mirrors that were reflecting each other to infinity. You've done that with mirrors, right? So that was kind of fun. Um, so, uh, uh, the other thing is down on the uh, uh, lower slopes, the uh, control room for the Keck and the Keck main building is uh, that that's not up on top. So we were down there when we were touring around and uh, uh, there's also a, sort of a private school 
and the Keck people kind of had dibs on the lecture hall, sort of an auditorium. And uh, we were supposed to get John there, but one of the guys took him out to dinner. We went also. And, uh, and then uh, I think he ran out and we couldn't find our way back to this uh, place. Well, we'd never been this Hawaii preparatory. We showed up 45 minutes late. And, and here's an audience of people and they're being primed for John Dobson. And so this guy who was the, uh, the fan from the sidewalk astronomers, who is the head optician guy, introduces John when he finally shows up. And he says, uh, uh, here's, um, you know, this guy he means so much to me, blah, blah, blah. And he's gonna talk to us all about telescopes. So John stands up on stage. I think he hopped up on the stage, which was like three feet above the rest of the room. And he said, I will talk about no such thing. And he launches into an attack on the Big Bang. I think some of you can imagine how that went. And the, the Keck folks were horrified that people were, were, were hauling their kids out of the room so they didn't have to listen to this, you know, this, this blasphemy. And uh, it was, uh, we, Jane and I were sitting there in the seats and we were laughing our heads off. Yeah. Because uh, the, the, it, it just, and he didn't let up. Uh, John just kept going after him and said, come on, he said, attack me, attack me. You know, I say this, you attack me, G give me what you think. And they wouldn't say anything. They were trying to like honor and cherish and, you know, they weren't going to listen to him. So it was very funny, uh, I thought. Uh, another quick one from, uh, we stayed in a, a junkie hotel in Kailua Kona. If you've ever been there, you can get some fairly cheap hotels down there. So we were all bunked in like one room. And uh, he, uh, oh, gee, oh, I know, we're walking to the hotel room down the typical streets. And there's a hedge of natal plum. And John sees a red one. Uh, this is a real prickly uh, shrub that people, um, you know, make into hedges and things like that. But it's all thorns and a few leaves. And every once in a while, there's a fruit on it. So he grabs one of these red fruits and sticks it in his mouth. And this all this white sap comes bursting out. And he says, yeah, these taste quite good. He said, this one's a good one. So I found one and I put it in my mouth. Well, the white sap will seal your lips shut. It's like <laughs> glue. And, and he didn't tell me that. And, and it was like half an hour before I could, you know, open and close my mouth without difficulty. Oh my so God. that was uh, one of those uh, John eats anything stories. Um, <laughs> we, we went from there to uh, Oahu and he gave a talk at, at the local club. Of course, he had some detractors. <laughs> I think the, uh, vice president at the time was a big Dobson detractor. You know, he won't touch a Dobsonian. He has to have an equatorial mount. You know, these people. And uh, so uh, John was staying at various houses. He stayed at my place for a few days. He stayed at this other guy's who was polite. He's actually an Episcopal priest and he had to be polite, but he did not agree with anything Dobson said about any subject ever. Uh, and uh, so that was kind of funny. Uh, we did the, one of my first sidewalk astronomy um, events when Dobson was there, and I picked the wrong uh, thing. There's Ala Moana Beach Park is a very big, um, very well populated uh, beach right in downtown Honolulu. And I figured, well, there's got to be people there. Sun went down, no people around. So uh, I, I since moved right into Waikiki and I've done many, many uh, sidewalk astronomy events right on the sidewalk in Waikiki. But uh, I learned my lesson with John right there saying, hey, where are all the people? We're not in the right place. So uh, uh, learned that one. Um, also, uh, we went to a school star party with, with John and that was up in the... Uh, higher elevations, kind of in the saddle of Oahu. The thing about that was that um, it was supposed to set up on a tennis court. And you know what John thinks about um, 
asphalt uh, and and what it does to this local scene. So he was kind of griping about that, walking around, and he's doing that thing with his hand where you've seen him do that. He holds his hand face up and then face down. And if there's a difference in temperature, says this is not good. So I learned that at that uh, at that event. Uh, and then he would walk around and just pick people in the crowd and ask them a question such as you've heard, such as, uh, oh, what's a typical one? Um, oh, does the earth rise and set as seen from the moon, as seen from any one spot on the moon? And people are just stare at him like, who is this guy? Where is he from? And do I have to answer his question? And, uh, and then he'd say uh, something like, uh, how long does a day last on any one spot of the moon? And they'd go, what, what? what? And then he'd say, uh, you've heard these questions. Another one is, uh, why are clouds flat on the bottom and fluffy on top? And, and, uh, and they're just going, whoa. So uh, it's funny to watch the interaction. Uh, you've watched it all yourselves, I'm sure. So, uh, uh, oh, uh, last thing on Oahu. Uh, well, uh, I had a telescope that I was working on. It was a kit I bought from Pierre Schwar, and it was a Dobsonian. And uh, I hadn't quite finished it. And he pointed to it. It was in the living room, I think, uh, when he stayed with me. And he said, oh, I'm allergic to telescopes that don't work. You may have heard that one, too. So I got my introduction to the basics. And he helped me finish it. And we brought it to a star party that he went to up on the North Shore. So uh, that was that was real good. So that was... Um, that was all Oahu and the Big Island. Uh, he also went back to the Big Island at a later date to uh, work on a telescope making project again with Jane Houston. I, I think she was Jones by then. And, um, and uh, he did his best. He, he was well behaved. He worked hard. Uh, the guy who organized it uh, actually spent all of the money on the mirror blanks and the grits and had nothing to, to help these students with on building their telescopes. So mm -hmm. I built two Dobbs uh, so that John could test the optics. You know, you got to stick it in a scope that you can aim before it's illuminized. Uh, and uh, so uh, I went over and helped with that and it was a great experience, but uh, it was kind of, a, uh, we were all under some stress. We had 50 students with mirrors and no telescopes and no way to get them. And uh, that's how this guy had left us before going on vacation to Mexico. <laughs> Can't even think of his name right now, but uh, he probably doesn't want me to. Uh, um, uh, okay, well, for Grand Canyon, uh, do I have a couple more minutes? Yeah, go ahead. All right, thank you. Um, I loved going there with, uh, with John and Every time I went there with him, of course, we were driving from uh, either picking him up or once from San Francisco, once from uh, L.A., maybe twice from L.A. Yeah, I think but, so. But we went out and uh, uh, on road trip and that was fun, you know, just having him in the car, talking away. I, I ran a tape recorder some of the time, but tape recordings in cars uh, on the road are not so fun to listen to, but I have it somewhere. Uh, so we got out there and it was like a homecoming for him. He really regarded the Grand Canyon uh, South Rim as his, you know, it just going way back in time uh, that he had been there. I, I can't tell you what years he's where it was early 2000s. And uh, I went there three times with him. And uh, uh, we, we did go to the North Rim once, twice to the South Rim, once to the North Rim. And the North Rim trip also took us to Bryce. So he was at Bryce. But at the Grand Canyon, he, he just settled right in. And everything was a memory for him. Um, I, did, I got him lost. We tried to do a shortcut from Yavapai uh, cabins to Yavapai Point, I think, through the woods. And it took a little longer than we figured. And he started getting after me for uh, getting him lost in the woods. But uh, everything else went just fine. And uh, lots of stories about hiking down to the, to the uh, Colorado. 
uh, and back in, in a day. That's like 18 miles or something. You know, I, uh, I was dealing with a 89 year old guy and maybe the last time he went, he was 91, something like that. But uh, he wanted to hike down Bright Angel Trail. Uh, we did it two different times, uh, the two times that we were at the South Rim. And, and he just chugged along down the trail. He had this trick where he'd wet a towel and wrap it around his neck. That was his trick for staying cool. And it really worked well. Of course, I did it too. And we went down two hours the first time. And the second year, you know, he was older even. And I think we only went for an hour down and an hour back. But two hours down and two hours back was, uh, you know, that was that was quite a thing for a guy that old. So as he passed everybody on the trail, he'd say, how old are you? Or he'd say, did you go down to the bottom? And, uh, and then he'd like to yell out that he was 89 and a half that time that we went for two hours. Uh, so he, he just had a ball there. He, he loved every part of it. Uh, he was a little cranky about the, uh, uh, Jane's not gonna like me saying this, uh, but uh, he got cranky sometimes about uh, the, uh, what he said was the, um, uh, he, he got kicked out of the, the Grand Canyon. That's his version. And then the reason was because he was saying that the canyon was so old and the stars were so old and the universe was so old. And some people identified with a religion figure that was against their teaching. So uh, now whether that's true or not, it's, it's probably partly true. I think Dean Kettleson would know. <laughs> but uh, uh, anyway, so, uh, but I think John's uh, original things there, events there, uh, as he evolved the star party were more like a, uh, it was sort of a, a hippie-esque uh, sort of affair. And uh, I think that partly had something to do with him uh, getting, uh, you know, having his event disallowed. All right. Well, uh, I probably went over my time. So uh, thanks for letting me share. And uh, back to you, Donna oh, or, or you. Scott. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing. I enjoyed your stories. Yeah, so me, we're going to take a break, right? Yeah, you want to take a break right now and um, uh, yeah. grab a cup of coffee or a sandwich and come back in about 10 minutes? Yeah, 10 minutes. 10 minutes is good. Sounds good. OK, we'll be back, folks. Stay tuned. Okay, Mike. Hey, Mike, can you come and look at my thing of Death Valley and try to find some pictures for Katie? Can you look on my hard drive of Death Valley and we'll try to get some pictures for Katie? Can you? I get the Katie to resume. Hey, Donna, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Yeah, I just emailed you my PowerPoint and my notes uh, from, this is Dave, and my notes from the meeting. Uh, oh, good. Oh, good, yeah. And um, I'll try and get those things updated. It's so hard. It just doesn't, it doesn't take any, it's an old, um, it's on web.com, but it's the system they use is old. And they told me they could update it, but I would have to manually move things. And there's so many articles. There's like hundreds and hundreds of pages. And I'm like, uh, one of these days, but not yet. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, actually, the file I sent you is pretty big. I might have to put it. If you, if you don't get it, I might have to put it. Um... OK, like on WeTransfer, something. that's the wrong year. Yeah, yeah, something. Yeah. Okay. Do you see Death Valley? Yeah, right here. Okay. That's that's only one year though. There should be a Death Valley folder. Okay. Click astronomy. Yeah, oh. Right there. Now I go to Death Valley. You know, Katie has a big blue tail. Yeah. It, one of my doesn't matter. She's in the mall. Going and I get to a good one of hers. 
Oh, here, that's a good one for her. Hold on. Let me just, she's going to hold them up so I can just text them to her. We're going to email to her. Okay, yeah, you can email them. Click that one. Click that one. I'll just go. Well, we got the H, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good. Looking for her telescope. Funny so apparently, Katie didn't take her telescope. <laughs> Okay, so I go back to the other folder that says Death Valley. Is it a different year? Yeah, yeah maybe. No, we just didn't take Isn't pictures. Yeah, we just didn't take pictures of that. No. I'll go back to there. That's the last one. That, give her that one. Right here? Yeah. The last time John went to Death Valley. That's my telescope. Donna, do you know, did they ever do a John Dobson Day thing officially in San Francisco? I know they were talking about it. Yeah, they did on his, on his like 95th birthday, I think. He got a proclamation from the city, but that was like one time. So oh, I don't know. I, I thought they might have done a, actually picked a date or something. No, it was just for that day, I think. It's John Dobson Day, but I don't think it went on after yeah. that. Okay, try LA. Maybe they might <clears> have Katie. Let's see, let's see. What? Yeah, the sun scope. Pardon me? We're trying to find pictures of Katie's telescope, yeah. but I can't. Well, I only put a quarter inch in there. Okay, well, just send her those two. At least she's huh? got those two. <laughs> Maybe I just don't actually have a telescope. That's what I do. You don't know. But I said, Katie, we'd have no pictures of your telescope. I have pictures doing? of you eating the salt that grass or whatever it was. I have that one. And I have okay. this one. Okay. But it's from the age of real photographs and not digital ones. Huh? So well, and I don't bother to scan my old ones. One of you and John and isn't that what we're sending her? One of her and John and another one, I don't remember. No, but we have, but you no, know, but we have a solution for everything. Just yeah, Photoshop me in next to some other telescope. It'll be fine. Yeah, you're, you're looking through the 18 and then one of you and John and George. Oh, that's fun. Creek. Remember the day he was waving at the lady to come to the bathroom? That was a great day. <laughs> I tell that story often when I'm trying to explain John to people. Me too. I've got also, go. Donna, I think you'll appreciate. I you know, we should sue the them for for gender discrimination. Okay, for what? <laughs> I'll gonna... appreciate what? Oh, um, you know, we should. 
I uh, met a guy. I went down to the San Diego Astronomy Association. Oh, yeah, uh, he's here. Jim's on tonight. He told oh, me. Oh, hey, Jim. <laughs> um, I was just telling Jim while we were there because he was he was talking to me about you. And he was like, yeah, Donna told me that if he stinks, uh, just to tell him that he stinks and to go take a bath. He's like, I don't know if I could do that. It's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you. I knew him from when I was way too young. I never had that kind of reverence for him. Yeah. Like when he made me make him those eggs that morning when he unloaded me out of the van. Yes. Yes. That was another good John story. Love you. I just think the best one, though, is when, when we were at the library and you had to use gum for your secondary I and I used a dime to your secondary. I'm basically <laughs> terrified every day. I will be back in just a moment. I got to use the restroom before just 10 minutes. <laughs> Yeah, Jim will be on later. Robert? Well, how do you get involved in this? Mm -hmm. It's really funny. You babysat Dobson once. Yeah, that's really funny. We're both on the same thing now. Yeah. I mean, he knew Donna, so, and Donna's the one who organized this to find as many people who knew yeah. Dobson as possible, so. What is Comet Electric? So I am currently on my work computer because that's the easiest laptop I have to log in on stuff. So that's my company name for the company I'm working for right now. I figured it's not that weird since it's an astronomy thing. Nobody will question it. <laughs> Works well enough for me. Um, I'm actually debating at this point. I was talking about it the other night, um, making a children's book about my journey into telescope building. Um, asks for nothing more. So. Cheerio or the Fruit Loop before. Now we want to get M13. M13 is a globular cluster. This is a public star party. This is in a national park. This is where we take the telescope so that the general public can see these things, which they can see other places. And what we try to do is to show the bright objects, the important objects, if you want, Okay, please climb fast like a chimpanzee. Whose, whose video is this? This is beautiful. And it'll drift across to the lower right, but you'll come down long before that so that the other people can see. You'll see Saturn to the upper right. It'll look like a straw hat. It takes light one and a half hours to come from Saturn. Scott, you're on mute, buddy. Um, that's right. I'm on mute. <laughs> I often do that. I don't know why. Anyways, um, uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, your little break and that you've been enjoying uh, the uh, Global Star Party so far with uh, Donna Smith and all the friends here uh, and acquaintances of John Dobson. So he affected so many of us. Um, and uh, if you didn't know him through personally, and good Lord, he met so many people, uh, you might have met him th through uh, a Dobsonian telescope or looking through one, uh, through sidewalk astronomy. Um, I know that um, my Dobsonian telescope definitely took me on a journey that I could scarcely imagine. And then uh, having met John Dobson a couple of times. Uh, also <coughs> so. But uh, Donna, I'm going to turn this back over to you for the the midterm part of this uh, program. Oh, okay, I'm here. So next, we're going to go to Katie Holland. Hoagland. I never say your name correctly. I'm sorry. Katie was our youth coordinator for many years, and she was one of the youngest people to build a telescope with John. And she went with us for I don't know six, seven years to Death Valley. So Katie, go ahead. All right, hi. Um, so I'm Katie Hoagland. Don't worry, nobody can pronounce my name right. Uh, that's, it's impossible actually, where there was even debate in the family. So I built my first telescope when I was 11. Um, fun picture, I'm gonna go with my old school photographs first. Uh, this is me and John and my dad working on building the base. So that was a fun one. Uh, the mirror was actually given back to me, illuminized on my 12th birthday. 
So good birthday present. Uh, I had originally gone up and met John because Griffith Observatory had, had a program where John was going to be up there building telescopes. I knew about Dobsonians, I knew about Dobson, and it seemed like a good opportunity to meet him. He, as is his thing to do, immediately threw me into mirror grinding. I don't know that I had talked to him for more than a minute or two before I had to start grinding my first mirror. Um, I ended up taking his telescope building workshop at the Vedanta Society in Hollywood. And it was a fascinating experience. I did not know what I was getting into. Um, as a result of all of that, I ended up now as a telescope operator at Griffith Observatory. I ended up later on making a sun scope. That was always the one that Dobson appreciated most. Um, that one he wanted to take credit for every time was the Dobson sun scope. He loved that thing. Clever design too, I'll give him that one. Uh, and then I did just recently, and he would have killed me for this one, did just recently buy a 20 inch daub with struts and it's got a super fancy focuser. He would <laughs> not be thrilled. Um, but at least now this time, if it wasn't a strut type telescope, I could sleep inside of it and carry on his legacy. So I guess I'll just have to get a sauna tube to sleep in when I'm near it. Couple good John stories. My favorite one is we were at, uh, Griffith Observatory was closed. So we were down at our satellite facility by the LA Zoo. Dobson was going up to, I forget which vendor it is now, either way, I probably shouldn't say, but he went up and he was pushing on this Dobsonian and it would spin and he pushed it again and it would spin. And the poor salesman came up to him and goes, well, that there, sir, that's a Dobsonian. <laughs> oh no. So he turned around and goes, the hell it is, I'm Dobson. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that poor salesman. He was not ready for that. And I was like, well, he needs right. That is Dobson. In fact, can't <laughs> lie about that one. Um, so yeah, I don't know what that guy thought he was going to do with his time. Um, let's see. What's another good one? Honestly, most of my stories, because I did go to Death Valley for many years uh, with John, and that was always an experience. Uh, I suppose I can tell you how the public viewed him. That's another good one. Uh, there once was a lady who was trying to convince her daughter to come in and listen to his ranger talk or his foot warmer, as he called him. And she was sitting out there. No, he's, he's the second greatest mind of our time. That's an interestingly specific thing. But I asked, you know, I had to ask the question, well, who's the first? Was, oh, Evil Knievel. So <laughs> Evil Knievel, or John Dobson's second greatest mind to Evil Knievel. Just so we're clear about this. So the public loved him, I guess is my point. I have P second best to Evil Knievel. Not sure where that ranks on Greatest Minds, but that's what somebody thought for sure. Um, but yeah, it was always a good time. It was interesting because like Donna, I because I knew him from such a young age, I think I ended up kind of working with him with a lack of reverence for him. Um, and I spent so much time with him in Death Valley. It was one of the good ones. He, uh, you need to yeah. tell the story. The first year in Death Valley, when we were all in one room in John's sneakers. Oh my God, yes. He, uh, I don't, now to be fair, plenty of people thought that me, Donna and John were a family. John was clearly my grandpa, Donna was my mom and that's why we would all stay in a room together. That was a reasonable thing. It wasn't because we and were we astronomers. Tim. Yeah, we oh Tim. God, Tim was there too. <laughs> um, it's not like, you know, we're all astronomers. None of us were rich. So we would just stay in one room. It was fine. I guess that's weird in retrospect that a 14 year old girl was staying in a room with a 90 year old man, but you know, it's fine. John would never change. John would sleep in his clothes, including his sneakers. And one night while he was asleep on the bed, his sneakers were just rubbing together like a cricket. It sounded like a cricket. <laughs> it, was a, it was the funniest thing. Which I think that was tsunami year, wasn't it? I think that was the year when the tsunami. No, hit. that was the very first year. But Katie's like, was it? Was that happened? the year when we we did have to uh, escape the long way one year because the no, roads all washed yes. out? That was a different year. Night, again. But that night, you're like, what the hell is he doing? I don't know. And then we started giggling really hard, and he's like, somebody's not going to be able to get up and build a telescope in the morning. <laughs> I always no. got up and built a telescope, whether I wanted to or not. There were certainly some morning. This the tsunami year. That's the year you had to ride on the cooler because we got yes. We didn't plan on bringing John back, and we had him, and you got to sit on the cooler. 
and all the roads were closed. And it was like a 10 hour trip from Death Valley with Katie perched in the middle, really illegally on a, on a cooler. Yeah. And this, so yeah, sidewalk astronomy is definitely, uh, you know, if they want to call it guerrilla astronomy, let me tell you, it can be if you do it right. Yeah. And that's, that's the year when John said, um, we were going back and he's like, every time I go around a curb, he's like, you've never rolled a van, obviously. And, <laughs> and Katie's like, well, don't roll this one. We have 62 inches of aperture in the back. <laughs> and John's like, you counted them? <laughs> we I counted them. What else was I going to do? <laughs> Okay, I may have been counting aperture, but John would count the uh, the posts on the side of the road and tell you how fast you were going. If he couldn't see the speedometer, he'd be counting the posts. <laughs> You're going 67, he's going 65. <laughs> uh, yeah. he, was, he was a riot. It was absolutely wild to go on those trips with him because it was just such a wild ride every time, especially because I think me and Donna treated him more like a person than he was used to. He was used to people being very reverent of him. He was Dobson. He was the godfather of amateur telescope making. And Donna and I knew him so well that one morning I was, it was cold and it was the one year we tried camping. Do not camp in Death Valley over Christmas and New Year's. It is very cold. Um, you have to come very well prepared for that. And we were not. So we were sleeping in the van and whoever would wake up, we'd turn on the heater in the van for a while. So I was asleep, leaning up against the door on the passenger side of the van. And at six o'clock in the morning, John opens the door to the van. I unceremoniously tumble to the ground. He goes, good morning. I would like my eggs, please. He demanded soft boiled eggs, boiled for exactly three minutes after the water had started boiling. And it was just, it was the funniest thing. And I think that was the one time, because usually I don't mind making John's eggs. It was a perfectly fine occasion. And honestly, I'm very good at soft boiled eggs now. Um, and I go, John, make your own eggs. And I closed the door and locked it up. <laughs> <laughs> and go back to your, because remember he had a little teardrop trailer he was staying in. And you're like, go back to your trailer. Leave us alone. <laughs> and then in about an hour, we were over at the, we, we okay, we were going to camp. And then we decided camping's not for us. And we couldn't get a room until the next day. Is that when we went to the opera house? That morning, we, we go over there and they said, come at two o'clock and it's like 830. And we're like, did anybody check out early? And they're like, okay, fine. I, I saved a room. I knew you were going to be here early. And we get to the room and Katie's like rubbing the bed going, look at our bed. <laughs> like we didn't <laughs> tell before. And then John's uh, like, so this is our room? And we're like, no, you have a trailer. This is our room. <laughs> uh, he was okay know, with it. Was he would never. Yeah, no, no, no. And that's the thing is that John, I think, uh, I don't know if Donna, if you mentioned it or somebody else had before, I think you were mentioning it in your story with Carla, that John actually would kind of respect you more and remember you more if you did talk back to him sometimes. If you pushed back on him, he would be a little bit snippy for a second. And then he would realize, nah, you know what? They're right. It's kind of fun to have somebody push back for once. Yeah. So it was just kind of like treating him like a normal person sometimes that I think he liked that. I mean, as much as he Yeah, liked- I think that he missed it because a lot of people, there was a lot of reverence for him. And rightfully so. He really did change the telescope game. Um but he's and I mean, yeah. Yeah, he was he was definitely still a human being with plenty of human follies and all of that. I know one time he had gotten snippy with me when we were building a telescope in Death Valley because he needed a screwdriver and I bought him the wrong one or something. And so finally he asks me for the right one and I just walked away and left for a few hours. I came back, he had sorted it out. And, okay, John, did you get your screwdriver? Oh yes, thank you. <laughs> yes, what happened to you? I noticed you got out of here. Yeah, yeah he, is, he is perfectly industrious on his own. He was perfectly capable on his own. And I think he appreciated occasionally doing things on his own again. Yeah. Um, because it is hard as you're getting older. I mean, I'm seeing this with my parents. You need to still be doing the things you always did. And if you're just convincing people to do it for you, then you're not really getting. Well, sometimes it was crazy. Remember at Griffith Park one time and he said, he told someone he liked mulberries or something. And they showed up with this huge bowl of mulberries. And he's like, here, take these. And I go, I don't want them. They're for you. And he was like, what the hell am I going to do with all of these mulberries? (laughs) (laughs) Actually, that's another good one. There was one year for his birthday at Griffith where they got 
a bunch of Boy Scouts to sing happy birthday to him. And instead of a polite, like, oh, thank you. That's so sweet. John didn't really have that in him. He was always straight to the point. He would speak his mind. He goes, getting old as hell. (laughs) (laughs) Those poor nine-year-old boys. You guys spent a lot of time with him. You know, I never saw him sit in a chair. He always squatted. Do you, That's did, you ever, did you ever see him sit in a chair? I never saw him sit in a chair, ever. It was very rare. We would usually have to make him sit in a chair, and it was usually because we needed him to do something where he was sitting in a chair. Um, I know one of his favorite things to play with me was if he needed to be figuring my telescope mirror or something like that, he would make me sit back to back with him as a backrest. I had to serve as a backrest for dear old John so many times in my childhood. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, he was, he was such a character and he was so interesting and he had so much energy. I mean, I met him when he was 82 or 83. 83. I, think we, yeah. I think we met in the same year. And he was yeah, because I think it was 1998 because that would have yeah. 1990. Yeah, it must have been 1998 because that tracks with my age. It's much easier if you meet people when you're young to do the math. I highly recommend it. <laughs> the good thing but, about John was though, if if you got cranky with John or he got cranky with you, it it was like there was no residual anger or anything. No, you know, no, there was never he, bad blood. He, he still liked you he just as much something. later. Yeah. He didn't. He called me one time when I first met him. He had been calling every day, like if Bob couldn't take him to the observatory. And one day I'm like, leave me alone. I, I don't have any clean laundry. I have no clean dishes. I can't do this every night. And he's like, oh, okay, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> I mean, it was just like, yeah, okay, fine. Yeah, he definitely did have childlike wonder about him. And it's so funny too, because he was very much so a performer. Um, he had so many, I think most of us know plenty of the questions that he would ask um, when he was trying to get you to think about things. And he would ask them and then tell you the answers with the same childlike wonder every single time, every time. Um, he never got bored of asking those questions of people. He never got bored of showing people space. That excitement was always there. There was never a day where he was outside of normal John crankiness. There was never a day he where asked he you was... something a bunch of times. If you, every time he'd ask you, and then finally, when you would re- reply to him correctly, he would go, see, I knew you would get it. <laughs> Like you didn't just memorize it yet. Yeah, see, I knew you would get it. And you're like, yeah. 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 No, his, my favorite one was wire clouds flat on the bottom and fluffy on the top. And to be fair, I do use that one on a lot of people I know. Um, the reason for it, by the way, for those of you who did not get asked that specific John question, it's because you're getting a difference in air pressure and temperature on the bottom. That's going to be a hard line. And on the top, it's evaporating. So it gets puffy and all of that. So feel free to use that one. It was one of John's favorite questions. And then it rains. You must have noticed. Yes. Yes. The you must have noticed is. <laughs> Surely you, you can't get away with that one. And actually, I forgot that that's where that came from because I use that one a lot in my day to day speak. <laughs> I think he could get away with it better. You can get away with it a lot better as an old man than you can as a relatively like young woman. Especially with that little um, accent kind of thing. Yeah. You yes. His accent and his cadence was fascinating. I do still remember because he taught me the names of the planets in um, Mandarin and in Japanese. And I think also in Korean, although I can't remember the Korean now. Um, But I still occasionally will use Jupiter and Saturn, especially when I'm working at Griffith. And the other day, a guy speaking Mandarin got the planet wrong. He called it, and I can never get the intonation right. And apparently if you get it wrong, it sometimes means priest, but Jupiter is Pu Shin and Saturn is Mu Shin. And he kept saying Mu Shin. I was like, no, 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 Pu Shin. He was like, (laughs) oh, oh. So it's nice to have that ability to get through to people from some weird thing that I happened to pick up from John, you know, at this point, I guess, 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, He really was very aware of the world around him and very interested in finding ways to communicate with people and to connect with people, even if he was sometimes standoffish in some ways about it or kind of aggressive in some ways about it, he always brought it back to make you feel good about it at the end. Mm. I think that's important in the way that he did it because it is kind of nice to 
people don't typically get bullied into understanding science. And I think that to an extent that might be something that we need a little more of in our society. I suppose that might be an unpopular viewpoint, but um, the idea that, no, 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 you have to get to the root of the problem yourself by thinking through it. And he would force you to do that and not relent until you thought about it. Now you had to get the answer he already knew and whether or not that was always correct. I don't know, man, I still got some beef with his is the air the same temperature in shadows and in sun. I don't, I'm still salty about that one, but you, he would always make you get to the answer. And the only way to get away from that was literally to walk away from him and nobody would. So it was, it was an important way to get people to think about science and think about logic in a way that made them understand they were capable, even if you felt like an idiot during the process. Mm. And it was also kind of nice to let you be comfortable with the idea that you could be an idiot for a minute and still come out at the end with a with the correct answer that you personally thought through. Katie, so. that's a very profound statement, really. I can't tell you how many people come up to me and the first thing they, you know, where I'm showing them the sky and I'm trying to interpret things for them. And it's, you know, I know the tipping point. I, I see the tipping point happen. And when I hear them say, Scott, I want to ask you a stupid question. I know right then, okay, now they're exploring. Now they're, yeah. they're thinking for themselves, you know? Yes. And I don't know why they say it that way, but they do. And uh, it, that is a really uh, important part, you know? And, and that's something that people who do outreach, educational outreach and astronomy or whatever, okay, when they hear that question. Yeah, oh, we know. Tune in right then because this is, this is the heart of it right there. This is, this is why you're there to, um, to uh, help guide them a little bit through, through this process. So yeah, I, I, to be fair, I do often tell people that I have only ever received one stupid question. And that question was not even prefaced with this might be a stupid question. Hmm. I had a person point at the moon and ask me where the moon was. I was like, <laughs> I, I can't help. I can't help. There's nothing more I can do for you. I think that might've just been a misspeaking, but they left after that. And I was like, oh, I don't know, man. So I like to tell people that because I'm like, look, man, that is the only stupid question I've ever gotten. And I've got a lot of questions prefaced with this might be a stupid yeah. question. Well, John, as long as it's not, where's the moon while you're pointing at it? You know, John had a good one. There was a couple of times during his cosmology classes where people would be trying to make a relevant point and they were stretching so far. And one lady said something one day about his equations on the board that, you know, this is what my womb is doing or something. <laughs> and, <laughs> no, it was, this there. is what's happening in my womb. And this Hector's like, I'm going to heal her and everything. And then John just looks at her and goes, well, I only have to comment on things I know and I have no idea what you're talking about. So I have nothing to say. <laughs> and she just like, sat there, you know, and I'm like, okay, you know, and he would just say a lot of times, I have no idea what you're talking about. So I have, I, I can't help you, you know, because if they were just, you know, it was usually some conspiracy theory or some alien theory or something like that, you know, they come up with that. And he's just like, that's not my area. I have no idea. You know, and yeah. I don't have to comment on things I don't know. Yeah. So. No, I think I will I'm probably running out of time. I don't actually know how much time we all have, but I will leave you with uh, one good Dobson story about going out to eat. Whenever Dobson, and you probably can remember his order better than I can, but I know he would always ask for very specific things, including something green, in which one case they gave him frozen peas and he was happy. Um, they didn't even unfreeze them. He said, I'll just take them frozen. So he ate frozen peas. And then he would always ask for a glass of the most abundant element in the universe, oxidized. And I wasn't here for this one, but he loved to tell the story. It was his favorite story about going out to eat, where one time a waitress turned back to him and said, you want solids with that? It tickled him pink. He had the greatest time with that one. I don't know, that, was, that could have been 40, 50 years ago. It was his favorite <laughs> thing in the entire world. Yeah, it was a good like time. That story. Yeah. He also liked butter. Oh my God, butter. Just by the spoonful. And, and eating vitamin Just C powder by, by the spoonful. spoonful. Yes. He was, and carrying salt in his pocket for hikes. Um, yeah. 
I know some people do that fairly consistently, but man, he was adamant about the salt in his pocket. If he didn't have salt, he wouldn't go on a hike. So we have one last story about Death Valley. Is that the last okay, time good. we took John to Death Valley. And it was after he'd had his stroke and we were at Salt Creek and he had to go to the restroom. And we're sitting in the van and Katie looks in the rearview mirror and goes, what the hell is he doing? <laughs> and we see him standing by the bathroom going to this woman, right? So here's this old guy with the ponytail and he's just out here in the middle of nowhere and he's like motioning to this woman. And it turns out it was just, there's something no, wrong. No, 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 to come into the bathroom, no less. To come yeah, with him into the, bathroom, in the bathroom, into like one of those pit toilets. <laughs> like this, this old creep is over there, you know? And I guess it was broken or something, but we're yeah, just- The toilet seat was going, broken and he was and trying to went, tell her and she didn't- The woman went in with him. And yeah, she didn't like, speak English. And yeah, I have no idea why she would have chosen to go in there with him. But yes, the two of them went in and he was like, no, the toilet seat was broken. I had to tell her she didn't speak English. What was I supposed to do? It wasn't a language I understood. Just that little, come here. Yeah. <laughs> and the way he was doing it was just enough to, I said, I would have just been like, I would have turned my head like I didn't see. And I would have walked as fast as I could because, you know, there were like two cars in the parking lot. <laughs> Every serial killer movie would have been going through my head. I mean, to be fair, and one of the cars in the parking lot was a big windowless Econoline van. Yeah, ours. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Katie. I'm glad that you could make it. You know? Yeah. And I'm going to have to dip out and go to sleep to get up for my construction work. Just but... get some, some good um, photos for next year so that you have something that shows you really do have a telescope that you built. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll see if I can prove that or not. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. So Bye. um, John had a telescope that he used for the last several years. And when he was no longer using it, we were trying to figure out what to do with tumbleweed. So Peggy and I came up with this idea of her going around the, the country and taking on John's travels. And Peggy's going to tell us about that. This is Peggy Walker again from the Broken Arrow Sidewalk Astronomers. Yes, actually, we our, our city is Broken Arrow, and when it's on the map, it says BA. So when we call ourselves BA Sidewalk Astronomer with no S, it kind of has a double entendre, you know, to the name to it. So, but yeah, I came out um, in 2017 because uh, my little sister was passing away, but you and I were talking about going up to Casper. And we were going to exchange cat tumbleweed at that point because we decided to fix her up and make her accessible to clubs that wanted to have her because we didn't want her at, let's say, you know, like at um, Griffith and have somebody see it in the closet and not know what it was and pitch the telescope because it was pretty ratty. And I think most people would have thought, what is this? So, um, so I love these pictures of John because he actually, you know, this was his favorite uh, sidewalk scope. And I did do an article for those that are, uh, get the reflector magazine, for the September 2018, I actually did a, a, a short synopsis. And um, anyway, so um, the first, <laughs> my first comment here was when I, I get this telescope and I'm looking at this thing going, okay, the top part has paint on it. And then the bottom part is silver and it doesn't. And then the, the end piece, you know, where the, where the, um, the glass is sitting there, there's nothing. It's just still the conics thing. And I, I struggled because I, in my head, I could hear John saying it was perfectly fine. I didn't need to do anything to it. You know what I mean? So I'm sitting here in the garage going, no, 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 we got to fix this up. And, and, um, but it was, uh, it, the box was so tightly wrapped around it. I could not take the box off in order to paint the tube. So I kind of had to maneuver through putting plastic and stuff. And if you go to the unofficial tumbleweed, you can hear my whole drama and my daily videos of working with tumbleweed in the garage at, in a hundred degree temperature. But uh, when, when, we, when I try to get this out of the, the, the van, so you would get splinters because this wood was so delaminated and splitting. And in one section, there wasn't even like nails holding the panel pieces together anymore, okay? And so, uh, and I looked at the artwork and that was the one thing I knew I could do. I knew I could paint the inside of the tube because that's what I do when we make our scopes and stuff, but I wasn't sure how to fix this wood. And that was my first introduction to wood putting. And the one thing that really kind of was really the, the 
comforting thing was the, I, I sent you pictures, Donna, to the group, and I forget who the man was that actually painted the tumbleweed and the morning glory on the side of this. And because I really wanted to honor that person. And the thing was, is it see how bad it was? There was so much pitted wood in there. I had to really um, sand it down and I was losing some of the main artwork and it really was kind of scary. I didn't want to not have it in there, but um, the gentleman said, I am over, the guy said he actually had tears in his eyes because he said it looked brand new to him, like when he did the artwork. And so to me, that was like the best thing ever. But, you know, so here's the tops of the, the spots where you would have the, um, um, the uh, rocker box sit on top of that. But I mean, look at how, how damaged that was and how worn down it was. So I had to actually do some construction to it. And you can see where this, the mount actually was supposedly nailed in. You can see how many layers of that wood are missing and how deep that those uh, crevices were and, and needing nails and things like that. So um, it, it, was, it was really difficult. I mean, I had to sit here and wrap my brain around it and use wood putty, which I'd never used before. And then of course the bottom of the tube was very fanned out from moisture. And so I got some Elmer's like glue wall, really thick glue. And I just put tons and tons and tons of glue around it and put the paper clips around it. And now it's kind of got like a little bit of a, a, a lip to it or uh, things like that. So it, it does seem to hold up better. And so here I am showing you how I had to tape the body, tape the, the tube so I didn't get the paint on the other side. And so if you really, if you do get the scope in your club, you look down the sides, there really isn't paint all the way down because I couldn't get the tube all the way out. So, and I remember having a talk with Donna and she goes, whatever you do, we cannot have a white telescope. John hated white telescopes. So uh, anyway, so we decided on uh, cappuccino was the tube and then vanilla scone was the box. And then the flat midnight black or midnight stroll, whatever was on the inside. And, and so um, this was really a project that was really, you know, kind of like therapeutic for me because of the fact my sister had passed away and I'm in the garage. It was just so calming to do this, even though I didn't even know what the heck I was doing. And um, Ken Frank actually had the, the mirror uh, luminized and I put the gentleman's name on the bottom. And so Kenneth, actually did that and then gave it to Donna. So it kind of was a little bit of a group, you know, project here, but you can kind of see that I'm just in the, in the garage, just sanding my heart out. And here's kind of the, the final project, you know, and it, it really turned out very beautifully. And I, like I said, I was just enamored by it, but I had a lot of fun. I've given her a persona. So if you go to the, to the Facebook page, you know, I'm having conversations with, with her saying it's so hot in here and I had the plastic around the tube. I, I would have thought that, you know, it was like her being in a sauna. Why didn't she lose some weight? Why didn't the box just slide off her like weight at a, at a fat farm or something? And so I have such really random, silly um, things on the, on the um, unofficial tumbleweed Facebook. But as soon as we got her done, so we were looking at 2017, looking at total solar eclipse, right? We had an event at a, the, um, called the ancient forest here. And so we took her, and as you can see in the bottom left there, there's our whole lineup of, of daubs. And so Tumbleweed came there with us. And, you know, John's comment about, get the scopes to the kids, they'll know what to do. Well, look at these kids there in the center, boom, you know what to do. Mind you, does not have, and I does not have a spotter scope on it, but they already knew how to get down and line it up to the box. The guy on the right-hand side, and, comes up and we were talking about Dobsonians. And I said, this is John Dobson. So he's like, are you kidding me? Shut up. I said, no. And he said, I've just been reading about John Dobson all day. I want to buy a telescope. And I saw John Dobson and I come here and it's John. So John Dobson touched this telescope. Yes, he did. He took it in a wagon wherever he went. The guy just was ballistic. And so you can see he laid on the ground. He spent a lot of time with tumbleweed. And it was, it was really pretty moving that somebody actually knew John and that was in their, you know, mid twenties, early thirties, right? Uh, this is our usual, uh, usual suspects, you know, we've got her special spot in the truck and, and this particular night, uh, Rick went ahead, you can see him in the center there to take an image. Now, mind you, when people get this scope and they realize that the eyepieces are made from 
plumbing parts, cardboard, masking tape, and little lenses in there. And people are freaked out going, wait, 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 wait. So there's no, wait, no focuser thing? Or how do you adjust it? So you have to actually pull the eyepiece towards you or away from you, you know, in the original back in the day, old school type of thing. And so this was an image that Rick took. So it is the, the view from Tumbleweed is still very, very good. We have, um, we went um, to shoot to the astronomy club at Tulsa. And so um, it was kind of funny because there was a lot of people around here and this little girl, I, I put this picture in because usually people don't let you touch telescopes and we're different when we do sidewalk astronomy, which is why I really know that that's really organically what I'm about because we bring all those jobs and we'll show people things and, oh, it's out of the eyepiece. And we say, okay, now hug my scope, you know, look at the bullseye, put the thing back on the bullseye versus people not allowing them to touch anything. And so this girl in the top right corner, she just wanted to touch, touch us. You could touch her. Cause everybody kept saying, no, don't touch her. And I'm like, no, you can touch her. So here we are doing something contrary. And, um, what was funny is the guy from the TAS, uh, Air and Space Museum, you know, he took her and you can see in the top right corner, he showed her a movie about Hubble. <laughs> so if you go through the, the, uh, the Facebook page, you have to have humor because I made it humorous. Uh, we go to Okie Tex and uh, that was her first star party she went to. And so, you know, the eyepieces are there. People were just, were just blown away that how good this telescope worked with the eyepieces. And of course, if you go, to the Facebook page, you know, I'm showing her in the in the shower. But anyway, so I, I kind of I joke around quite a bit about her. But so she comes back from Mokey Tex and the St. Louis slash St. Louis Astronomical Society says, okay, we'll take her. And so um, I had Jim Small actually had seen she's the first picture, she's in Uranus, Missouri. Isn't that it was so hysterical? And then the Hubble Museum. So she's there at the Hubble Museum. And then she's there doing sidewalk at the at the St. Louis Arch, and so I had you know when the clubs get them that that her, my goal is to have them you know send me pictures so I could put them on the the official tumbleweed because people were like what happened to tumbleweed and I'm like no one's sending me pictures I don't know how to help you do this so and the guys sometimes are just too busy they just you know so here she is in Kansas so we actually on the way up to um, the um, Eclipse, we stopped by this Turnberg Mu Museum, which had a lot of um, dinosaurs in it. And then on the way home, we went to the Cosmodome, and that's where she's looking at that. And then she did eventually spend some time at the um, Astronomical Society of, of Kansas City. But what was heartbreaking a little bit was that I said, no, you cannot alter this telescope by any way, because we get, you know, pure like John used it. And somebody there put a uh, spotter scope on there and put holes in them like oh my god so anyway so when she got came back I had to patch her up and do some cosmetic surgery on her and stuff but um you know it, it it's amazing when people look at that and go John used this without an eyepiece I mean without a spotting scope yeah yeah he used the edge of the box and so it really makes people rethink how we kind of are spoiled as astronomers with all this beautiful equipment we can buy. So here we are at Casper. And of course she spends times with the guys at Explore Scientific. And then that was her first Alcon, she went to. And her first Mid-State Regional was also at Explore Scientific. So there she is with Scott's uh, room over there. And from there she went to, we were taking her up to um, the Casper. And so this lady was so nice to let Tumble, we play her daughter in Game of Checkers. But we stopped by uh, this um, place is in Colorado and it's a Buffalo motel and it's it's from the 1920s and this family went and bought it and have, you know upgraded it. But the woman was getting a lot of flack about her kids because they were pulled, they're, they're in this um, the sub area from the main area of, of Colorado. And she caught a lot of flack and somebody said to her, you're going to meet a lot of really wonderful, interesting people that are going to come to this motel and your kids are not going to be able to have that in school, in a, in a, you know, regular public school somewhere. And so when we brought out tumbleweed and explained the whole concept of sidewalk astronomy and John Dobson, the woman had tears in her eyes and she said, I can't wait to tell my family, look at these people. They touched a scope of a guy who was like almost 80 years old who started this whole thing and it was very moving, you know what I mean? That this family just said, wow, 
this is why we do this. And thank you for talk, you know, bringing out your scope. So it was just, it was just staggering how, how received she was. And here we are playing around. So she, we're at the um, uh, Casper at the uh, convention center. So the lady was sweet and that gives uh, Tumbleweed her own uh, door, you know, key. And then I, I got a shirt from Fred Espinac because you buy any stuff from Fred, he gives you a t-shirt. And so I joke on the on the on her Facebook page. I went, "Tumbleweed, excuse me, you borrowed my shirt." Didn't even ask, you know. And this couple to the right actually came in from the UK to do observing, but they did know about John Dobson. So you just never know, you know what I mean? When you're when you were. Um, and the funny thing is, if you can see, she's wearing eclipse glasses on. You, I don't know if you can see that or not. She's got eclipse glasses. I mean, she was watching the eclipse very safely. Then we went through the um, the vendors and uh, go to the Facebook page because there were some very, very moving uh, videos that I caught. And people were like, well, one guy was like in tears because he missed John so much. And this particular gentleman, I'm sure you guys know who he is. I forgot his name. Christopher. Huh? Christopher Go. Christopher Go. He goes and the images... Um, he's like a Fred Espinac and they were just blown away being able to meet this telescope in the center there we have uh, Mike Simmons from Astronomers Without Borders and there's there was tons more images but they're on the, the Facebook page the guys on the right were from Italy they came in all the way from Italy for this uh, totality and they walk in and go oh it'll be it'll be beautiful I mean they were the whole Italian accent and they were blown away and you can see them squatting like I can't believe this is Dobson's. And they spent so much time with that scope. They knew who John was, knew who the scope was. And it just blew them away that out of Yair Casper, who knew that Tumbleweed would be there. The um, Omaha Society uh, got her and they had her for two years with not, you know, having any conferences to kind of exchange and bring her back into to Broken Arrow. So some of these photos are from last uh Nebraska Star Party, and that's their their dome area there, their classroom. And then we brought her back this year. So the top left and the top right are from. We just got her back in August from from uh, Omaha. They they did a great job um, promoting her, and they 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 really enjoyed having her. So it was it was really nice that they took good care of her. They really did. And then here is at the Winter Star Party down in Florida, and so this one was really particularly moving as well because that particular year they actually spread the ashes of Tippy Doria there at the the middle of section and, and to the right is called the land of the dogs and so that morning I think Scott and and a few people went over there and and did that and so then we got you know we put her over there and people said yeah bring her in and we'll take pictures with her so it really was kind of moving because it was just it's not even just John it's these other notable people like Tippy you know what I mean and um converging you know what I mean it was just a very very powerful uh time at least and it's it's interesting to take the scope around and hear stories from people and so this is the official uh unofficial tumbleweed uh Facebook page and like I said I post the most outrageously crazy things I'm we were at Nebraska and I we were playing Uno I was playing Uno with her you know and and people are just laughing and right now it's really kind of if you can't have fun with John Dobson's scope tumbleweed, then you're doing it wrong. And she's right here. She wants to say hi. I can't see because she get. Okay, I'll when I get done, we'll have her say hi to you because she's right here. Um, but if you want, if your club wants to have tumbleweed uh, in your club, we will figure out a way to get you there, get hers there to you. So you can contact me at the big, uh, Broken Arrow Side Rock Astronomer. Uh, we have a phone number, a Google number. You can email me, and we'll try to connect you up, and you will get a. A board with um, all the pictures, you know, before and after, and you'll get the actual eyepieces with her. So um, let me know if you're interested in, in doing that. So when we started doing ATM, the main thing that we are known for is our our uh, F8 eight inch, uh, which we now call Moon Killer, because the the views were better than our 12 inches almost. Okay, that could even be a thing. We have Coulter Optics in this one. And this was our very first build we've ever done. And the paint job on there was brand new, but if you were to look at the, I'll show you here, it's kind of, you know, peeling and it, it looks like a regular sidewalk astronomer one that, that Donna had at her store, because it's been through a lot. 
Um, I remember getting this set of print this from uh, when we went out to California and met up with the um, actually Rick was on a, a business trip and met Bob Albazarian at the park. And that's how we got connected with Donna and the sidewalk astronomers. And so when I was born and raised in North Hollywood, I drove by her shop to go to the high school. Bob Albazarian lived a couple of blocks from the high school where I went. So it was very, very interesting, you know, all my stomping grounds. But we got this set of plans right here. And when I get done, I'll show you that the sidewalk astronomers were so uh, benevolent because they gave us parts to make this uh, sun scope. And we use this all the time. And you can see here, the top part is yellow. That's the part they gave us. They gave us the two-way mirror, which is the big slanted part. We had to get the um, welder's glass for that. But Bob gave me the, a mirror that he ground. It's not illuminized. It's just you know, this little four inch glass. And on the side of it, it said 1968. And I'm like, dude, I was like eight years old when you did this, you know? And he said, I wanna give this to you. No, 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 I can't take that from you. No, 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 you must have this. No, no, no. So we went back and forth and Donna goes, just get over it, take it. <laughs> You're not gonna win, okay? So I'm like, okay. We got grit, we got all kinds of things. So then we came home and we actually did some grinding uh, at his house. So. Um, and this is going into something kind of exciting where in 2017, I uh, was asked to fill in for a slot for youth that was vacant for about 10 years. And at the conference up in, in uh, Casper, I made a comment. I said, well, why are you not doing something for families and youth where the whole family could be together? So while the adults are in one place, why can't kids be doing something astronomy or STEM? And so if you look at the scope, you can tell you know, do you guys know, know what manufacturer that is? Do you know who made this? Looking at the altitude. the altitude bearing. Any guesses? That would be Rob Teeter. Rob Teeter was elated when I said, I want to bring telescope making into uh, AL's conferences or national conferences. So he got with me and um, he put the, we put this, this is called the Tiny Teeter Telescope. <laughs> so, um, but you'll notice he did some beautiful dovetails. These are made out of um, the ba uh, Baltic pine or Baltic, Russian Baltic birch or whatever it is. And all the pieces are gonna be laid out. He's going, he will uh, ship those to me at the um, hotel. So if you are an ATM person and you would like to get families and adults to uh, make scopes, we're gonna be at New Mexico, uh, Albuquerque in 2022. And our goal is to get ATM up and running again back, you know, and I thought, wow, if AEL goes and has these conferences all over the United States. So could you imagine if all of the sidewalk astronomers and the ATMers in that area rallied together and we just would leave these telescopes in that region of the United States? I think that would be a really profound um, thing. So here again, you can get a hold of me there. Uh, I made John a blanket, and I and on the back of that, I thanked him for uh, bringing astronomy. I mean, I didn't. We talked to him off and on, but we didn't have as much fun and maybe as Donna and Katie had. And um, but we were on the street there with um, him and Jane Houston. And that particular night, because uh, up in that part of California on Colorado Street and pa Pasadena, kind of in Glendora and. Uh, there's a lot of Asian families that live there. It's just a pocket where they live. And there was a lot of um, kids that were Asian walking by. And John was speaking Mandarin to somebody. And this, this guy leans in and he, he stopped. He goes, it's some old dude speaking some gibberish to somebody. I mean, we don't need to stop. And I went, excuse me. And I said, I, I kind of pushed him toward, I said, this man is like, you know, 95. And he's speaking Mandarin because he was born in Beijing. And he is one of the top uh, astronomers as far as teaching people how to make scopes for themselves and getting it into the hands of the population. He went, are you serious? Yeah. So he winds up talking to John. I see him walk away and he's like, well, that was really intense. So, you know, just looking at John, you know, he's this rambling old guy, but not realizing what kind of an impact he had. So we're not this way. And so I'm just gonna show you real quick the, um, we have the, if you don't, if you've never seen the, um, here's Tumbleweed. She's got her own, she always gets her name tags when she goes to star parties. So she's ready to go. If you want to get a hold of me, we'll go ahead and do that. Of course, we've got 
our um, BA sidewalk astronomer, I painted our logo on it. But once we were looking, so we have better views in this than our 12 inch, right? So on the back side of it, we now call it Moon Killer. So it has a whole nother name to it. And then we also have this sun scope, which is all of the parts that you guys blessed us with. You gave us the mirror, you gave us the upper part, and we finished it off uh, this weekend. We're celebrating astronaut Stuart Rosa, who was born in Claremore. Will be, the sun scope will be at the Claremore High School, and we're going to be doing solar observing. So we basically, this will be like our third or fourth scope we have actually made. So I think it's something that is very, very great for families to do. But you learn about optics and things when you do that. And I do have two glasses from, that uh, Donna gave me when John moved from uh, San Francisco down to Hollywood. Now you want these two glasses? So they're to, to be ground. And I keep getting asked, did you grind those yet? No, I did not. You know, so part of me is like, I don't want to because they were John's, you know, but they're not doing any good. Peggy, Andy, Peggy, Andy's looking for some glass. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're four inch. Oh, Are they four inch? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but anyways, but yeah, you know what I'm talking about. It's just, it's just a thing. You know what I mean? Because you guys really gave us a lot of stuff and it really was very meaningful. And that's why we like to, we like the aspect of Cyrock astronomy because it is about people. And one other quick testimony was going back to John's quote, you know, give the scopes to the kids, they'll know what to do. We have a little, we had a little four inch Orion. It was given the tube, didn't have a base. We built the base. I painted it with constellations. We get a girl that shows up with her neighbors. She loves astronomy. She's asking for a telescope. The parents buy her a plastic periscope. And I just wanted to go slap her parents. Her parents were there, but in my heart, I wanted to slap her parents. Christmas, birthday, Christmas, birthday, nothing, nothing, nothing. And so I just turned to Rick and I said, what do we have in our reserve that we can give this girl? And so this girl is starting to have a meltdown. The neighbor's like, oh my God, you can't give away. I mean, you don't even know her. You don't know her. So I run home, I get her four inch. Her name was Connie because I had the constellations on it. And so I get out of the, the truck and we hand her the, the, you know, the thing with the eyepieces and the spotter scope. We pull it out. And the first thing she says is she knows the constellations. She said she's going to take it and put it in her tree house. She has an observatory now. So she knew exactly what to do with the scope. So, you know, John had statements and you kind of thought, oh, he's just, you know, blowing smoke. No, that's a truthful statement right there. She knew exactly it needed to go up into her tree house. So, I'm just saying, so I'm really thankful. I mean, to be involved with this organization, it means a lot to us. And uh, the club in our area is 200 people. Uh, when they get any, go ahead, come to our school, go to the library, go to, uh, you know, whatever. They don't even do the outreach like that. So they call us. So we go and, you know, have telescopes, we'll travel. So basically our life is basically a sidewalk astronomer. And we're just, we're really glad to be involved with this organization. It means a lot. So that means that we made a really good investment. You did. <laughs> you did. Yes. So yes, I would um, I would like now to um, kind of do a little update on the, the schedule, because I know we put Katie and we moved some people around. So next, we're going to have Maria and then Dean and then Jim. OK, so if you guys have an idea when you're going. But thank you, Peggy and Rick, because Peggy did so much work with Tumbleweed and I mean, otherwise it would have just been sitting. The other option yeah. is somebody wanted to go to Griffith Park and Tony's like, well, you can store yeah. it here. Well, yeah, we, right. don't need, we don't need to store it there. We all have our own scopes. It's not like we're gonna drive up there and use it, you know? Right. And right. it just seemed like it, I couldn't think of another way to get it out in the public. And I, I think that what you've done is, is amazing. Well, but you came, you came up with the idea of move her into the clubs where John was. Yeah, well, it does I mean? And you know. they, well, I heard too that they were the, when they were talking about this, they actually start talking about when John was in the club. So yes, that's exactly, yes. you thought and, and, exactly. And, well, you know what, what I would, what really hoped was that it would, you know, John energized clubs to do sidewalk and to do right. public outreach. And I thought maybe having Tumbleweed there could kind of maybe re-energize some of those clubs. So I, hope, so, I hope we get some more, I get some more takers, you know, she's, I just go, I hope so too. she's ready to travel. I'm just saying. <laughs> So, so next we have Maria Berbeo, who um, John had a science fiction book that was called The Moon is New, and she helped him with that and published it. She's also, if he has, I, I would say she's his biographer. And um, I know that um, John was very, very fond of Maria. And we were going to, we had some kids from Ukraine. Dennis should be on later. He's not on yet. And 
we were gonna go up to San Francisco when we went to um, Yosemite for his last trip to Half Dome. And when I told him Maria was going, he was just like, okay, good. <laughs> so Maria, it's a, your turn. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I think uh, the reason he liked me so much is because I <laughs> like to hear him talk. <laughs> <laughs> So oh, I, I would just have endless questions for him. And he was, he was, he always wanted an audience. Um, and he always wanted to, to feel like somebody was interested in cosmology. Um, Learning. I and, think, you know, we, we sometimes were, were more practical about things, you know, like, okay, we'll talk later. We got to do this or whatever. And, yeah. and we really weren't that interested, Katie and I, and you, you definitely really were. And I think, well, he ahead, liked that, that you were interested. Yeah, well, so the thing is, is that what I wanted to say was that when people did ask him questions, it was usually about astronomy. That's how everybody knows him is, as an astronomer. But he saw himself as a, a cosmologist. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I wanted to talk about uh, that. And I want to also play some uh, video files if it's okay. There's there's no issue with videos being played. It's a JD, I call him JD, talking. Um, so I met JD in about 1993. And um, the way that I met him was actually at the Vedanta Temple in Hollywood. And I was interested in Vedanta and uh, someone introduced me to the Vedanta Temple and he was giving his cosmology classes there. And um, so I met him at the cosmology class. Um, he taught cosmology because he wanted people to understand the nature of the universe and of reality. And um, he felt that telescopes was a way to get people interested in the universe and reality. Uh, he saw so much behind the universe and reality uh, that, you know, we just don't think about, we don't consider uh, reality and, um, and uh, why we're here, what's our purpose, you know, those kind of things. And people don't like to hear about those kind of things. Uh, he would say that people don't like to hear about those kind of things because that starts to get into the religious realm. So um, people just kind of frown and shake their heads. Oh, yeah. OK, here he goes with his religion. He's crazy old monk. He's, you know, mysticism. Oh, you know. Um, and he would say the reason people do that is because of uh, the, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? The um, the Spanish Inquisition, the you know everything against science. Really, when when the Catholic Church was you know in, basically in control of the modern world, and scientists like Galileo were being you know persecuted. So he says it makes sense why you know the astronomers and the scientists you know they really don't want to hear about uh, reality and, uh, the universe in that regard, unless you're talking about the big bang or black holes or something that, you know, is acceptable in scientific, uh, communities. So, um, so I wanted to say that, um, <laughs> that's really what JD was interested in by the time I met him. Uh, he had, you know, done all the astronomy stuff. He had, uh, you know, started teaching the cosmology. And when I met him, he said, this is where I really wanna focus. I really wanna focus on cosmology. Everybody still wants me for astronomy, but I really wanna focus on cosmology. And I was very taken with uh, Vedanta and I was very taken with cosmology. And <laughs> I, I love the way that he was able to explain quantum physics to a 21 year old who knew nothing about science and make it so exciting. And so I thought, what can I do about this? You know, what, what can I do? And he handed me this cardboard box full of loose pages that were um, his original manuscript for The Moon is New, which is the book that I helped him publish. So 
This is The Moon is New. And um, as you can see, it has a photo on the front, which one of his friends helped him make that has no foreground stars uh, in front of the galaxy in deep space. And um, if you wanna know why it has no foreground stars, you have to read the book. Um, so um, he said, uh, it took us many years to write The Moon is New because um, he, <laughs> he was not familiar with things like computers. He refused to carry a cell phone. When I gave him the cell phone, he just uh, put it aside, you know, so I could help him edit is why I gave him the cell phone. When he was trying to use the computer, uh, he would say, what do I poke? You know, and I'd say, well, poke the button that has the letter L, you know. <laughs> so it, it was a, <laughs> it was definitely an interesting experience trying to work with JD um, using a laptop. But so it took us a long time to finally, you know, edit down and edit down the, the book. But by the time he was done, he said, this is pretty much the closest I'm ever going to come to having an autobiography, because a lot of people always asked him for an autobiography. He was already in his 80s. He was, um, you know, getting up there. And so everybody wanted an autobiography. They wanted to know, you know, all about the sidewalk astronomers, the history and all of that. And so this book is the closest that he has to an autobiography. Um, when we were trying to publish the book, he um, we, we went to Rick Feynman at Rick Feinberg, sorry, at uh, Sky and Telescope. And he said, I'll make a deal with you. If you give me the rights to an autobiography, I'll publish your Moon is New, your, your sci-fi book. Um, and JD was like, uh-uh, not going to happen. I'm not going to have anybody write my biography who would change it, you know, and... Uh, put things in there, take things out. So this is the closest to autobiography. I videoed him for many, many hours um, talking about his life uh, because, because, it, because just in case I said, let's just, you know, in case we can get somebody else to do an autobiography for you, to publish an autobiography for you and they don't edit it unless you, you know, give them permission. Uh, so he, he enjoyed talking anyway, you know, but um, so I've got lots and lots of hours of him talking about his personal life and, uh, and astronomy and everything. And maybe someday I will <laughs> write his biography. Uh, it's still in the works. Um, but uh, so what I wanted to do, let's see. Oh, yes. So um, I wanted to play some files of him reading the book and also a couple of files of me interviewing him. Let's see. Um, video settings, share screen. Hello. Uh, does anybody know how to share the screen? <laughs> Yes. Uh, needs a little help. Yeah. Yeah. Let me let me help you out there. Um, okay, thank you. Um, at the bottom of your Zoom um, app is a green button. It says share screen. Okay. Oh, hello. Okay. See that? So before yes. you share, okay, you start uh -huh. actually actively sharing. If there's mm -hmm. sound, there's a checkbox on the left, and you'll see it says share system sound or something like that. Okay. Okay. Your sound. Um, you click that on, uh, okay. and then you pick not your desktop. Okay. You'll see mm -hmm. there's different pictures up there. You pick the app that you want to share. Okay. So mm. point you pick the PowerPoint app. Okay. Now something I'll caution you on is if uh, you have a program with video, you, you mentioned it had some video, if it's mm -hmm. something like Johnny Carson, cause he was on Johnny Carson. Nope. No, Johnny Carson. Yeah, you can't, you know. No, it's just me interviewing him, and uh, that's it. The video is just me interviewing him, and then I have an audio of him reading the book. 
Yeah, beautiful. That's great. Okay. Let's see if I can do this. I apologize. I should have tried first, but I had to cram it in. I, I work in the evening. Let's yeah. Right. We'll teach you how. Okay. Uh, let's see. JD. Aha. Okay. So here is me interviewing JD and asking him uh, how he. Started in Vedanta. Okay. Can you see it? I can see the uh, it's kind of freeze framed, but yeah. Okay. The video, yeah. There's me. <laughs> All right, here we go. I told you what happened to me when I first heard the man talk. I, I was an atheist, but it was sudden that I gave it up. All I had to do is to hear the man talk, and I, would, I gave it up, being an atheist, you see. So that was in February 1937, and uh, by 1940, I was seriously interested in doing something about it. So then I went and talked to him, and he sent me back to the university. And after I graduated from the university, uh, I had to do war work because I'm not a girl, <laughs> okay? I never was a girl. <laughs> Referring to reincarnation. Uh, wait, that I, that I recall. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, uh, so then after about a little over a year of doing that, I got attached to my job, the Manhattan job. The Manhattan Project. World War II. I got attached to it, and I thought, damn it all, I gotta get out of here. I'm getting attached to this thing. And so I asked Swami again if I can join the monastery. And this time he said yes. And so then through a double interview with the FBI, I got into the monastery. That was in 44. I came in 37, went to talk to him in 40, joined, graduated from the university in 43, and joined the monastery in 44. Now, I was in the monastery for a while, but you remember, he, Swami sent me back to the university for the first one. No, I was in the anyway, monastery for a while. So, uh, I was in the monastery for a while Swami before Michael Fell came down from Canada. Well, I was in the monastery for a while. Uh, I was in the monastery for a while. What happened? Before Michael Fell. Let me see if I can fix this. Hold on. Yeah. Before he came on, he has two computers going. Oh. I'm so sorry about that. Let's no, see. no. I, I think someone else was listening to it on. Oh. Uh, Facebook, I see. Our Facebook. Yeah, if you're on, if you're watching on anything, you have to have your audio off. Yeah, all of you that are not speaking right now, please mute, okay? Please mute. Ken Frank. <laughs> Ken Frank. <laughs> hi. Mute yourself. Hi, hi, hi. Ken, I don't know you if you can see yourself? me or not. It's pretty I dark. I can see you. Here. You're in the dark. Can you mute yourself? I'm trying to play oh. a video. Him until he can speak. Okay, that's good. All right. Thank you. Okay, let's see now. Let's go back. Here we go. Okay. I think I didn't click optimize for video clip. There we go. Okay, let's try that. All righty. So, uh, so that was JD talking about getting into Vedanta, and then um, he and giving up being an atheist, which he, he started out as an atheist. Um, now here's him describing his cosmology theory. It's, it's very, very shortened, so, you know. Sure. I look very bored there, but it's because I'm concentrating. Anyway, um, uh, Schrodinger, in that little book, What is Life? He makes that very clear. 
that a living that a living organism has to direct a stream of negative entropy upon itself. Now, in order to be alive, you have to be able to direct a stream of negative entropy upon yourself. In order to have a species survive, you have to be able to pass on the genetic code. Okay, these are two different problems. To be alive is one thing. To pass on the genetic code is a different thing altogether. Anyway, so th both of these things are involved in the origin of life. Now, the interesting thing about the universe being alive is that after the stuff recycles, it's all wound up. It's direct a stream of negative entropy upon yeah, itself. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. Not only that, but it does the it does the replication too. You see. Whatever it was, by the time it gets to the border, it comes back as hydrogen. <laughs> okay? So, the whole universe does both replication and directing a stream of negative entropy by itself. I think it's too funny, you see, and it's also true, as I see it, that if the universe didn't do both of these things, we wouldn't either. If the universe wasn't directing negative entropy by itself, the universe wouldn't be all wound up like this, and we wouldn't be here talking, mm. okay? To me, that's terribly interesting that if the universe weren't alive, we wouldn't be. I had never thought about this until recently, about the last year and a half or so. Okay, and here's the second piece of that. I can't hear anything. Now, Maria, you may have to. Who can't hear anything? Me and Zound, you can't either. You can't hear it? No. No, no. You need to stop sharing. I think you're still on the last video. Uh oh. Really? Yeah. Oh dear. Hold on a second. So you haven't been hearing anything this whole time? No, no, no just the last part, just the last clip, the second part. Oh boy. Hold on a second. You've had three clips. The, the third clip we didn't see or hear. I'm so sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, let's see. Yes, yes, yes. Hmm. I don't know how to get it to stop. Here. Can you hear it now? No. Yes. Oh, I can. Oh, I can hear you, but not the clip. Not the clip. There we go. Oh, dear. And share the sound of that third clip. Share the sound of the third clip. Hmm. You so you could see you could see something, but you couldn't hear something. Yes. You saw the end of the last video you showed. Oh, let's see. Okay. So I need to share screen again. Mm -hmm. Share sound, and then see if I can play it again. I had never thought about this until recently, about the last year and a half or so. Yes. Swami Ashokananda somewhere said that. It's alive. The whole universe is alive. And I might have heard him say that even with his own mouth. 
but it wouldn't cross my mind in those days what it means. Now, you see, I can see, oh, that's what it means. It directs the stream of negative entropy upon itself and is sentient, okay, and, and the replication does all, it does all the replication. <coughs> see, the two things that living organisms do, they stay alive and they pass on the genetic programming. That's called replication. Got to re repeat those chemicals, got to duplicate those chemicals. That's done by the DNA. Now, the universe does it by the... <laughs> By the recycling, you see. Anyway, they say the three things that you have to have to be alive have to direct a stream of negative entropy. Oh, first you have to have a a, 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 a boundary between inside and outside, mm. between me and not me, okay? That's a membrane. For a living organism, it's a membrane. For a cell, you got a membrane, okay? So the difference between in and out, okay? So the universe does that too. There's a membrane out there, <laughs> the border, okay? And there's a difference between in and out, okay? Anyway, so that's there. And the replication and directing a stream of negative entropy is there. And uh, replication is also there because by the time the stuff is recycled in, it's all hydrogen again, or maybe hydrogen and helium. Anyway, I think that's too interesting. Way too interesting. That if the universe didn't do this, we wouldn't either. And you see, that's my objection to the Big Bang. The Big Bang doesn't have any recycling mechanism in there at all. It's just a wound up watch and it's been running down for 15 billion years and they think it's still going. <laughs> no way, <laughs> no way. Not only that, but all the negative entropy was in that little tiny thing this smaller than an atom. And it was already scrambled to hell because it's too hot. <laughs> because it was too hot. Because it's too hot. It's scrambled to hell because it's too hot. If, if, they, if it's hot, they're going everywhere. Alrighty, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Do we have time for uh, him to read the beginning of his book? Or do we need to move on? Donna? Sorry, I was muted. Yes, I think we do. <laughs> we do? Yeah. yeah, it's just a few minutes, right? Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Let's see. Yes, I only have four more. We'll have Dean, Jim, Bill, and Dennis. So I think, and we'll have to have a break in here, I'm sure. So ah, we're good. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, we're, still, we're still looking at the last part of your last video. So you haven't heard anything yet? Not yet. Wow, yeah, it does it every time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, share. You have to I'm share. no good at this, apparently. Let's see, uh, share okay. screen. Share screen. You have to unshare first. You are already sharing. Stop share. There you go. Okay. And then share screen, share sound. I wish I could share the video. It's such a shame. Um, you can't. Yes. Here. Oh. Yeah, I just can't figure it out. I got to learn how to do it. <laughs> so when you click on share, you're going to see a bunch of different options there. Okay. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. should have a video up there as an individual square. Okay. Yeah, you I clicked on that. Click on that and then you hit the, then you commit to sharing. I did, but it, it didn't do it. Let's see. So this is like about a five minute clip. Yeah, five or six. You know, we can skip it because I'm 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 having technical challenges. Um, we can skip it. Uh, Talk through it. There are a few things I wanted to say about JD though. Oh, okay, yeah, do that. Yes. <laughs> can I do that? Yes. Can you see me? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So um, so I do have uh, before. 
uh, JD aluminized his mirrors, he silvered them. So I have a silvered surfaced mirror uh, that I want to donate somewhere. And I don't know if I should donate it to the Smithsonian or who. <laughs> if anybody knows where I should donate it, let me know. And uh, somebody said JD didn't want a penny for his uh, telescope design. Um, as long as I knew JD, all he had was his social security. He would actually sleep on the grass in a park if he didn't have someone to sleep with as he traveled around giving his lectures. And uh, one, one time I went to an astronomy convention with him when the book first was published, The Moon is New was first published. And people would come by and say, oh, he must be so rich. Oh, you're making so much money off of your telescopes and your books. You know, just get out of here or whatever, you know, type of thing. And, and he wasn't making a cent on any of it. Um, and I'm still selling the, the Moon is New on uh, Amazon. And I'm, I'm uh, charging like five bucks. Um, and uh, let's see what else that I want to say. Oh, yes, about how active he was at 90. <laughs> After he had his stroke when he was in his early 90s, um, he, <laughs> we took him to the emergency room and he, um, <laughs> he, he, sh he wanted to show the doctor how he was still able to run. So this is like right after his stroke, he's still kind of a little dizzy. He goes out in the emergency room parking lot and runs up and down the parking lot a few times. And when the emergency room doctors uh, took his vital signs, they said he, and, and his labs and everything, all of, all of his levels and stuff, they said he had the body of someone in their twenties, um, the health of someone in their twenties. Um, <laughs> Also about that, he talks about one time he was he was out doing sidewalk astronomy. He was in his 50s and he said some guys came up to him and and uh, and they were huffing and puffing after hiking around and stuff. And they were in their 30s and uh, he had his shirt off doing, you know, sidewalk astronomy, whatever he, he, he was doing in one of the national parks. And um, he kind of chuckled at them and they said, oh, yeah. Wait till you get to be in your 30s. <laughs> he was actually in his 50s. Um, they couldn't tell. Um, he also told me that in his 80s, he would run up and down Griffith, uh, Griffith Park. And he was very embarrassed that in his 90s, he could only walk and hike, you know, for hours in, in Griffith Park. Because um, he was so out of shape. Um, anything else? I, I think that's it. <laughs> Okay. I think that's all I have. He's, you know, just before he had his stroke, he would walk from the Vedanta Society up to the observatory. And uh, the Vedanta Society is near Coinga and Franklin in Hollywood. So he would walk probably, I don't know, it's probably three miles with mo one mile of it at least uphill really a lot. So, yes, it was definitely. There's something to be said about keeping moving as you're uh you age, you know, and um, uh, he, there's a quote about uh, from him about um, staying active, and uh, um, I'll try to find it uh, so that I can read it <laughs> on, on this program. But uh, uh, I found many of his quotes very inspiring, you know, and uh, so. Well, I can't remember exactly right now, but I know he was going to the observatory once and it had been raining and the water was running down and maybe Bill or Maria know, but mm -hmm. that inspired one of his papers, you know, and I thought that's just kind of like the perfect example of somebody here that was in their, their late 80s, early 90s, taking this, you know, four mile walk or whatever. And when they're pondering this water trying to make its way to the ocean, I think it was about resistance or something that the whole universe is built on resistance. And um, it, it's just, most of us would never think about any of this. We wouldn't be walking up there in the first place at that age and we wouldn't be pondering the universe. And frustration the was his word. Frustration, yeah. yes. Frustration, okay. Okay, so next I wanna to go to Dean Kettleson. Um, Dean's still here, right? Uh, yeah, I'm still yeah. here. Okay, good. You've been waiting a long time. 
Well, I don't have anything to share. No pictures, no videos. That's okay. Nothing up my sleeves. <laughs> Memories are uh, Donna, I've got to uh, admit, as many times as we've talked uh, and corresponded, I don't think we've ever met, have we? No, no. No, yeah. somebody else always handled the handoff of the Russian kids. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was never me. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, a different story for a different time. <laughs> uh, my name is Dean Kettleson. I uh, uh, first crossed paths with John. I didn't meet him at the time, but uh, the year was 1980. Uh, I was a newly uh, uh, declared uh, undergraduate major in astronomy. I'd just gotten a job at the National Observatory in uh, Cape Peak. And uh, after 10 months on the mountaintop, uh, observing with the four meter telescope and uh, teaching astronomers. I was working working with astronomers as a technician, uh, but I, I didn't get to observe with the four meter up in the prime focus cage, uh, having fun stuff like that. Anyway, I made my first trip to the Grand Canyon and it happened to coincide when the San Francisco sidewalk astronomers were there. And uh, there's this little man who gave a, a twilight talk uh, that I distinctly remember because uh, I saw it again about 10 years later uh, at the Grand Canyon. Well, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Anyway, uh, I think I'd heard about John. I was a religious subscriber to Sky and Telescope, but uh, I don't recall placing him as that person. Uh, but I remembered that I wanted to visually look through the 24 inch at M13, which of course had a seemingly 50 foot tall stepladder to get to the uh, looking at the zenith where uh, M13 was. And of course, when you're that high, you're halfway to the stars already. So they seem that much, much clearer. Uh, but I was amazed at the view. Of course, the four meter telescope uh, is not optimized for visual observing. Even at the prime focus cage with the plate holder out, you have uh, an image of the sky, but it's not like looking through an eyepiece. And I was truly amazed with that uh, view of M13. So anyway, fast forward uh, 10 years. Uh, I'd sort of forgotten about John and the sun. Uh, well, I he, he lit a spark, certainly, because I was more involved with, with outreach in Tucson. Uh, I set up star parties. Uh, I set up a telescope at the football stadium at the U of A. I called it a star party for 55,000 and people as they file into the game, the games in Tucson are usually in the evening. And I'd have, when, the, when there was a crescent moon out or Saturn, I'd set up a telescope and they could see it on the way in. And people were really impressed uh, if they were sober enough to look through the eyepiece. Uh, anyway, uh, 10 years later, uh, 1990, I talked my girlfriend into marrying me and we got hitched in Vegas and uh, honeymooned at the canyon on the, on the way on a, for a cross country road trip. And we stopped at the Grand Canyon and I set up, I have some big battleship binoculars, 20 by 20 by 120 battleship binoculars on a Dobsonian mount. Uh, and uh, I set them at the rim. I had just gotten them from a friend of mine who just acquired them, uh, World War II vintage. So they were at the time, they were 50 years old and uh, set them, you can see people walking out the, at the bottom of the canyon. You can see what color shirts they're wearing, uh, read the names off the river rafts. It was really amazing. And we turned around, there were you know 20 people in line wanting to look through them. And we said, you know, we should invite a few friends up for our anniversary next year and uh, have a star party and uh, have a public star party with a few of our friends from the Tucson club. Anyway, I asked the Rangers, uh, whatever happened to the uh, sidewalk astronomers and the fellows who used to set up there, and they didn't really know, but they hadn't seen them in years. Uh, and so I asked if we could start a start party, and uh, they said, yeah, we can do that. Let's, let's we'll plan it for our anniversary, which is the following May of 1991. And... Uh, the ranger that was assigned to us, he looked into it and he, and, and, and I got his side of it. Uh, John had offended uh, the tourists at Kitt Peak. I know uh, Barry was asking earlier about 
he wasn't sure quite what happened. Well, I have the story both from the Rangers and from John. Uh, and his slideshow, uh, one of the slides, if any of you have seen it, uh, it's, a, it's a slide of uh, Walden Pond. And at one point during his talk, he says, we are all evolved from pond scum. Very clearly saying, <laughs> saying that with great conviction. And <laughs> evidently, uh, some uh, religious zealot said, people don't need to be hearing this and complained to the park superintendent about it. Uh, and he was invited not to return. Now, I believe they made another visit or two after 1980 when I first saw him. I don't, if it, someone from San Francisco group might know how late they were there, but uh, certainly by uh, the late 80s into 1990, when I asked, uh, that it had been quite a few years since uh, the group had been there. So anyhow, we did it, and uh, we were told quite specifically, don't challenge anyone's potential religious beliefs about what we're saying and stuff. So we were actually indoctrinated uh, not to do this about, about you know, pond scum, especially. And uh, so we were quite careful. And in fact, I, I sort of wanted to bias the results. Uh, you know, when we, we started a little twilight talk of our own and I, you know, we usually we'd get a hundred people easily, sometimes sometimes two hundred people, and I, I'd say, you know, these guys are bringing their telescopes. They're taking their vacation to share the sky with you. So, you know, thank them. If when you're sending the postcard to Aunt Martha, send one to the park superintendent. Say that you that you love this program. So I was sort of like biasing, you know, uh, biasing the 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 park in our favor and. Uh, and it went, went well. Uh, we didn't uh, challenge anyone. We had a great time. The, you know, the, the skies are spectacular. People on vacation at the Grand Canyon, any national park, are open for anything. And, and what else are they going to do at night at the Grand Canyon? Well, nowadays, they have cable TV at the hotels, so they can stay at the room and watch TV. But back in the 1990s, uh, our show was like the only one. We outdrew the... Uh, the, the ranger talks typically. Uh, so anyhow, this went for a couple of years. And then I ran into John at RTMC and I pulled him aside and said, you know, John, uh, I first met you at the Grand Canyon in 1980. And in 1991, we restarted the Grand Canyon Star Party. And you could, oh, his, his eyes immediately narrowed because, you know, he still had that that thought of, of not being able to come there. And he just went, he just lit up, uh, oh, uh, because one person complained, stopped it for 20,000 people every year, being able to see the stars. He was just, he was just livid. Even, you know, this was 15 years later, uh, just livid about it. And uh, he said, yeah, one person complained and uh, shut it down for everyone. And I said, well, we've restarted it and, and you're certainly welcome to come join us. And he did. He came about the fourth or fifth year and he came probably six or eight. Um, maybe at eight of the out at the most, uh, a, a good half dozen times he came came out. Uh, and uh, one one night, uh, you know, I've, it's hard to get speakers for uh, speaking to a hundred people. And uh, usually, I'd get four speakers that were regulars, and they'd repeat after four days. I'd, I'd have them on again. And he said, "Well, I, I brought my slideshow. I'll you know I'll I'll give my talk." And and uh, there was the slideshow I'd seen 15 years before. And of course, there was the slide of Walden Pond. And hey, you know, you, we're all evolved from pond scum. And I said, John, no, don't say that. Don't say that. <laughs> but, but by that time, you know, uh, no one complained. And uh, uh, but I, I just about tore, tore what little hair out I had. And, you know, the slideshows are a fun time anyhow, because we had them right at the door, back door to Yavapai Lodge, we're 50 feet from the rim. And usually there's enough of a breeze there. I had to have three hefty guys holding the screen down uh, while we're projecting the slides. And uh, this was the old days where we actually had uh, uh, carousels of slides. And uh, it, was, it was a great time. Uh, sometimes throws our butts off, sometimes not. But anyway, uh, John loved it. He reveled in speaking to the people there. Uh, 
he, again, those windy nights, he would have those purple flyers. And as he started talking, he would like throw them up in the air. And they're like a hundred of them and half of them went off into the canyon. And uh, I'm sure pissed off the Rangers. But uh, uh, in a couple of years, uh, his second or third visit, uh, we had the bright idea to, uh, to make a telescope during the week that we were at the canyon. Uh, the current uh, version of the Grand Canyon Star Party, it's two Saturdays in the week in between. So it's eight nights there. And because I work at the Mira Lab, University of Arizona, I scrounged up uh, a 10 inch blank. And I think I got a piece of sonotube and a sheet of plywood. And uh, I think uh, John's group had uh, a couple of eyepieces and, and took care of the other parts. And we met there and I rough ground it to, uh, I think, F5 and I had a, a cast iron tool. So we didn't need to, you know, it was, it was kind of civilized. Uh, so we were polishing as a public public display and, and tourists would come by and take a turn grinding. Uh, and over the course of the week, we uh, uh, fine ground, polished it. Uh, I think I'd forgotten the pitch and they had forgotten the pitch when they came from San Francisco. So we had to run down, there's the optics uh, place, it used to be uh, Star Instruments in Flagstaff uh, and, 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 and borrowed a kilo of pitch from them to, to make the tool. Uh, had polished it and I think there was, for some, there's an outing that everyone went to except John. John stayed behind and claimed to have figured the mirror uh, looking at the reflection of the sun off of a raven's eye. So what could be, I mean, that's a story, right? Uh -huh. you, you do the final figuring using the, the sun reflection, the sun glint off a raven's eyeball. Wow. And uh, <clears throat> so he declared it done. That same optic shop, Star Instruments uh, down in, in Flag, uh, coded it for us. Uh, and we had it in the telescope. And I think we used it... Uh, I'm not sure it was ready Thursday, but certainly Friday and Saturday, we had a, a finished telescope that people were, were, could look through that we'd made. And it was available for checkout from the library at the grade school there for, uh, for kids to use at the Grand Canyon. So uh, I haven't kept up with it. I don't know what its current status is, but uh, that was the story at the time. Anyway, John was a, a character. He stayed at my on my couch a few times coming through Tucson. Uh, I remember one, I'm not much of one for breakfast and, and I was heading off to work one morning and I think he and his <coughs> handler were heading off to Texas. I think, uh, uh, who would that have been? I, I forget the guy's name offhand. Tim? Uh, what's that? Tim? No, I think it was, uh, uh, geez, I'll, I'll think of it in a minute. Uh, he said, do you have any cackleberries? I said, well, what, what kind of fruit? And, you know, uh, <laughs> cackleberries, have you got any eggs? I said, oh, well, again, I'm not much of one for breakfast. I think I, I use so few eggs, I buy them by the half dozen uh, to make uh, occasion when I make, when I need an egg. <clears throat> and he talked to me later, and those eggs were so old, they wouldn't even float. But I, I suspect he still, I think he still ate him anyhow. But uh, anyway, uh, what else? Oh, another story. Uh, I, I I don't know if someone's told it yet tonight, but uh, he, he was using the sun scope at the canyon once. And uh, as you know, they use a welder's glass in the front to both uh, drop the uh, light immediately uh, to an uncoated mirror and then back to the eyepiece so if that if that welder's glass were to break you would lose the reflection to the eyepiece so you would never get a return of a, a unfiltered sun to your eye and someone asked will i burn my eye out and he said no the only way you will burn your eye is if you set the telescope on fire and carefully hold your eye over the flames <laughs> that always that always, always I've heard him say that a couple of times. <laughs> Carefully hold your eyeball over the flames. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, 
Anyway, uh, what other stories? I know that, uh, I don't know if Sergey is coming on tonight. Um, I'm not sure. It ended up being um, very early in the morning for him, I guess. Yeah. Time yeah. Sergey is an interesting fellow. He uh, wrote to me back in the early 90s. I was uh, about the time the Star Party started, actually, Grand Canyon. I was president of the Tucson Club, uh, and he wrote to like 30 clubs through the Western U.S., asking to bring uh, some children from his astronomy uh, club to the Western U.S. and, and visit is. astronomy sites. And uh, I responded, and I think me and Donna might have been the only ones that he got a hold of. And uh, I, think uh, Bill, I think Bill talked to him first because Bill referred him to me when they needed a part for their telescope. And yeah. then... Um, but anyway, you know, uh, I didn't so, meet, I didn't know the first trip. You did that. I wasn't involved. Yeah, the first trip was uh, one kid and two chaperones at Sergey. So there were okay. four people, one kid, and then the next one there were, I think, uh, eleven kid, eleven teenagers, and Sergey by himself yeah. without chaperones. And there was two, three girls in the group, and he was like pulling his hair out trying to maintain order. But that, you know. Three trips, uh, he's he's quite the character. And somehow he connected either through you, Donna, but uh, John visited them. Uh, I don't know much about the details about that, but uh, I will let you or someone else talk about that. Okay. Anyway, yeah, the Grand Canyon is still going strong. We have upwards <coughs> over 100, 120 astronomers over the course of the week uh, bringing telescopes and typically uh, I, geez, I don't even remember the numbers that, uh, we get, uh, hundreds of people come to the evening twi twilight talks. And, uh, uh, I think they're talking 20,000 people over the course of the week. Uh, so, and, uh, again, people take vacation to bring their telescopes there. So, uh, think about joining us next year. Hopefully it's been virtual the last two, uh, two summers, but, uh, it's always a fun time, and I'm glad John got me on that track. And uh, public astronomy is, you know, growing up in rural Iowa, uh, small high school, my graduating class was 21. Uh, it's not like there was any group activities for a, a nerd like me doing astronomy. Uh, and I did it by myself for the first uh, five, six years till I got into college and on to Tucson. But uh, you know, a, a joy that you share is something that is, it's that much more valuable. So anyway, thanks for letting me ramble, ramble on. Well, thank you for coming and for joining us. Yeah. And uh, next I have Bill Scott, who I think of as like JD Jr. Because I think Bill has the best understanding of his cosmology and also a really good understanding of telescope making. So, Bill? Yeah, it was uh, uh, interesting. The, uh, just before I joined the monastery, uh, John came through and gave a talk. And uh, I was absolutely fascinated by it. And fortunately, the uh, Swami that was sort of in charge of his, you know, introducing him and so forth, uh, said if anybody else was uh, interested in hearing more that uh, he could give a series. So he gave a series of talks and then he did it every year as long as he was able. Uh, and so and at first he would come for maybe uh, six or eight weeks uh, around Christmas time and he would do that because he was going to do the Death Valley Star Party and he could more easily do it from, from Hollywood. Uh, and then it kind of gradually got longer and longer. And pretty soon he says, you need to keep me busy. Why don't you have a telescope making class? So we started doing telescope making classes. And then of course, as it happened, many times people would not finish by the time he had to leave for his next uh, uh, speaking tour, wherever he was going. And so people like uh, Bob Elvorgen and Mike Kendall and myself uh, ended up being sort of the substitute teachers. And since the classes took place at the Vedanta Temple, uh, I was usually the one immediately available. So I ended up doing quite a bit of telescope making, teaching myself uh, over the years. 
Oh, by the way, you reminded me of a funny story he told on when he came back from visiting Texas once. He says, the population of Texas is 50-50 people and cockroaches. By weight, he says. <laughs> By weight. <laughs> he always had a clever way of saying things. So apparently uh, he had run across quite a few cockroaches when he visited Texas. Uh, but uh, let's see, what else do I want to say about John? Uh, really, his explanation uh, really helped me. I had been, uh, before I joined the monastery, I had been a uh, science and math teacher in high school. So I was, I had already taught people about uh, the periodic table and the uh, the energy shells and uh, the uncertainty principle and the electron cloud and all these things, but I didn't really understand it. It was something that was, uh, you know, not very understandable, frankly, from the way that uh, science puts it. And then when he put it together with Vedanta, he made both the science and the Vedanta make more sense to me. So it was a real uh, boon. And of course, I got to hear his talk for probably close to 25 years. So I, I got pretty good at it. <laughs> uh, and it was a great pleasure to, to hear him. Uh, yeah, just his having been a teacher too, I was just fascinated with his teaching style and how he was able to engage his audience and uh, get things across in ways that uh, people could understand. So that was also an, uh, another great uh, privilege. Uh, yeah, and he did, uh, of course, stay at the monastery uh, for weeks at a time. Uh, towards the end, of course, he stayed with us permanently, uh, especially after his stroke, and he really couldn't uh, manage by himself. Uh, but he really did eat, uh, salt his eggs quite a bit. <laughs> uh, so when he we used to tell him that too when he tell us that it was four times salted scrambled eggs. We say you use a lot of salt in your eggs, John, <laughs> but he did. He actually did use quite a bit of salt in his eggs. Uh, I used to cook breakfast for him, and he had a special way of making uh, soft boiled eggs that we had to use in order to to make his breakfast. So, and he would eat the extra yolks. We had one guy who would only eat the whites, and so he would eat the extra yolks. Uh, he was a great fan of Adele Davis, uh, nutrition and so forth. And uh, she had always promoted uh, eggs and said that the idea of extra cholesterol in the eggs was more than offset by the lessons than in the eggs. And so he never worried about those things. Uh, I remember one of our big star parties, too, that we had was when Mars had its closest approach. And people, you know, the news made a big deal about it, even though... You know, there were many times when it was almost as close and you could hardly tell in a telescope. But um, we were out to Griffith Park. We started at uh, sundown, which was at about 8.30 that day. And pretty soon, you know, I kept moving the telescope uh, up and over, up and over, up and over. And pretty soon I was moving it over and down, <laughs> over and down. <laughs> oh, my God, we've been here a long time. And my legs were very sore going up and down that ladder the next day. Uh, my dad had built a telescope when I was a kid back in the 50s. Uh, he was a big do-it-yourselfer. He was actually a cartoonist, but he loved science and was always reading popular science and popular mechanics and so forth. And he had gotten a hold of uh, plans for a six-inch telescope, but it wasn't a Dobsonian mount. Those hadn't really uh, become popular in the 50s. But uh, he built this thing on an equatorial mount. So we we looked at stuff when I was a kid and we lived up in the Hollywood Hills and there were not nearly as many lights in the San Fernando Valley then and not nearly as many in the hills. So we actually had a pretty decent view for a city location back then and could uh, see things relatively decently with a six inch telescope. But uh, the telescope kind of uh, needed repairs and we kind of, uh, never got around to fixing it. And so by the time I got into high school and college, I wasn't really uh, using that telescope anymore. And so it'd been a long time since I'd really been uh, a telescope user. But uh, when John came, of course, that all changed. And uh, we ended up doing quite a bit. So 
I uh, can't think of anything else unless somebody has a question or a prompt that <laughs> will make me remember something. We just had one of our monks just died yesterday and I was his power of attorney. So my mind has been was, elsewhere, you could say. <laughs> I was going to say, you know, Shiva, yeah. I was wrong. I thought he died on John's birthday, but he died the day before. And yeah, I can imagine day. them together. You yeah. Know? <laughs> I, yeah. Can just, I can just imagine them together now. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he was very fond of John, too. Yes. So. Well, thank you so much, Bill. I, I'm glad you oh, thank you. I don't get to see you very much anymore. So Yeah, I know. <laughs> we don't get to see anybody anymore. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> so, um, Scott, should we take a break now? I have a couple more speakers. So I think maybe we take 10 minutes now, and then we'll have Dennis and Ken. And okay. then we can just have a kind of a discussion, anything else anybody remembers. Okay, that sounds real good. All right, we'll see you guys in about 10 minutes. Okay, great.
Are you liking it? Are you liking your dinner? give you the observational evidence from my model, and I completely forgot. I'm way too retarded to do this. <laughs> anyway, no, you wait. I have to put in the observational evidence. The Hubble telescope was asked to look at the Lyman and Alpha force between no, that's the ice C273 and ourselves. 3C273 is a quasar, and it's close enough to us. So that it's ultraviolet light reaches us in the ultraviolet and can't come to the atmosphere. So since the Hubble telescope is outside of the atmosphere, they asked it, please look at the 3C273 and see if there's a cloud of hydrogen between us and it. Now if there's clouds of hydrogen running away at different speeds, then each cloud will put a dark line in the spectrum, you see, and then you have a whole flock of dark lines in the spectrum. I saw the Lyman Alpha forest. So where is the forest in there? There Now, according to the Big Bang, there are not any clouds of hydrogen between 3C273 and ourselves for two reasons. First, there's no way to put any new hydrogen in there, and secondly, there is no way for clouds of hydrogen to have hung around in there for 15 billion years without condensing into something we could see. That's an observational evidence that there really is something recycling from the border. Now, there's another evidence. The Hubble telescope was asked to look at the intergalactic void. You know, it's just, <laughs> the bigger the scale we went to, the, the more lumpy the universe is. Now, the Big Bang would like to have it just lumpy with respect to less lumpy with respect to star clusters and less lumpy still with respect to galaxies. But it went all the wrong way for them. The biggest scale that we looked at, <laughs> we have the universe in the most lumpy space that we can think of. And so, the Hubble telescope is asked to look at those intergalactic voids. And it says that there's more hydrogen in those intergalactic voids than is needed to make all the known galaxies. Now, the other evidence is that the expansion rate is not going down. The big bang models require that the expansion rate should slow down because all of the energy is put in at the beginning. Even though they threw it in by hand, they threw it in at the beginning and not all the way through. And so gravity is pulling back on it, and the expansion rate has to slow down. Anyway, that's the dark matter problem. We steady state people don't have any problem with the dark matter. It could be ordinary matter. Oh, let me do something on that too. I have asked three astronomers in the course of 25 years or so, maybe 12 years or so, um, what proportion of the stuff in a cloud making intercluster stars. What proportion of the stuff in the cloud makes it into the star? And what proportion gets blown away by their stellar wind? Now the first two astronomers I had, this is a long time ago, maybe 12 and 14 years ago or something, neither of them had an immediate answer to that, but they both said about the same thing. They thought that probably between one and 10% of the stuff made it into the stars. 
and between 90 and 99 percent of the dust gets blown away by the stellar wind. Now the last astronomer I asked was at Caltech, and he said, he has, a, he has a number right now. <laughs> he has a number right now. He says 95 percent gets blown away, and in some cases more, and in some cases less. <laughs> <laughs> So we're all in the same ballpark, okay? We're all in the same ballpark. <coughs> so we Well, I hope you guys are really enjoying this uh, special celebration of John Dobson's birthday. Um, he has uh, he had many dimensions to him, and uh, um, my my own personal experience uh, in spending any time with him was at the uh, movie premiere for the movie Deep Impact. We were at Paramount Studios. Uh, John Dobson was s standing alone on a uh, uh, platform that was kind of overlooking the the dance floor, and uh, so the uh, various actors and people that were involved with the movie were down below and uh, I was up above as well with John and and uh, and and he gave me what I felt was a very grounded uh, uh, discussion about the universe and um, anyways I just really loved uh, that moment with him and um, really felt uh, you know I had heard you know, some people told me, yeah, he had some crazy ideas about the universe and stuff, but I felt that he had some very sound ideas, very grounded. Uh, I was I was wanting to hear some some of the more esoteric uh, views that he might have, but uh, uh, he didn't come across that way to me. So um, anyways, I, I just felt it was a, a great time. The only other time that I met him was at Riverside Telescope Makers Conference and he was showing me the solar telescope that Peggy Walker was talking about. So um, I thought it was such a, an incredible design. And uh, so anyways, um, you know, I want to thank uh, Donna's, uh, uh, you know, Donna for um, being with us again today and all these speakers. Um, many of them I'd heard about most of my adult life in, in amateur astronomy, and uh, it's great to see them here on this program. So, Donna, I'm going to turn it back over to you. You know, um, what you said about, you, you had heard about how he was kind of kooky as far as his cosmology or whatever. When we went to San Diego and he met Jeff Burbage, when he left the room, that's the exact same thing Jeff Burbage said to me. He goes, I thought he was a real nutcase. I'd heard all this stuff, you know, and he's, he's not, he, you know, he goes, he's, he's not crazy. Like everybody sounds, he might not be right. We all might be wrong because he was kind of an anti-bang guy too. Right. Hmm. But he goes, but he's, he's not crazy. Like I thought. So. Yeah. 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 I, but I, I, I actually wanted to hear that. I, I want, because it was, it was something I'd heard for years that, Oh yeah, this guy's uh He's out there, you know, and I thought, uh, oh, Maria, I'll send him a book. This, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he <laughs> said, uh, somebody, uh, some physicist he talked to said, um, well, your views are, uh, I can't find anything physically wrong with your views, but they're heretical or something to that effect. So, <laughs> you couldn't wrong. find any fault with it. <laughs> I can't tell, you, can't tell you why, but they're wrong. <laughs> Okay, That's so true. next we're going to go to um, Dennis Vekarev. Is that yeah. right? Did I finally say it right after like close. 20 yeah, years? Yeah, it's close enough. <laughs> so, so Dennis was um, like 17 when he translated John's telescope plans into Russian and hosted the, and organized the first all Ukrainian, Ukrainian Astro Forum, which John attended. And he's going to tell us about that. And his other trips with John. <laughs> <laughs> yep, thank you. And uh, yeah, it's great to see so many familiar faces. It's been quite a while. So, uh, and a uh, great event. Uh, thank you very much for putting it all together. And I'm going to just uh, share my screen for a few slides. I uh, realized that actually most of the pictures that I have from the earlier times, they are actually on film. 
and I don't have them here. I don't have all of them scanned. They, uh, most of them are still back at home in Ukraine. Uh, so, but as Donna mentioned, uh, actually, uh, my story with John and with the sidewalk astronomers started, uh, I think it was 1999, uh, when I first discovered uh, sidewalk astronomers. And uh, I knew about Dobsonian telescopes, Dobsonian mount before, but it didn't click right away for me. It took me a little bit of time, maybe about a few months of reading. Um, we were just on our way to uh, reestablish our astronomy club uh, in Kharkiv. Um, and it's been my long time dream. I was reading a lot about Stella Fane. Um, I was craving to, um, you know, join a, a group of people uh, who would share their uh, hobby of astronomy, their interest uh, and passion to astronomy with me, uh, but we didn't have one. And we were just about to uh, re 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 revitalize, so to speak, our astronomy club locally. Um, uh, so one of the key points that we were trying to do, obviously, to attract more people is to go out to, to do the outreach. And I started looking what people are doing in terms of the outreach uh, abroad. And obviously, there comes the sidewalk astronomers. Um, and then since many of our uh, members were interested in telescope making and we were looking for something affordable, uh, I found those plans for building a sidewalk telescope by John. And I said, hey, we, we, should, we should just go ahead and translate it into Russian and uh, make it available for as many people as we can. Um, and to keep everything nice, uh, I emailed them to ask for official permission, of course, to translate it. Uh, and that's how I met Donna, because she was taking care of uh, all these, uh, you know, um, things about like, running the everyday uh, things of sidewalk astronomers, right? So she re responded to my message and we started uh, exchanging emails and uh, we started working on um, uh, the text. Uh, for uh, this book, and uh, here's the it doesn't want to switch, but yeah, uh, so that's how uh, the Russian tr translation of uh, this oh, wow. building a sidewalk uh, telescope looked like. Uh, the picture is by my sister, she's actually a professional graphic designer now. <coughs> so, and uh, uh I translated the text and then obviously <clears throat> uh, some people from our club who were more into telescope making. I was a very, very beginner uh, in, in that area. Uh, they helped me to read through and to correct many things that uh, I was not very uh, accurate in terms of terminology, for example. But that, that's where we, they, they, everything started. And we kind of kept in touch. Uh, it was pretty successful. And then as Donna mentioned, uh, we came up with the idea of organizing something for amateurs across the nation. Because uh, like I said, uh, we didn't have any uh, nationwide convention. And I really was jealous about so many countries and especially I was you know, reading about the uh, Neve, about Stellafane, about other uh, star parties, Texas star party, uh, and uh, other events in the US, and I was just, why, why can't we have something like that here? Uh, we should, and obviously, if we didn't have anything to join, we had to just, uh, you know, start something on our own, uh, which we did, and uh, uh, obviously trying to promote the first event, the first totally Ukrainian Forum of Amateur Astronomers that uh, we planned with a couple of my colleagues um, uh, for September 2002, uh, we had to have a featured guest which would attract the crowd, right? So we immediately thought, why, hey, why, why, why we uh, want to just uh, invite John? Because he's a really very well-known figure, almost like an icon of telescope making and uh, public outreach and astronomy. So that would be really neat. 
And uh, most of my colleagues, they were like, man, nah, it's just unrealistic. Let's face it. They're across the ocean. They're, they, they probably don't even know who we are, so they will never agree. Um, nevertheless, I just asked Donna, hey, do you think by any chance that is it all possible? And uh, yeah, I'll give her all credit that that actually <laughs> became possible. Well, actually, he was going to the UK. Uh huh. And that's when I said, well, he's going to the UK. And you're like, great, he can come here because we can we can deal with that. If you get him across the ocean, you know, so yeah, it worked out. It was timing as well. Yep. And it's kind of big effect and that's probably where the whole trans Eurasian trip actually came yeah. to be. Okay, yeah. uh, so, Cause they um, said the same thing. They said, Oh, if he's in Ukraine, he can come here. So, <laughs> you know, at least I stopped it at Siberia and he didn't go on to China. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, it was a long, uh, long road anyway. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I have just a few pictures that I happened to dig out, and most of them are from the telescope making workshop, uh, wow. which was obviously the central event. We didn't have a lot of people. Uh, there was just the very first uh, forum that we basically had to convince people to come and to heavily subsidize there. We didn't have any registration fees. We uh, had to encourage people to come because they didn't know what the event is. Um, so we had some speakers, but of course, just spending time with John and uh, this almost, was it a day long? It was almost a day long because we made the mirror and we also built the mount. That's the <laughs> day. Um, the uh, telescope building workshop on the, uh, in, in our university observatory. Uh, so that was a highlight of the event, certainly. Um, and uh, yeah, here, here's uh, uh, John, uh, I think, checking the curvature of the mirror uh, while we, will, we were working on it. And uh, uh, that's actually me trying to brain. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, here's Donna sitting and observing everything. And this girl, she was in seventh grade, I believe. Now she has two kids and she is a professional astrophysicist. And, wow. Uh, yeah. You just never know where, you know, an influence like that is going to take you. I know. You really don't, you know? I, I know. And it's it's actually amazing. So some people who I still uh, in touch with, for example, this guy here on the first picture, he's a lecturer in our planetarium. He, he's also a professional astronomer now. And um, this other guy is a, a meteorite finder. Right? Uh, this one, yes. This uh, I think we'll have a big, big, better picture of him. But he, uh, this is actually Timur Krechko from Moscow, uh, who discovered quite a number of uh, asteroids. Um, uh, the latest news that I've heard, he named an asteroid after Kina Reeves. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> but he, he has a couple dozen asteroids under his belt. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're going to keep going. Um, yeah, so uh, that, that's going to be another whole story about the TV coverage and how many site trips we made, uh, you know, a, a part of the program of the forum itself. Uh, John was quite a celebrity on our local and national TV also. We made it to the morning show one of the mornings. Remember, Donna, we were waking yeah. up quite early and uh, went to a live morning show. Uh, he gave a number of interviews to the uh, national TV stations. Um, it was interesting when after that we were going back to Kiev to our capital to the international airport for, uh, and he was flying to uh, Britain or Italy. Um, I can't remember where, where he was flying from uh, Kiev. Yeah, he was going to Frankfurt. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, and we we're going by bus to the airport because that was at that point, that was just the most convenient way. And uh, 
the guy in the bus, just a few seats across from us, he was like, hey, this is that telescope maker from the TV. And, and <laughs> he, he started asking questions across the aisle. And we like essentially we just yeah continued our outreach in the bus on the way to, to the airport. So uh, it was quite nice. Uh, and uh, uh, this guy here in the lab coat, he is the uh, optics uh, uh, guy in our observatory. He is a pretty uh, well-known telescope maker in Ukraine. <laughs> and <laughs> there is a bunch of funny stories about him because he's he was coordinating this workshop from our side, uh, making sure that we have all the supplies and stuff. <laughs> and when we were uh, just getting set to um, start working on the blank, um, on the mirror, uh, just the rough grinding, we had to drive those three nails, right, in the, in the uh, plywood uh, to affix the, uh, the, the blank. <laughs> and Alexander, he is actually the uh, husband of uh, the director of our planetarium. So he just turned away for a second to grab uh, a hammer. <laughs> And then John took the blank and started hammering those giant nails <laughs> with the blank. <laughs> you should have seen his eyes <laughs> when he started hammering those. It was they were pretty pretty sizable nails uh, to hold the blank. And to, yeah, it, it was it was quite quite a uh, situation. But uh, we had quite some nice uh, stories during that workshop. Um, but yeah, um, what else I remember about that trip? Well, first off, uh, John was, I believe he was 87 because that was just shortly before it was mid September. So it was shortly before his birthday and, uh, both him and Donna, they were staying with me and my parents and my sister. I was in my, uh, sophomore year in college at that point, um, <laughs> and we lived on the sixth floor and with, with pretty high ceilings. It was quite a, quite a high building. Uh, John, uh, when we uh, picked them up, they came by train from Moscow and we picked them up in the railway station and went straight to our house. And when we were unloading, we grabbed everything on the luggage, um, came to the elevator and we were just, we called the elevator, we were just waiting. John just flew the stairs <laughs> while everyone was waiting for the elevator. And I have to admit <laughs> that I, I, at that point, I probably would not be as fast as him running to the sixth floor of my apartment house. <laughs> so yeah, he was still doing that uh, for, for those who, who wonder what happened uh, closer to the 2000s. Uh, but uh, and and obviously those uh, soft boiled eggs breakfasts. Uh, yeah, my parents and my grandmother, uh, who was still alive at that time, <laughs> they were trying their best to master the art of cooking uh, the perfect breakfast for John. I don't know how much it worked, but it did, you know he he told me when we left that sometimes people took such good care of him that it would make him cry, and he was oh. talking about your mother. Yeah. <laughs> That's that's nice to hear. I remember that um, in like 2012, 2011, when I used to come, uh, I actually worked in the Bay Area uh, in UC Santa Cruz in summers. I was teaching for Johns Hopkins Center for Talented Youth, and usually after I was done teaching, uh, we met with Donna uh, somewhere. Either I flew down or they came up. Uh, but that, that, that's to come. But I remember that when we talked with John, uh, obviously he was older at that point. And sometimes he would just forget what we were talking about five minutes ago. But it was fascinating to me at that point when he still remembered fine details of what happened when he was staying with us uh, more than 10 years ago by that time. Uh, to the point of like where something was located in my apartment and or what my parents told him at some point and it, it was absolutely mind-blowing 
<coughs> you know, you guys gave him a meteorite, I think, right? Uh, yes, that, that was actually, yeah, I, I got it through, like, with the help of Timur. Uh, so, so John, this was John, everywhere uh -huh. he went, people would give him gifts, okay? So they would give him, like, photographs or maybe a little um, souvenir of their city or something. And, and he would take it and say, you know, I don't really have room in my luggage right so he would take these gifts and then just turn and hand them to me right and when we were in ukraine first of all you gave him a meteorite and you gave him an eyepiece uh, and probably. then you gave him that shirt that yes that, that was shirt. the national ukrainian embroidered shirt yeah they never got to my hand they went in his pocket or the shirt he kept but the meteorite and the eyepiece and i'm like come on you make me carry all this junk give me something good <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have souvenirs, not junk, but I have souvenirs from everywhere, you know, I mean, and, and everybody's photographs that they signed or, or, or kids pictures they had drawn, you know, and he, I mean, I have folders of that stuff, right? And I'm like, now you get him, you get something I'd really like, and I don't get it. <laughs> Yeah, and then it's just, it was such a great experience uh, that we kept in touch uh, with Donna and uh, then uh, it, it was a great booster actually. I, I, I will not uh, exaggerate if I will say that it uh, greatly shaped, first of all, my perspective on the public outreach. It actually probably turned me into a big outreach person the way I am right now. And um, it had a lot, a great deal about my perspective on teaching as well. And uh, uh, people who know me, they say, you know, I turned out I'm a researcher, but I'm also you know, teaching uh, all the way from middle school to graduate classes. Um, and I really credit that encounter uh, and, you know, my uh, just being introduced to the philosophy of sidewalk astronomy, that, that was a great life-changing <laughs> for me. Uh, and then the forum took off. Um, we had the growing, growing audience. Uh, within five years, we grew to uh, 350 to 400 people. Uh, and we actually didn't do it in the city. We uh, moved out of the city. We had uh, telescopes, a couple dozen telescopes. We had competitions. We had speakers. We had all sorts of things. So it, it actually grew into a decent star party. And at that point, at some point, we thought, why not, because um, that was moved to uh, spring, to May, why not having something else in fall? And we started a second event. Uh, and traditionally, for the first second event, the inaugural one in 2006, uh, which was in Crimea, uh, I said, Donna, <laughs> we, we need you guys because <laughs> we, you, you were our lucky, very lucky first uh, featured guests uh, on the first Astro Forum. We need you again. We're running, we're starting a different event. Uh, and they come again. Uh, I think I can't remember, but I think it was combined with something else as well, right? Because always crossing the ocean is never a small deal. So, oh, well, yeah, uh, we went back to Siberia. Okay, yeah, yeah, and I mean, you, you always try to combine it with something else because, you know. Um, and we had a good, good bunch of people. Here's actually Donna and myself planning the event after, just shortly after they arrived. Um, and we're probably discussing something very serious, uh, judging by my face. Uh, <laughs> meantime, John was practicing uh, his art of catching people who are late to his talks. Uh, and at that point, she was over 90 already, uh, but still <laughs> going strong. Um, so, and that was a relatively remote location. So we tried to have a little bit of observing as well, but obviously uh, talks and uh, we tried to make this event as informal as possible to just give people an opportunity to spend time with John and to really, because he became way better known and way more famous in Ukraine because we started public star parties, the sidewalk events. Um, we had them pretty much annually since 2002 all the way to 2013 
in my hometown, for example, we have them twice a year and uh, every event, it was just one night every a couple hours, but we had up to 1,500 to 2,000 people per night uh, during those events, uh, a, a great bunch of <laughs> volunteers with more than 10 telescopes. We, it, it was just an absolutely great experience and grew out obviously uh, of my hometown we had uh, different clubs joining in so it was it was uh, really my milestone uh, uh, getting to know the sidewalk astronomers so here's uh, the beginning of that one of the talks and as you can see John is still at it at throwing the flyers <laughs> um, and this time, actually, we did have some of his cosmology also introduced because I have to admit I had very little knowledge about his cosmology. Uh, he was mostly the uh, popularizer and the telescope builder for me. Um, so um, here's a few snapshots from the talk um, and some <laughs> curious conversations and some uh, debates going on here and I'm trying to keep up translating. Uh, but uh, it, it was it was great. Uh, it was a great time. And here's our uh, team with the AstroCat here. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, people coming from uh, uh, different planetaria, different astronomy clubs. Uh, we didn't have a whole bunch of people, but they were pretty here. Here's Timur again, uh, but they represented probably about like 10 different cities. Here's the director of Donetsk Planetarium, Kherson Planetarium, the Crimea local people too. So yeah, we've uh, Kiev, uh, that's the one of the editors of our National Astronomy Magazine. Um, so it was a good time. Um, and then, um, so I started working in the US, but first I did move in. I started teaching in the summer camp. I, Taught astronomy, even though I actually I am a chemist, so it was a, another thing because I knew John was a chemist, so it was a great uh, thing for me to find out as well. Uh, so we were kind of colleagues and sharing the same passion. Uh, so while working in the U.S. in the summers, teaching at the summer camp, uh, I also had an opportunity to travel and to uh, meet John uh, on a couple of occasions. That was the first, uh, no, my second trip to the U.S. and we actually went on a cross-country uh, road trip with uh, uh, first my friends from New York and then we had the handoff in Arizona where uh, they went back and they met with Donna and John and we uh, spent some lovely time with David and Wendy uh, and then we headed over to uh, Los Angeles and then later on we went up to San Francisco. So uh, that night is basically spending some time with uh, not one, but two legends of my uh, teenage times, the first uh, years of uh, being an amateur astronomer. So that, that, that was pretty great. Um, and then I had an opportunity to visit the, the dentist and the Dante Society at that point. But that's uh, when I met Bill too. So I still remember it was a great uh, night and uh, yeah, uh, a lot of conversations, and that's where when I had a better perspective on you know John's time uh, uh, in the monastery and uh, all the philosophy uh, beyond the uh, sidewalk astronomers and beyond his uh, uh, cosmology, and then we went up to San Francisco. Here is actually Ken, uh, <laughs> who will be speaking after me. Uh, yeah, and we had some time observing that was not, not far from uh, the Mercadero, I believe. Uh, it was uh, left from all the, most of the years somewhere, uh, and uh, we had the solar scope, and then we had it on, it was on and off cloudy and sunny and then cloudy again, so it was kind of a little bit uh, unsettled as it often is the case in the Bay Area, but then we had it up on top, I think it was Mount Tam, and uh, we had an absolutely great time there, a great bunch of people, a lot of conversations. Um, so yeah, but uh, remembering just the, the, the latest 
visits and the latest encounters with John in 2012, 2013. Um, like I said, it was just fascinating how much he remembered from the early times. It was so great and interesting to hear his perspectives about early times. Um, and it was just, uh, you know, the whole experience was, uh, yeah, I, I won't be exaggerating if I will say that it was a uh, life-changing experience for me uh, that in a great deal shaped uh, my career as a teacher and as a pub public health reach activist. So it was really a great experience. Well, that's Thank probably you. as much as I have. Okay, well, thanks, Dennis. I knew I could count on you. <laughs> and now I'll just let this go on to Mr. Ken Frank. And Ken, um, he worked with the um, ASP, SFAA. He's known John a long time. So Ken, take it away. Ken, I think you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay. So <clears throat> I have kind of a big upheaval in my life right now. <laughs> Where all of my belongings and my wife's are outside of our house at this very moment. <laughs> and it's crazy, nuts, wacko. But it's great because we're downsizing. And um, we moved from Tiburon right at the beginning of the pandemic to here, where we are now in San Rafael. And I gave away nine telescopes to the San Francisco sidewalk and San Francisco amateur astronomers along with mounts and uh, a bunch of tons of stuff. I still have a few of, I think, John's items that I'm going to donate to SFSA and Doug Smith, if he's still active. And I um, just want to let you know that I, um, what, a, what do you call this, the chat? I chatted with Maria. Hi. Hi, Maria. You look, Peggy, you guys look, all of you, you know, you guys look great. Even you, Scott. You know, come on, man. I, I just, okay, I'm just going to be bouncing all over the place. That's good to see you, Ken. I remember one, and it's too bad Dean Kettleson's off now because I, he reminded me of that time that we built that scope in eight hours and just like drew it together and it worked. It was a great scope. Anyway, Scott, maybe it wasn't that year, another time at RTMC. Mm -hmm. so, Dennis, hi. Peggy, hi. hi. <laughs> Anna. You guys, everybody, you look great. You really <laughs> you? I'm not saying that, like, you know, just to be flattering. Everyone is so youthful. Andy? Hello, Andy. I was, I was muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> I, I don't know if I, I don't know if I've ever met you, Andy. I don't think I have uh, as well. No. Are you Are you in the Southland or where Where the heck are you? Uh, Connecticut. Well, I guess you're not. It's on the other side of the world, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Which world? <laughs> oh, how's your weather back there? Um. We get the we get the remnants of the hurricanes, uh, some heavy rains at times, but uh, but everything's pretty good. You know, September's are are great uh, time of year. You know, warm days and cool nights. Are you getting any of our smoke? Oh uh, yes, some um, yes yes. You know, so that picture behind you that you have is your background of John. Yeah. It's a little eerie. <laughs> he's like over your shoulder well uh, yeah i'm sorry yeah, yeah. no well that's okay is is that from um it's from stellophane on his stellophane i yeah because i see the guy with the t-shirt behind him and you know who i miss that didn't sign in and i told about was uh alan stern al stern 
Oh, he was going That's to Alan Stern from the, uh, you know, the uh, New Horizons the Horizon thing. But Al yeah. Stern, who showed me at Yosemite, um, I think the Milky Way. Anyway, so like I said, I'm going to bounce all over the place. First of all, I'm going to go back to Scott. Hello, yeah. Scott. How are you doing? <laughs> I, I remember, I, I just remember your beaming face the first time I met you. And I was uh -huh. going, this guy's a special guy, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, no, it was really just um, when I meet people, you know, I can tell if they're happy people and you are mm -hmm. definitely a happy guy. So that's one of the things that, that that's I one of the that particular time was when I brought John uh, out of many times to RTMC mm -hmm. from his place on Judah. And um, uh, in the amphitheater, you guys remember Irene, Irene, I, or Maria, I'm sure you remember this. We would, you know, very patiently fold John's, you know, missive you know, the five or three page thing, right? And all that. And then he'd take them out of the plastic bag from Safeway or TJ's or wherever. And then he'd throw them in the audience. Do you remember that? <laughs> and they'd gravel for it. You know, everyone is like, ah! you know. Yeah. It was, <laughs> I mean, that was one kind of thing of jet. Um, I'm sure, uh, Donna, you, you experienced that as well, right? Oh, yeah. Sure. All of us have. I think, you know, <laughs> that's one thing John was really good at is just like at the beginning of a cosmology series, you know, right. he would ask a couple right. of questions right. and he would have a couple of cute things to say. And every audience, even people who had been there many times before, it was like they heard it the first time. And throwing the flyers was like that. He got the same reaction, even if he's been there every single year and everybody knows he's going to do it. Yeah. You know, but yeah, the watchers of the sky. Uh, you know, yeah. that's the, so fun. Same in Connecticut. Uh, when we had the Connecticut Star Party, uh, people got so excited when he would throw those pamphlets around it. There was a guy that was a printer and he made the boxes of them for him uh, so he could always have them wherever he went <laughs> yeah. there's always a trail a trail of yeah watchers of the sky yeah so i'm going to go back to scott now and one year we were at rtmc and it was just when you started up your explorer scientific oh okay and you had a two inch you know big honking Teleview similar IP. Yeah. Yes. And, <laughs> and I have a video of it somewhere. That's oh, really? okay. the whole thing that I haven't been able to do because I wanted to put together a really good PowerPoint of over the years from when I met John, when my son uh, Aiden was involved with it and um, uh, a bunch of tons of other people. I mean, I, I'm not, I can't even mention all of, but a lot of folk help me promote John in a lot of different ways. But Scott, you remember, I'm sure you do. Hmm. I'm sure many, many people have commented on it. Okay, guys. So <laughs> he, he has his eyepiece like this, right? Yeah. And he's, <laughs> he goes, you know, at RTMC at, at this, uh, at the camp, and Big Bear, there, it's kind of sandy loam soil, but a lot of igneous rock in it. Yeah. And, um, Donna, where are you going? <laughs> anyway. I'll be right back. I have to go to the little girl's room. <laughs> no sweat, no sweat. So he picked up the soil and he drops it right on the lens oh yeah where did you take some water or something and you poured it on it too uh -uh. what a stunt but i thought that was like oh, <laughs> that was so much fun i love that that year was kind of like out there and it was kind of the winding down of as we know our tmc which is no more 
Richard Osier, who was, uh, who's EA, I mean, man, yeah. he's my treasurer for the AANC. By the way, uh, I don't know if I should be telling you guys this, but we dissolved the AANC because we were just giving away plaques. And it was kind of like, I was rather of the mind to just donate money to clubs that furthered astronomy to the public and sidewalk astronomy especially mm -hmm. so anyway um richard uh, was on the board of the and i think he basically ended up running rtmc and then that folded year before last the beginning of the pandemic oh mm -hmm. yeah 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 all right because I remember, um, Scott, it, it didn't, it went into, uh, and we have uh, booths and stuff in Pasadena for one, for one year or something. And it, yeah, and there it, was the uh, Pasadena astronomy yeah, uh, yeah. event that was similar to, very similar to the Northeast Astronomy Forum. It was called yeah. PATS. PATS, P-A-T-S. Yeah. Pats. Yep, it was called Pats, and that was run by uh, Alan Guthmiller and right. a few of the guys that were part of the RTMC crew. Uh, it was just very, very expensive to have it in Pasadena, and they were renting out the um, Pasadena yes. Convention Center. Pretty fancy schmancy. I remember I stayed on a, I on mean, high Pas end <laughs> Colorado, and it was like, wow, this is <laughs> yeah. expensive. I said, yes, hey, this is not, you know amateur telescope making and uh, in the John Dobson stuff. Anyway, I digress. Um, let's see. I'm just going to recall a couple of things. One is I remember taking John, we went to Mount Tam a bunch of times and, and then Dennis, of course, you remember when we were in front of the Dolphin Club and oh, yeah. the, uh, sidewalk astronomy there. And what I wanted to do, Dennis, was kind of recreate what John did 20 years before. He went to Ghirardelli Square, um, uh, uh, North Beach. We were in um, uh, Haight-Ashbury. Oh. Of course, his kind of favorite hangout spot was Ninth and Irving. Hmm. Now, Andy, this may you know, not mean anything to you, but it's parallel to Golden Gate Park. Yeah, I was there. Yeah. Where John used to teach telescope making at the Academy of Sciences. One story to relate. And that was, I don't know what year it was, many years ago. He was teaching astronomy through the Academy of Sciences at that building in Golden Gate Park. And Alex Filipenko, the rising star of UC Berkeley, who was on the board, he said, John Dobson teaches there, uh, I'm out of there. So it was kind of like John had to, had to leave because they weren't going to give him funding and all that crap because his cosmology stuff. Right, right. right. You know, I mean, we all know what that's all about. They, they were only going to let him teach telescope making. And he said no. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So then he moved to the Randall Museum where I picked him up through. And I can't remember if I met John first or Mo Jane, as in Morris Jones and Jane Houston Jones. And when they moved to Southern California, I assumed the position of uh, later president of the AANC Astronomical Association of Northern California, which is kind of the umbrella club of clubs of all of Northern California. And we were kind of eking down into mm -hmm. Central California as far south as uh, San Luis Obispo. When I was working for NASA, uh, at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific for the Night Sky Network. Anyway, it's not about me. This is all about John, and it's all about us. Um, how we have been affected by John. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I just like to reflect on that. You know, uh, this is, it's so powerful because this is a guy who gave his whole life for this. He didn't do it for money. How, how many of us did things for money? Okay. Right. Well, certainly, yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, he, you know, this is a guy that didn't have a home in the traditional sense. Okay. And this is a guy who knew with full conviction his connection to the universe. And he was there to try to um, explain his, his view. You know, he had this succinct right. view. And, and uh, so through the, the, his, his simple life, his, you know, that there's very, very few people who have given up everything, really everything to do this, you know? I don't think he saw it that way. You know, he but just he did do it this way. Yeah, and he yeah, but he had such a mission. You know what I mean? That so. there was never enough. You know, he had more and more plans. You know, like he wanted to have this bus outfitted so he could go around and and then he was saying he needed a sidewalk astronomer ship or something. You know, so he could just go everywhere and you know. Yeah. 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 I could, think, I could say that. Uh, Every one of us has been in tears one time or another during this, uh, uh, this time. And, and that's because uh, John's influence us was that powerful, you know, it was that meant that much. And he and not just us, but many, many more people. Yeah, we were just lucky because we well, like for us, we were in a close proximity to him or, or, you know, we're around him enough that he formed that connection. But there are people that that wrote letters all the time that they met him once or twice. And, you know, and, and John was a guy, you might meet him in the airport and take him home. I mean, if you were really interested, he would, you know, like, I gotta go. They need, you know, she needs me or he needs me to be there. They so, gotta so understand Donna, stuff. How yeah. long, how long did Garth take John? You know, Garth was um, before <laughs> me, okay? Garth, Garth couldn't make it tonight. He has some connection problems. Oh, right? too bad. Too yeah. bad. John was adamant that every July he goes to Garth. And it was before me. And then Garth is the only place he went after his stroke that was not astronomy related. It was right, just right. right. He needed he needed to get out of Adanta a little bit and right. and go to Garth. And and you know, after his stroke, he was not so able, like changing his clothes and stuff like that, right? And they were like, we're having some problems with John, you know, right. doing the normal stuff, right? So we would ship him off to Garth because he would get there and his wife would be like, no, 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 honey, you're taking a shower before you come in this house. And then Garth was like, yeah, you got to do this. You're going to, you know, we're going to go on walks. We're going to do, and it, and it put him back in the normal kind of a thing because at Vedanta, honestly, there were just too many people they're and, and they're not they're not trained caregivers you know what i mean and even right. if you're not a trained caregiver if, if there's one person in your house you can take care of them but mm -hmm. with all of them there it was just hard because he could get by with certain people and then say i'm gonna have oh no recall you can't do that i'm gonna have bill do it you know and he could manipulate that situation a little bit to get his way and at garth's house his wife would <laughs> let him get by with that you know <laughs> so oh. So I have to relate, um, uh, you know, Donna kept just saying, Garth this, Garth that. And I'm just going, God, I got to go up and meet that guy. And then uh, I can't remember what year it was, but the solar eclipse, yeah. we went up and we, we, we stayed with and near and ate and hung out with Garth and his wife and his son. And, and Carl Zambudo came down from... Um, Washington and uh, with his girlfriend and we hung out together and it was so cool. Garth lives in this little tiny, well, it's not tiny. It's a small community. And, uh, and then 
apple grove right. in the middle of this town and where Carl, Garth and I did sidewalk astronomy was in this little town called Independence. And we were in front of a Ralph's store in a parking lot, which was so very John, you know. And it was so cool. The three of us just connected and uh, we ate together and we had fun together. And it was like, man, John is here. He's with us. It was so much fun. It was really, really great. So I can understand why John went up to Garth. Uh, okay, let's see another story. Peggy, how the heck are you? Doing great. Doing great. I, I mean, I didn't have that kind of a relationship with John, but I, from what I get just from all the stories you guys share, is okay. like, how can you not be... I don't say sucked in because that sounds like a bad thing. No, but no, no. He, I, was no. Not, he was not really like, oh, I got to go eat. I got to, I mean, he seemed like he wasn't even worried. The things that you and I kind of every day, okay, got to go pay my bill, got to go get gas. That wasn't even a thing. And to live a life where you were not in bondage to a car or to a home, it gave him a lot of freedom to really be who he wanted to be. And, not, and he, I just never remember him. And like I said, we didn't have a lot of conversations together, but he didn't strike me as somebody who was worried yeah. about where his meals were going to come from, where he was going to sleep. And to me, there's a certain amount of empowerment in that. You know what I mean? To live your life at the fullest and you throw abandon out there and you just know the cosmos is going to take care of you. So well, you way know, or not. You know what I mean? A, there is I, I, I just admire that. I just admire the crap out of that. You know, you know he, he really didn't have that that connection to a lot of things that we do. There was a time when I was like, okay, so I have the schedule. It means you're not going to get, you're going to leave San Francisco in December and you're not going to get back there till like the beginning of November. Is that okay? And he's like, well, yeah, but I have a big problem. I only have three slips. I only have two slips for my car insurance with me. And I'm like, oh, yeah. okay. And he goes, I need to go back to San Francisco to get my payment book. And I'm like, put your account number on the check. <laughs> okay, whatever. Then he calls me a couple of days later. What am I going to do about my car insurance? You know, I only have two slips. And I'm like, may have Bill make a photocopy. I don't know, right? Yeah. And then he finally calls me back and goes, well, Bill Scott's going to take care of it. He told me he can just make a copy or whatever. And I'm like, oh, my God, you can figure out the origin of the universe and you can't figure out how to pay an extra month's car insurance? I mean, you right. know, it's just... You know, or, or one time we were we were in Russia and, and he said, do you notice how many of these women are redheaded? It's really unusual. We don't see very many redheaded men. And, and mine was red. And I'm looking at him and go, really, John? Can't figure that one out? And he's like, you mean they dye it? <laughs> they dye it. Where have you been? <laughs> you know? I'm going to relate to you another, like, a little commonality. I just remember... Uh, you know, I kind of got in a real routine with John when he moved to Judah Street and that, you know, all, all of the people that he was involved with and the, and the mirrors that he buried in the backyard there, <laughs> it was, uh, it was just too much fun. And I, and okay. Okay. One thing I can remember because he would talk about when he was a little boy and he had like a flexi flyer type of thing. And at that time in the Sunset District of San Francisco, it was all sand dunes. Yeah. And right at 36th <clears throat> Avenue, which is called Sunset, I don't even remember. Anyway, and, and he lived, uh, uh, he showed me where he lived with his family and his parents and all that stuff. And he made a sale out of something i can't remember and that's how he got home he made a sale and he had like a bamboo pole and stuff and i just remember doing that kind of stuff as a kid down the great highway it was the same kind of thing and i was going oh yeah that's that's cool it's fun and another thing I, i'd go and i'd pick them i don't know where we'd be going we'd be doing stuff i'd take them to like trader joe's because he always wanted to have 
Raisin Bran and some other stuff, almonds or whatever. And he would kind of like a squirrel stash his almonds in a used like uh, open oh, container of orange, you know, when you have orange juice, orange juice. Yeah, orange juice. Yeah, orange juice. Orange orange juice. Bad, bad, bad. He probably would carry that around with him, right? Yeah. Now, yeah. now, that you, now that you mentioned that it, Ken, he actually <laughs> like, continued do, doing that when he was what? in Ukraine, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> orange juice, bran, bran flakes, uh, <laughs> nuts. <laughs> Brewer's <laughs> yeast. And then, and then he'd be at home, you know, I don't know what I, you know, I'd just kind of hang around and just kind of be with him. <laughs> and, you know, he'd, he'd play on his organ and stuff like that. And then he'd Okay. In a frying pan, he would cook up a couple of eggs and mm -hmm. eat that. And I don't. Then we take off and go With wherever, some, right? <laughs> was just, you know, like something uh, like everybody else. But it was a little. <laughs> you know, we were at. Um, I was at his house, and and Loretta had made a comment. She was a little like, upset okay. that he wasn't oh home. God. Right? When we had those and, cosmology classes upstairs. Oh yeah, boy. well, she was kind of upset that he wasn't there very much. And, yeah. and then she said, you know, he, he has, needs to clean out his apartment. So I went up there and he had an orange juice can on the kitchen sink that had something in it, right? And he had an orange juice can on the table that had <laughs> like a pin in it. You know what I mean? And, and whatever it was, it was useless. And threw away a couple of those damn orange juice cans and he had a fit, right? And he was just like, I need that. And I'm like, for one pin? You don't, you know, you don't. But he was very upset. But, you know, I mean, I would want somebody to come in my house and do that. And I forced him to throw away a lot of stuff, you know? And I, I just, then when Loretta got there and then they were like, oh, you didn't have to do that. And I'm like, oh my God, this is how I wanted to spend my week. And I, I tortured this poor man, you know, because he had these old um, secondaries and he had these old, some military, some military thing that had a mirror on it that he was going to use for secondaries. And he had drawers of binocular eyepieces. And I'm like, and, and then there's <laughs> well, that, that's cans how he made cans of pitch and stuff, you know? That's how he made uh, the ugly duckling. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, there were so many of them and I was like condensing them. And then I'm like going, you're never going to use these. You don't, you can't, you're too old. You can't make enough telescopes in your lifetime, you know? And then when we got in the car and I'm like, I'm sorry, you know, <laughs> this was not my idea. When we're talking about his diet, he we're sitting at a diner one time. I've got pancakes. So I start putting a little syrup on it. On it. He goes, he, he puts his head are you really going to put that on there? And, and so I said, yeah, I, I'm just going to put it. So he, he takes two creamers and he opens them up and he drinks the creamers like this. <laughs> As I'm putting syrup on my pancakes. Th this is oh, yeah, He's, he was crazy yeah. about syrup. I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I could have put one thing. A diner uh, or something. <laughs> oh, man. When, when, like, when you mentioned food, I remembered one, one thing when we were, I think we were, um, on the way back to the airport, uh, and at a random bus stop, and I, I remember we went to get something to drink with Don, I believe, and then we're coming back, and John is wandering around uh, by the edge of the parking lot, and he's basically like picking some random flowers, and he started oh, eating in them. my driveway. Yep, in my yep. driveway, <laughs> <Yeah>. exactly. <laughs> Yo, we did the weed. And everyone around was, well, we were kind of sort of used to it at that, that point. Everyone around was so freaking out. Yeah. So I, have, I have the best story. We are in Moscow and we're at the Sternberg University and the president is giving us a tour to their observatory. And his English is not great. And John starts eating weeds. And the man is like, no, 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 stop. You, you know, you cannot do that or whatever. No, no, no. And John's like, no, I know what I'm doing. And the guy comes to me and he's like, make him stop. And I'm like, oh, you know, whatever. And then <laughs> John eats some more. And then he's like, no, 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 please stop. Five minutes later, John picks something else. And the man is like, please, it's dangerous. 
and all this. And John just is, you know, I know what I'm doing. And the guy comes over and he's like, please, please. He could make himself sick. And I'm like, he's really old. He hasn't killed himself yet, you know? And the bottom line is he's not going to stop. So stop worrying about it. You're not going to do any good, you know? He actually didn't know what he was doing. I forget if it was his dad, but uh, he knew the plants. Someone who who is a scientist, a botanist, taught him which plants were were safe. I just keep thinking about this poor guy. Here you have this guest in your country who's renowned and he's really old. And all you can think of is he's going to make himself really sick under your care, right? And the guy was frantic. And I'm like, that's... I think what happened was in the, the, the biography, it talked about how the mom took them out of public school and she would go to the park and she would teach them at the park. So I'm sure she was the one that probably introduced him to herbology and botany and that's probably where he learned it from, was from her. Could be. Yeah. There's an arboretum. Uh, zoology. Yeah. yeah. His father was a yeah. zoologist. Yeah. 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 His dad was a zoologist. Yeah. And his yeah. mother, music teacher, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So let me, let me see if I can, if I'm, am I, am I waning on my time now? Uh, after you, we just have Sergey and Zanji. Where's, where's Sergey? He's in Russia. Oh. Okay. Um, let's see. Mm-hmm. I'm just trying to tie us all oh. in here. Uh, I'm I'm ready to I'm ready to 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 speak. Uh, in just a moment. Oh. Oh, that's oh Sergey. Sergey, yeah. Oh my gosh, jeez. He, uh, how old are? Sergey, how old are you now? Uh, I'm 66. <laughs> I mean, Dennis, how old, how old was he? when you guys came? Like, he was a teenager, right? Yes. Uh, well, you mean you were me, a teenager? Or... I remember. No, Dennis wasn't a teenager the first time. No, the first time I came, I believe I was like 25. Is that when we went up to Lick? Yeah, yeah, that that, that should be. Oh, okay. I, I was twenty five, probably. Yeah, I mean, young twenty five. Well. Anyway, uh, let's see. What if there's anything else I can really relay that kind of tie this all together? Uh, well, I mean, we just had so many time when I took him to Yosemite, and we went to Glacier Point, and it, I mean, it just it was not obviously the same when he went there with his yellow uh, van and all that. And uh, I just remember all the shit we went through getting the, uh, remember Donna? The sign, uh, yeah, the placard the, thing. Yeah. The placard from the National Park and all that crap. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, that's a whole other, you know, but the, I'm just trying to think of the, the really, really good stuff. I just, I have to let you, all you guys know something that I feel really, really bad about, but there wasn't much I could do. When John was on his downhill slope, um, my mom was there. My mom's a little older than John. And she said to me, Ken, you're spending more time with John Dobson than you are with me. And at that point, I talked to Donna, and I, that's when we had to decide on, okay, what's, you know, what are we going to do? And what was fabulous is Donna just, you know, took it upon herself, and we moved him down to the Vedanta Center. And I just feel really bad about that, but... No, don't. It was wonderful. They yeah. were wonderful to him, you know. And what I remember is when we had that uh, party or mm-hmm. whatever you want to call it at the Vedanta Center. And I'm sorry that I, I didn't get to talk to uh, the Swami, but that we uh, that was so neat looking yeah. through the solar scope. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um. <sighs> Uh, just in closing, have you talked to Lauren or Ruth? 
Um, I sent him messages. I didn't hear back from you. So okay. Um, and then Lauren I, just graduated. I mean, about a year and a half ago or something. Lauren got a new job, and and okay. I'm sure he's okay. well, one other thing that I want to relate to all you guys is we had a memorial for John at. Um, Land's End in San Francisco, one of the places that we used to always go to, and it was so <laughs> much fun. And we had tons of telescopes, and we had a huge turnout of people that I never thought would show. And I was really trying to get as many, you know, Don and I were really trying to get people to come there. And Jeff Roloff, right? Wasn't mm -hmm. Jeffrey there, I think? Yeah. And uh, hey, have you talked to Brucey? Have you talked no, to Bruce? I have not. But you know, you know most I'm, I'm really pissed that I didn't do it and talk to King Sam's. Oh, well, we're going to do this again next year, so that's okay. Oh, good. Um, you know, the most Perfect. amazing thing about the, the memorial in San Francisco was you all know the story of John getting kicked out of the monastery, um, uh -huh. for picking weeds or whatever. The yeah. woman that he was picking weeds with, her daughter was there who had the original 10 inch telescope that John wow. built, you know, and everybody wanted to buy it because she said it, she doesn't really use it, but she wouldn't give it up. But I mean, there were, I got emails afterwards how, how they could make her sell that telescope because it was, you know, know. <laughs> such historical importance. And I'm like, it's the woman's telescope. There's no law that's going to make her sell it. Yeah, you know what I mean, yeah. it's, um, you, you, you guys have no idea how many telescopes came across my path and that I turned back out to the street again. Yeah. A lot of sidewalk astronomers, people would, I don't know, through Donna, through somebody, through listservs, I don't know. But uh, there were a lot of different people all over the San Francisco Bay Area. And, you know, somebody had died and they say, you know, we got this telescope, it's a 10 inch. It's like, what do I do with it? Oh, yeah, give it to me. So I'd fix it up and then poof, out in the street again. So I, I do not know. I mean, I didn't keep like track of where scopes went. Although I do know you guys, if you ever want to get in touch with the first telescope that was made by Bruce, it's in the Santa Cruz mountains. It's a oh. six inch and it has a um, 17, 19 or 1970, 1976, uh, like, wallpaper on it yeah. and it's a really cool scope and um you know anybody who wants to play with it or hang out with it or do something uh, i can get it for you i have <laughs> i don't know numerous solar scopes that are all over the place too the people are like what do i do with this thing? Like, yeah so anyway to wrap it up, what do I have to say? <sighs> Huge impression on my life and my family's, whether they liked it or not. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I miss them. I think that sums it up. We all miss them. Uh, yes, we do. Okay, I'm going to sign off, you guys. Okay, well, thank you, Ken. Thank you. Thank you. It's good seeing Sorry, you. I didn't have a whole bunch of pictures and stuff, but you I mean, I need them. Everybody has pictures. That's, but that's I fun. think, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It was good, Ken. We're all right there with you. It was good. Yeah. Absolutely. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs> See okay. you in the dark. All right. So, there we go. Okay. Over so, and okay. out, even though that's not correct. And um, I don't do gravel <laughs> yes and you don't do eclipses because they're too short <laughs> okay sergey you're on uh thank you uh, <laughs> um, i want the that you hear me because i'm speaking from the opposite side of the earth yes <laughs> almost from uh, from mars almost, <laughs> almost. <laughs> So, uh, first of all, I, I have to uh, uh, to excuse me for uh, limitations of my English, because I speak English uh, once in five years. So <laughs> sounds good. It's no problem. It's it's, it's, it's a problem for me. Uh, 
Well, oh. it's better. It's better than our Russian. Okay. Okay. Oh no, we have Dennis. <laughs> That's true. Um, um, John Dobson first visited Russia in 2002. Um, this visit was, was initiated by, by me and Dana Smith, but all began in 1998 when uh, we first came to United States with a small group of amateur astronomers. It, 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 it was an uh, incredible trip with uh, great, great impressions. And uh, it was a trigger of our uh, uh, next steps in communications uh, uh, with, uh, uh, between uh, 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 Russian and American uh, 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 amateur astronomers. Um, the first uh, city in Russia which uh, Dana, uh, John and Dana visited was Irkutsk, with a city near the Lake Baikal. Here, John was invited to the Institute of Solar and Terrestrial Physics to give a talk in seminar, in science seminar. And also he met um, uh, local astronomy fans. A few day la days later, uh, we met him in our city in, uh, in Krasnoyarsk. I remember it was two, uh, two o'clock, 2 a.m., a deep night. A uh, short man came out uh, of a train carriage and uh, says, Hi, I'm John. Well, such a simple style of presentation of a great and famous person was amazing for me. Uh, we met uh, and took guests to the hotel to let them have a rest. Because the next day was with a very busy schedule in which... Uh, we held a press conference with uh, the participation of the most popular media outlets. Uh, and after the press conference, John gave a talk and uh, gave his popular lectures on astronomy in which he outlined his vision of the universe evolution. Uh, uh, there were <coughs> hundreds of teachers and school children, amateurs of astronomy from Krasnoyarsk and neighboring towns. Everyone listened to his lectures with interest. Everyone was impressed. Later, we introduced John in the institution uh, that conduct uh, educational activities in, on, on astronomy in our city. Uh, a few day, days later, John left Krasnoyarsk and arrived in Tomsk. There is this uh, town located in a little to the west of Krasnoyarsk, 60, 600 miles away. And there, just like in our city, there is an astronomy club for children and teenagers. This club also works for a long, very long time. Um, uh, the acquaintance uh, with member of the club uh, was in the plan of visit, and uh, there was a meeting with a large group of children and adult graduates, uh, alumni of this club. As always, John gave his wonderful lecture. Uh, from Tomsk, uh, the guests uh, uh, left for Moscow, where they were met by professional astronomers, headed by Anatoly Cherepashuk. Uh, he's uh, the director of the Sternberg uh, State Astronomical Institute. This is a very famous scientist with a, a worldwide reputation who showed around and spoke about the institute activity. Anatoly Cherepashuk personally took John and Dana to the uh, Pioneer Palace Pine in Moscow. Pi the, uh, Pioneer Palace is the center of supplementary education for children. Uh, here, uh, an astronomical educational center for uh, children uh, uh, operate. The, they met here children and astronomy teacher from the palace of P uh, Pioneer Palace. Uh, the guest visited all the most interesting places in Moscow and got acquainted with the capital of Russia. Then they moved to the city of, uh, of Kharkov, Ukraine, they where they were invited by local astronomy society. Denis was uh, the organizer of this great visit to Ukraine. Uh, in 2006, uh, several years later, impressed by his first visit to Russia, John Dobson asked Dana to organize new visit to Russia. Uh, this time, we decided to expand the, the, the program of the visit to include not only Irkutsk, Krasnoyarsk, and Tomsk, but also Novosibirsk. 
Novosibirsk is a large city with population 1.5 million people with its capital of Siberia, I would say. Uh, the, here, uh, the factory that uh, produces telescope for amateur astronomy uh, is, he, is, is located. In addition, here there is a small company that also produces amateur astronomy, uh, amateur telescopes, and the, the sold uh, them over all the world, including large aperture Dobsonians. Uh, one of the famous astronomical club in Russia existed in, in Novosibirsk uh, for a long time ago, but it was close to the, to the uh, moment of visit uh, of John. Leonid Sikaruk was its founder, the author of books on amateur, astron on amateur telescope making. He personally built a number of interesting telescope models. I would say is he... he he is our, our John Dobson. Um, uh, it was very interesting for him to meet John. When, when I introduced him to John, I said, this is our Russian John Dobson. <laughs> John smiled. It was a very funny situation. Um, again, after Novosibirsk, the guest moved to Moscow, where we uh, had a second meeting with the astronomical community, and then John and Don uh, repeated their visit to Ukraine. Uh, almost uh, 20 years have passed. The question arises, what are the implications, consequences of the visits by John for amateur astronomy? In Russia, they have had an extremely strong and useful effect. The fact is that after this visit, the sidewalk astronomy movement began to develop at an unprecedented phrase in many Russian cities, including those which John Dobson did not visit. New astronomical associations of sidewalk astronomers have merged among amateur of astronomy, and these associations were engaged in popularization of astronomy. Uh, like John and his follow followers, they invited everyone to, uh, to look through uh, their own telescopes, chat such events, and uh, announced, are announced in advance and places of uh, holding in cities with minimum for light pollution. People came and uh, wondered. Uh, John Dobson's visit dramatically changed uh, amateur astronomy in Russia. Under the impression of his visits, which were covered by uh, federal Russian media, including um, the, the, the most the, the, the famous TV channel, uh, Association of Sidewalk Astronomy emerged in many cities, which to this day are actively involved in the popularization of astronomy. And regularly, each first quarter moon conduct astronomical observations with their telescope, according to idea that was invented by John. Of course, this creates bright impressions for people involved children in this activity who became, become interested in cosmos, in science, and undoubtedly this is beneficial for any human society. Today, I would like to thank John Dobson for, for the fact that uh, his idea changed the world for the better. Mm -hmm. John was uh, truly a citizen of the planet Earth. Uh, he was respected all over the world. In many countries he visited, and even those which were not, uh, everyone knew uh, about his ideas. His followers continued his activity, continued to amaze people with the, the world of cosmos and make people think about the place of each person in this life, about they need to protect the planet as a unique space object in which people feel comfortable and which need to be protected and preserved preserved for future generations. That's all I would say today. Thank you for your attention. Oh, well, thank you so much. I'm so glad you could make it. I think he's gone. <laughs> Okay, so no, 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 yeah. no, I'm, I, no, I'm, not. <laughs> I, I, I'm here. I'm here. Well, I'm glad you came because I, I, I really wanted your perspective. Uh, my, my perspective. Yeah, I, I really thought we needed to hear from you, and I, I'm, uh, I'm glad you could join us. 
we have th three visit to to uh, uh, to United States uh, uh, in 1998, nine, uh, 2012, and 2017, uh, and I would like to continue continue this uh, these uh, arrangements. And, yeah. But <laughs> uh, if you, if you if you agree, we start thinking well, about the visit. The the world is conspiring against us right now. <laughs> with the pandemic and everything else you know but um yes i'm ready uh -huh. and now you can now you can stop in omaha because dennis is here ah uh, I, I i i many times many times ask adano why when we're in united states dennis do, uh, doesn't join us <laughs> we, we never we need we never he never he never uh joined us when we were in the united states so no just, he's always somewhere uh, else after, uh, active uh, amateur astronomers but what, what, what we never uh, saw him uh, in Los Angeles, in, in, no, in, San, in San Francisco. Yeah, uh, now, uh, yes. I, I see him for the first time. Uh, his, his English is absolutely perfect. I yes. didn't know such English, such a level of English. But excuse well, me. Next time we'll make sure we get him here. Okay. Okay, so Zanji, are you ready? <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I guess I'm ready. That's a tough act to follow. <laughs> so, so Zanju is a <laughs> friend of mine that, um, because if you're a friend of mine, you probably know John, okay? And you've probably driven John and you've probably done sidewalk events. So that's how he met John. And then when he moved back to Pennsylvania, he hosted John. And he was um, not a real active amateur astronomer, but somebody who was interested in John kind of widened that, and he's going to tell us. Yeah, so um, yeah, everything that Donna said is pretty, pretty accurate. So I had an interest on my own in amateur astronomy prior to meeting Donna, and then um, I moved out kind of randomly to Los Angeles about 15 years ago, and I had it was silly. I had no plan, nothing. And I, I uh, went for a walk and I saw this flower shop and I just decided to go in and <laughs> ask for a job. And I met Donna at that time and, and uh, just a total stranger. And she said, sure, sure. You could start working the day after tomorrow. And um, she was wearing a t-shirt that had uh, some kind of astronomy picture on the front of it. And I said, oh, so we started talking about that. And we ended up talking for a couple hours uh, after close about that, you know, on our first meeting. Um, and I, I think she probably asked me at that point, do you know who John Dobson is? And uh, I didn't at the time or, or I wasn't aware of, of knowing who he was, um, even if I, you know, maybe did in some way. Um, and so that's, you know, so I'm just going to share a couple kind of funny stories, just different things, recollections. I don't know. My, my stories sound pretty similar to a lot of the stories that people have been telling. Um, just some recollections about uh, things he did and said and um, kind of food related stories. Um, but yeah, so when I lived out in Los Angeles, I would, Donna would sometimes ask me to drive John between uh, different locations. I'd go pick him up at Vedanta and, um, you know, take him in the same van that, that uh, I was doing flower deliveries for, for Donna's shop. And, um, and then later on, I don't know, maybe I want to say maybe about five years later. So I'd say 10 years ago, he came out to Pennsylvania and I believe he was probably leaving Andy's house. Is that right? He was going to the Cherry Hill Star Party or something, I think. He's going to Cherry Springs, which is, Cherry yeah, the Springs, darkest yeah. location. And I know, and I, as I recall, he was leaving Connecticut. So I think he was probably coming from Andy's house. Yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so I, I, I can tell you a little bit about that visit. So I, I went to, I'm in Reading in Pennsylvania. So I went down to pick him up at the bus station. And uh, he was going to spend, I don't know, maybe two days with us, something like that. Just kind of like a, he was pretty old at that point. So it was just to kind of give him a rest, give him a break between star parties. And um, 
I'd driven around so much in Los Angeles. So I went to pick him up. I said, Hey, John, he goes, Hey, and I said, you remember me? And I was really looking forward to, to him saying, yes. <laughs> he said, no, <laughs> he didn't remember me. Um, but, uh, it, we, and then we got in the car and, uh, I figured we could stop off at the supermarket and, you know, get some foods that he enjoyed eating. And um, I said, you know, kind of thinking like maybe a lunch and a dinner or a couple lunches and a dinner, something that he would enjoy eating. And I said, you know, what can we pick up for you at the supermarket? And uh, anybody want to guess what he said? Orange juice. <laughs> He's, it was very specific. He said Hagen Dazs. Oh, Hagen Dazs. Hagen Dazs. And uh, yeah. And I said, okay, we can do that. And, uh, and what else <laughs> would you like? Um, and he just wanted Hagen Dazs. So, so, you know, he did end up eating more things than Hagen Dazs, but that's the only thing that he was uh, helping me out with for suggestion. Um, and then salt. He, he brought salt. He was putting a remarkable amount of salt on his food. And I didn't realize how into salt he was at that point. And I, I kind of made a joke. I said, oh, you should carry your own canister of salt. Uh, and he said, I do. And he, he pulled it out of his pocket. Uh, and he had a 35 millimeter film canister filled with salt. God. Oh, my God. Oh. And he, I, yeah, I think he dumped about maybe a quarter of the container on his meal. Um, and... Uh, I've eaten weeds with him. I've walked around San Francisco with him, uh, taking a walk around the, the neighborhood. While I think, I think, I think that might have been the occasion where Donna was uh, telling the story about cleaning up. John and I were going for a walk, and he was pulling weeds out of the sidewalk and telling me to eat them. Um, so that was fun. And I don't know what else can I tell about. Uh, I think that's about all I have for a different kind of interesting food stories. Oh, we had, um, and maybe some of you've had this too. In the seventies, you could get the, the time life books and, and every book was, uh, one was called the forest and one was called, uh, the mammals and one was called the universe. Do you remember those yep. books? Yep. Found like a half inch wide spine. Yep. Mm -hmm. And just out of curiosity, while he was there in the house, I pulled the, the one called The Universe off the shelf and flipped through it. And there he was in this book um, that we'd had, you know, my whole life. So I thought that was kind of, that was kind of funny. I bet, now that, kinda, I bet John liked that. You know, I don't really remember him having a really strong uh, reaction to it. He was on this particular visit, um, it was, I wouldn't call it an unpleasant visit. I did enjoy having him, but he was, he was more in his uh, kind of grumpy mood for, for some of the visit, I would say. And, um, and the one, th like, for example, he brought, you know, the, the, the film, um, A Sidewalk Astronomer. I don't know if maybe some of the producers of that are on tonight. No, they weren't here, but. Oh, okay. Well, he brought that, he brought that with him and he, we were watching it and um, there was some, he was talking about the moon in the, in the movie and my mother was there and she, and she, she had some question about the moon <laughs> and he turned around and he said, he said, this isn't about the moon. This is about me. <laughs> he wanted, he wanted to talk about himself. Um, so that was kind of, that was funny. But uh, yeah, the one thing I remember him really enjoying on the visit was that we, we had a, an old cat named Baby Orange at the time, um, who kind of reminded me of John in a way. He was, he was a very old cat and a little grumpy sometimes, and John really kind of bonded with him. So that was cute. He was always trying to uh, pet the cat and make friends with him. Um, Yeah, what else can I tell you about uh, that visit? Well, that's, I, I mean, had, that's. I knew he had a good time. Oh, did he say he did? That's good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, I wouldn't say that he, I didn't have the impression that he had a bad time. Um, but he was just, you know, he was Sean. Um, 
and we had that road trip up to San Francisco together, uh, Donna and me and Carla and John. That was fun. That was another nice memory. Yeah. You know, so a lot of my memories have to do with kind of John being in transit, you know, him visiting here because he was between places or me driving him around in the, in the uh, flower van or the road trip to, to um, up to San Francisco. And I do remember he was kind of uh, uh, doing some backseat driving yeah. for much of that trip. <laughs> He never rolled a van. I know. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Every single time. He told me that every time we went anywhere. And one time I'm like, no, unlike you, I never have. <laughs> so. And there was, that, there, was, there was something on that trip about um, we stopped off at uh, somebody was talking about fruit. How he we was, were eating cherries. He was, he was yeah, eating it was a cherry stand in the middle of nowhere. And there was a porta potty or something. Yeah, something about that. What happened at that? I don't remember, but with John in a porta potty, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> who knows? Well, what time is it now? Uh, over here, it's a quarter past one. I'm, so I'm we've, on been on for, we've been on for five hours. I think we've kind of like done a John Dobson good this year, don't you? <laughs> I'd say so. Yeah, it was fantastic. I think, I think that we have. Um, uh, you know, certainly, um, you know, got to know John better. I know that I have, you know, for sure. Um, you know, because I, like many people, I only met him once or, you know, br briefly, you know, where, you know, to be able to sit down and actually really talk to the guy, you know, um, mm -hmm. uh, was, uh, was great. And, um, I can't say that I was, you know, a close friend of his or whatever. I respected the man um, and uh, still do, you know, because, uh, you know, people, whether they're luminaries like John Dobson or they are, uh, you know, your average person, you know, they still have this ongoing effect on on all of us. And um uh, John's the the waves that John created are were huge and uh, and will have effects for you know I think forever. So um, you know, with us, I think most of us that that knew him very well, it's kind of like I guess kids that have famous parents, right? You yeah. know them as your parent. You don't know them as this famous painter or something. And then you get older, and then you realize the 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 genius they have in their craft or the the mm. understanding or the success or whatever but to you they're still you know a parent so you have to like marry those things and it's just for us it, it's just a little bit different because we can recognize that in him but still knowing him as a person but yeah. the fact that he could you know figure out this telescope stuff by him i mean just Oh, somebody told him and get a piece of a milk jug and cut the glass off and grind it with sand and make your own telescope and and then you know figure out how to make Vedanta and, and science reconcile. Okay, check it off the list, right? Mm -hmm. Give a talk and engage every single person in there. I I never saw him give a talk where the audience wasn't engaged with him or explain these complex things and these simple things and and go somewhere and have all these people want to take you home. I mean, that's something amazing that he had a connection with people after such a short time that mm -hmm. he can do it. And we're very well aware of the, the luck we have and the, the, the gift that we got to be, you know, a friend of John's and to be mm -hmm. close. One thing I thought was interesting is in working with the AL doing their 75th this year, contacted in, uh, somebody from Stella Fame. And this guy, you know, I think was from New York or whatever, but I mean, he was, he was very, very curt. And he proceeded to tell me, you know, so I said, I just want to talk about, you know, adding it for this month. Right. But it was really interesting because I did not know that there really is kind of an East coast, West coast division when it comes to ATM stuff, you know what I mean? And their perspective is really, really different. And he just really didn't have anything really positive to say about John but he goes, we have people grinding mirrors that go up in space. And 
you know, I had to stop and think. And I went, okay, well, thank you so much. I'll let you go. But he totally changed his tune. But I did not realize that, you know, we kind of use, we like his mindset. I think that's what we relate to is that we, it, it's, it's organic. It's easy. You know, we, it, okay, spontaneous. It's whatever. And it, it shouldn't be that way. I mean, it just never was um, getting rid of anybody. It never was putting anybody down or anything. And that's what I like about the sidewalk astronomers. It was always very inclusive and you know what I mean? It was never whatever. And I just was kind of shocked because I, I, I had never been to Stelfane or know anybody who, who was there, but it was just interesting that they kind of wanted to lay the claim on, on amateur telescope making. And I kind of thought, what's well, kind of funny because the West Coast people just they hang differently. You know what I mean? We just I'm from California originally, you know what I mean? And um, people over here are a little bit more wrapped up. And my husband and I are learning um, the, the East Coast swing and, and it's it's just a little bit different, a little bit frenetic. And then the one in California is just more laid back and has different steps to it. And I had to laugh because I find it the same way with a, with uh, with John Dobson and ATM and then maybe what Stella Faye talks about or how they carry themselves. So you know, I just, I just kind of line myself with this guy, just a little bit more organic, a little bit more easy go lucky or, you know, just make it work, figure it out, you know what I mean? And not be so hung up on all this other stuff, you know what I mean? And that's what I, to me, that's what I appreciate. It's not as stressful as doing the other way, you know what I mean? So. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm so glad you could all come and join us. I thank you. I was very nervous. I wasn't going to have I was like really scared that our program was gonna last an hour and a half and I was gonna be freaking out. And I didn't even really have to give a presentation. You guys did all the work for me and I really, really appreciate that. All right, Scott, I, I thank you for doing this. I think well, uh, yes, we should do this every year, you know. We will, we will. Uh, you know, um, I'm gonna read a couple of comments, just kind of uh, lasting, you know, last comments here from the, chat um you know uh jeff y says he was a citizen of planet earth um uh he's watching on youtube uh um the you know the uh comments from our guy in russia norm hughes says man that was well said um uh harold Locke says i just about cried when ken was getting into the end of things he says his mother will be 89 soon and some parallels with her. Um, you know, Jeff Y says, I feel like I know him well now, you know, oh, good. a lot of us feel that way. Um, and he says, thank you for putting this together, Donna. It was very moving. Um, and uh, Tarek in the United Arab Emirates says, yes, Donna, thank you for this. Martin Eastburn in East Texas says, uh, Donna, this connection will go on through many people viewing tonight, but all the attendees know him better and those yet to view this broadcast in years to come. Thank you for bringing this to us. Well, they should be thanking you. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, thank, thanks to everyone that participated tonight. It is the culmination of all this kind of thing. that. And you guys can all go on YouTube later and see it. Yeah, that's right. Go on, watch yourself on later on YouTube. So we'll, we'll right. do that and we'll put our own comments up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. So we'll be back. Um, I was, uh, while, while the conversations were going on, I was uh, talking to uh, our young astronomer in Nepal. Uh, her name's Deepti Gautam. And she will be our next special guest host of the 63rd global star party so she'll be putting together a list much like you did donna but we'll see we'll see what's going on over there yeah, I'll, start, I'll start sharing all of these because you know i have to be honest i was just a little bit tied up with work lately and not really paying attention oh okay i'll, I'll start promoting them because oh. i think these are nice to, to well, log in and well, I feel some connection now uh with with uh <laughs> you and your group and um peggy i want to thank you for all the insight that you gave us about uh dobson you brought you brought uh tumbleweed to explore scientific one yeah, time. but those are states regional in the 2018. that's right that's right yeah. it was very it was fascinating for me to see it there so um so it's uh you know i'm glad that uh uh 
you know, some of his telescopes are still doing what he intended them to do, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. very cool. I really am shocked that it turned out so well. I mean, I, I was, because it was so tattered. I just like, what did I volunteer for? What the hell is this? I mean, I really, I was stymied and yeah, thank God for wood putty. I'm, I mean, paint, I can do great. Oh, buddy. <laughs> wood putty. I mean, I mean, that whole thing, I rebuilt all that stuff. It was like yeah. do, what, reconstructing it and, you know, and like I said, I mean, my sister had passed away and I was just so depressed and, but she was so, she was so, such great therapy for me, you know what I mean? So I have this affinity towards her, which is why I gave her a, a, a persona. Peggy, that's the perfect sidewalk astronomer um, mentality to just, you know, do whatever you have to do. I said, Katie and I were at a library and first my mirror turned sideways because the furring nail came out and I didn't have a screwdriver. So I used a dime to reset my mirror. Uh -huh. to remove the tailgate and then Katie puts hers up and the secondary falls off and she's chewing this wad of gum real fast to stick right. her secondary back on with chewing gum and we had about 200 kids that night looking at the moon yep. and Jupiter and I'm like I have to stay on the moon because my mirror is not columnated at all right and Katie has kept checking her thing and chewing gum all night to make sure her secondary didn't fall off again and oh and I took it apart and I and the the album that was yeah. in the telescope was the LP of Back to the Future. <laughs> and I, had, I was laughing. I mean, I came in and I'm going, oh my God, what, what the heck is this? You know what I mean? It was the funniest thing. Who would buy an LP of that, of that anyway? But it was just the funniest thing. I mean, but when we do telescope making it, uh, I really hope we can get some sponsorships and things well, to get with AL. I have a bunch of, I have a bunch of LPs the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. So I'm just saying, <laughs> I got a bunch of LPs like that. So people gave me to, to put in there. So it's going to sing whichever way you do it anyway. So yeah. But thank you, Scott. We appreciate your time. Thank you guys. Um, Have a good evening. What's left of it? Yeah. Sleep, sleep fast. Good night. Thanks all to right. the audience. And, um, and we will be back uh, with more Global Star Parties. Actually, we have two next week. We got one on Tuesday uh, with DT Katam. And then uh, we've got a Global Star Party on Saturday, on the 25th, um, where it's going to be held between uh, the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada and uh, the Astronomical Society down in New Zealand. So it's Wait. called... 45 degree star party. Um, so it's going to be a lot of fun, very interesting. And, uh, you know, all of you guys that participated tonight, um, you know, uh, if you'd like to participate on more global star parties, you're certainly welcome. Uh, you know, uh, Donna can give me your emails or whatever, or you can just reach out to me directly. And I'd be happy to put you on the global star party mailing list. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and you can participate because, you know, astronomy, what connects us all is the sky. And, um, uh, you know, I'm not the first to say that, but uh, certainly, uh, you know, I experience it every time we do Global Star Party. And I know you do, too. So thanks. We're going to get you to do the women of the 2022 calendar, which was uh, AL's calendar this year. Okay. All women imagers. Cool. Full of women in trivia so it's absolutely going to be fun okay. to do it. all right well i'm in support of so women, so no problem okay <laughs> Thank you much. All right. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. all right good night everybody and good we night. will see you uh tomorrow take care bye-bye right. good night good night leave, leave, leave. Oh,